Доброго дня, шановні глядачі. Ми продовжуємо другий Good morning, dear participants. We continue second day of Donbass Media Forum and welcome to our first discussion panel, which is dedicated to local election and local media. Today, we, the majority of our participants will join us via Zoom video conference, but we are also waiting for one guest in the studio. He will join us a bit later. And now, I, before I will tell you about our guests, who will take part in the discussion. I would like to ask you to be active today, to leave your comments in the comments session on YouTube and Facebook. You can watch us uh, on Ukraine Forum stream as well as uh, on uh, the page in Facebook of Donetsk Institute of Information. I will try to ask all the questions to our speakers. so they are able to take all your questions and we have a productive discussions on the local elections and local media. So today we have with us to discuss all these important questions so Sergei Postivy, member of the Central Election Commission. He will join us later in the studio. Olga Ivazovska, chair of the board of the Civil Network Opora. Anna Morlykina, editor-in-chief of the regional site 0629.com.ua in Mariupol, as well as Andrei Dikterenko, journalist of the Donbass Rally program on Radio Svoboda and editor-in-chief of Luhansk Media Realna Gazeta. I would like to start with telling you that the elections of 2020 pose a lot of challenges to our journalists, especially those who work in the regions of Ukraine. This election campaign is unique, particularly because we have a new election code. We have quite a complicated election code. It's quite difficult to understand some of the aspects of this legislation, even to those people who have been working in this sphere for many years in a row. And of course, journalists who are always busy and who sometimes don't have time to read all the details of these documents. It's even more complicated because the election process is, is the election campaign is quite fast and you need to do everything very quickly. So I would like to ask my colleagues, representatives of the media, Please tell us, how do you plan to work uh, covering the local elections in your local media? What are the top three key challenges you see when covering uh, these news? I would like to give floor to Anna Morlikina, editor-in-chief of the regional site uh, 0629.com.ua uh, from Kramatorsk. First of all, I would like to say hello to everyone. Well, how we will cover the election campaign? I think it won't be different than any other than any other news that we cover. But even now we face several challenges which are related to what you've just told at the beginning uh, with a lack of information, with a lack of expert opinion and experience. Well, you know, we tried to read the new election code, but unfortunately we lack expertise to be able to understand it completely. Uh, we had a lot of trainings for the media and it helped, but we don't really know how the process will take place. We don't, we understand how the candidate, uh, before we understood how the candidates had to run the election campaign, now it's, everything is a bit more complicated. We didn't have the opportunity to understand uh, whether some of the things were violations or not. We couldn't understand uh, whether candidates or political parties could start their campaigning before the official start of the election campaign. So it was a bit complicated at first. Now we cooperate with 
uh, Opora network. They really help us. And we would like this cooperation to continue. We would like uh, that uh, those questions that we ask to be promptly replied to, because our work, the quality of our work uh, depends on it. Because we are an online media, for example. Opora is uh, the organization that helps us a lot to understand all the peculiarities of the election code. Thanks so much, Anna. Andrei, what about you? Of course, you work in a regional media, but you, all, your media belongs to the national network. And Radio Svoboda works not only in Ukraine, but in many countries around the world. So, what challenges do you see when covering local election in local media, taking into account uh, the shortage of time? Well, the thing is, is that I represent two media, actually. The first media is aimed at uh, global context. And uh, we mostly cover conflict in the East. I mean, and the second one is uh, aimed at uh, telling about the conflict in the East. I mean, Donbass Reali. And uh, as for Rana Gazeta, we mostly write about uh, local things, local events. Now it's a bit complicated. Uh, the problem is so that uh, the local authorities, uh, the local government, this is what Anna told us about. Uh, the problem is uh, the difference of uh, the current elections. In 18 communities, uh, the elections won't take place. And even in big cities of the Luhansk Oblast, such as Lysychansk and Severodonetsk, uh, they won't, uh, elections won't uh, be held there. The problem with this election is interesting to us uh, from the point of view of the global context. It's quite uh, a strange uh, precedent in Do Lo Donetsk and Luhansk Oblast for the six years of the conflict, uh, elections were held. Uh, elections to Verkhovna Rada, elections of the president of Ukraine. But I don't know why this year uh, the government of Ukraine decided not to hold elections uh, there. Civil and military administration was uh, put into those cities where it lacked even during the uh, uh, active hostilities phase. So the problem is that uh, the local people cannot choose their local authorities. I think it is quite dangerous. About 80% of the focus of my personal attention as uh, editor-in-chief of uh, Riana Gazeta and a journalist of the Donbass Rally program will be aimed at uh, this particular situation. Because if people cannot choose uh, their representatives legally, uh, there, I am afraid that the government might open uh, some illegal avenues to this. I wouldn't like that to happen. So I hope that this situation might be somehow solved before it gets too dangerous. Uh, well, I'd like to get back to this particular question when uh, Serhii Postovi, member of the Central Election Commission, joins us later. So let's remember this question and we'll get back to it later. And now I would like to ask Olha Ivazovska. So today we already talked about uh, the fact that the regional repre representative offices of Opora really helps the local media. Uh, we also discussed uh, the questions of the current elections. So Olha, can you please tell us you, as a representative of the civil network of Pura, how do you contribute to engaging more people to uh, awareness campaigns related to the elections 2020? How do you actually help to, to inform people about it? How do you help to provide my information to the population about the elections 2020. Uh, 
Uh, good morning, dear colleagues, dear audience, Katarina. I think this is a question to you rather that, uh, you, because you are representative of the communication department of Apora. But of course, I would like to comment on the questions that were asked. It seems to me that the media shall not be afraid of the changes uh, to the election code. Because although uh, those provisions which regulate activities of the media, they actually are the same. There were not any changes. As for the campaigning in social networks, uh, there are some changes. How we try to provide more information about uh, the election campaign on our website, in social networks, on our Facebook page, there is a lot of current information which is relevant to the specific regions. We try to include legal interpretation of, uh, of some events or the election code. That is why those media who follow the, uh, this process or journalists who follow this uh, direction in the media, uh, they can follow us and day by day they become more qualified because we don't only describe an event but we provide our interpretation of this event uh, from the point of view of Ukrainian legislation or international standards. It is very important. For example, uh, campaigning before the official start of uh, the campaign is not regulated. At the same time, we try to provide our analysis. And uh, of course, it uh, gets less attention from the general audience, but it might be interested to, interesting for journalists uh, who actually write about elections. So it seems to me it would be useful uh, to them to uh, read those detailed documents which explain uh, the election code. And who's guilty and what do we do with that? Because we're also trying to prepare guidelines, recommendations, because it's not enough just to state the problem, but you also have to give your vision. The discussion on the 18 uh, communities, uh, interesting, but now we know whose fault it was. And uh, it's not like uh, why it happened, but uh, what could have been done to avoid it? And the third we are to focus now on the question of holding it not on the 25th of october of course but these are going to be uh, like you know not the first elections uh, ordinary elections and they will keep on taking comments which uh, in political field are announcing the information which gives us the possibility to say, state that it's a political decision not a legal one uh, and it's not to be like it, because uh, there is no water in Severodonetsk and obvious that we need to pay attention to it and ask when will these problems be solved if you have a duty, a responsibility, then you have to set the deadline uh, when, by the time that you're going to solve the problem of the procurement for the kindergartens and proclaiming the elections. Because uh, you, you have to state that there is no dangerous situation right now. And it seems that media in this situation play the role of uh, the judge partly because there's there are political stakeholders who are for or against and sometimes the rhetoric is not adequate and it can also hurt you know the citizens of communities uh, of to a more or less peaceful way of things there Ola, uh, we have uh, uh, here actually joining us the member of the central election commission and i would like to uh, involve him into this discussion so we do know that there is a problem and uh, olga gave us uh, a good hint why it happened but I want to ask if you ha if you see any ways out of the situation, maybe in the perspective, what should we do? Maybe there was lack of communication. What do we do to avoid similar situations? Good day. 
I would like to apologize for being late. The question that you are discussing is uh, uh, topical, and it's been like this for quite a while. I am grateful and support the position of uh, Olga. She has commented the information partly. Moreover, she already identified those guilty or those who have something to do with it. As for the position of the Central Election Commission and can the situation change or be corrected? Unfortunately, we are limited somehow and we were in the situation not very simple as a body that is to provide admin administering and the um, implementation of the electoral rights of the citizens, which is our task and aim. But the provisions of the Central Election Commission defines one body that is competent to give conclusions on the safety component in the context of possibility or no possibility of holding elections. These are civil administrative administrations and we received conclusions and uh, couldn't ignore them. And we understood that the question of life of people is a priority. Moreover, what do we do next? In this case, we think that the elections can be appointed at any time. We, if we have a dynamic situation, then after receiving the conclusions of administrative administrations that the territories do not have certain threats, real or potential, and on such territories the elections can be uh, carried out, then we, there will be a quick reaction to it. Right now, by the provisions of the election code, it is defined that elections will be appointed twice a year uh, in the spring and in the fall. And if by the spring the situation is going to have positive changes, the Central Election Commission is going to respond correspondingly. I understand that uh, you make all decisions on the basis of the conclusions, but do you think that the communication component is lacking because the, or, uh, or social moods are connected with the lack of information? I have met lots of threats for a Central Election Commission in this decision when people don't understand that this decision is made uh, on the basis of the conclusions of uh, uh, military administrative. And how do you set, you know, the process of communication so to avoid, you know, some false understanding? Well, we are already drawing conclusions. We started with adopting the strategy of the development of the uh, Central Election Commission and communication of, is part of it. Uh, maybe we can speak about maybe we do not fully or haven't fully provided necessary communication through the sources that we are using today. I mean, our website, social networks, public events, uh, official online session um, streaming, we were trying to communicate information in any possible way, but really there was like um, a big informational splash that was based on one position. And only with time we saw when we started, you know, diving into these processes and the civil network of Pora and other international organizations that analyzed it together with the Central Election Commission and we d explained all the problematics and the uh, normative regulation of it. And now there are less questions because we did have to, you know, the the MPs request to, you know, cancel all we have. But as at the end today, I know there are um, so all subjects that addressed us, they uh, have uh, found out all the problems and now are communicating with a competent body. Uh, as for uh, this problem, uh, it, it, uh, journalist Andriy Dekhterenko started it today and um, he is a journalist of the Donbass Rail program and Luhansk Media Realne Gazette and he said that uh, all Ukrainian media 
Project Radio Svoboda, they're all discussing this topic. So I would like to give floor to uh, Andriy and ask questions to Sergei. Thank you so much, uh, Sergei. Uh, so far, the situation looks on our level in the way that the Central Election Commission fully put responsibility for whether or not the elections will take place in these 18 amalgamated communities or if in a military civil administration. So you just answered. So it depends upon the situation with the potential threats. It just looks weird. It seems like right now we have a peaceful peace, but still a, a number of people of military and the peaceful citizens who die along the contact line decreased. But what is to happen in the spring so that the Central Election Commission make, makes a different decision? I guess you are to say that this decision to be made by the military and civil administrations, but we know that uh, this administration is the direct uh, vertical of the president, and that's why lots of observers are blaming this administration in the political engagement. So the second question, when you discuss questions of uh, postponing local elections, do you conduct some discussions? Me as a journalist is curious to find out how was this decision made to uh, cancel or postpone the elections in these 18 amalgamated communities? Was it uh, The dis we did have uh, discussions, and not one of them. As I mentioned, the decision was not easy to make. We had lots of discussions. Moreover, first we made the decision to uh, not appoint elections in 18 amalgamated communities. Later on, the decision was made of appointing elections to regional councils and to the Central Election Commission uh, widened the specter of the required uh, requested information, and we communicated with the Security Service of Ukraine, of, of the law enforcement agencies, and uh, we reacted to the situation that was emerging in the society. All those complaints, uh, you know, of the Central Election Commission on how objectively we were considering all the circumstances to make a good decision. So when we received the decisions, the re repeatedly decisions, and they were the same, and in these conclusions, uh, they not only mentioned the situation, the description of the real threat today, but also about potential threats and perspective. The Central Election Commission is not the competent body that has the possibility to exercise evaluation of the safety component. We are no experts in this area. We do not, we don't understand how to focus these or those consequences because we do not have full information on what is happening in the occupied or deoccupied areas, or which are under control, but which are along the contact line. So the position of Central Election Commission is based only on provisions and norms of the law of the electoral code, and we cannot, you know, uh, violate its framework. What can change in the spring or not in the spring? We are expecting for conclusions of the competent body in the context of what vertical it is, who subordinates to whom. I think it's not correct for us to give this kind of assessment because it's this, we are not competent here. We act only in the part according to the law and make decisions in the framework defined by the uh, law. I know that we have questions, other speakers have questions because it's a painful topic. Maybe it's not about media, but still media specialists are interested in it and the target audience also find it interesting. 
So I would like to uh, give floor to Anna Murlikina, editor-in-chief of the regional site uh, 0629.com.ua, so she also has comments. Yes, thank you. The topic is very acute. I would like to ask uh, a question. When we speak about the safety component, whether or not we to make a decision or not to make decision, the safety component is the main one. But the problem of uh, this amalgamated community is the and there were always elections there starting from 2016 uh, there are no active hostilities the problem is that this amalgamated community now consists of those villages which are located near the front line so i want to understand is there a mechanism to tackle this issue because if uh, there are no active hostilities everything is okay but in other Amalgam uh, in other settlements which are part of the amalgamated community, the situation might be not safe for a very long time from now. So there won't be any elections, right? Is there a mechanism or ta to tackle this issue with the elections? Thank you. So as far as I understand, the question is related to administrative and territorial uh, questions because uh, some of the uh, amalgamated communities were uh, united, so it looks like that uh, there is an amalgamated community right now, which includes uh, settlements located along the front line. We have already discussed the conclusions, so the consequences. Uh, as for how to tackle this issue, I think this is uh, the question which shall be solved uh, by uh, the local government. Probably we can uh, change uh, the area of uh, this uh, amalgamated community uh, in order to hold elections on uh, the safe territory. But everything belongs on uh, the local self-governing bodies. Uh, they need to work with oblast and administrations in order to change uh, plans of uh, these amalgamated communities. Uh, and uh, changes can be made to, uh, uh, to the documents of the cabinet of ministers of Ukraine. I know that uh, Olha Ivazovska has a comment to make, but uh, we have another question which we got in the chat box, uh, and I would like to ask our uh, viewers to continue asking questions. We will uh, ask we will, uh, uh, ask our speakers those questions. Uh, Olha, can you please comment uh, on uh, the previous question and elaborate on uh, the next question? Uh, you produce a lot of information uh, content in the media sphere. So in your op uh, in your personal experience, how do you cooperate with the media? Because we can say no right now that the local media are more or less independent because good information campaign is also depends uh, on the results uh, of uh, this campaign. Uh, the impartiality of the election campaign depends largely on the media. That is why it is necessary to see how uh, experienced they are, how unbiased and professional they are. It is very important that the local media don't belong to a particular political candidate or a party in a place where they uh, live and work. Thanks a lot, Kaita. I would like to comment on the previous question. I invite uh, the Central Election Committee and the Donetsk Institute of Information. Uh, let's organize, uh, 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 let's work together, let's cooperate, and let's write uh, a joint uh, article about uh, the situation with uh, this particular amalgamated community. Uh, because it seems like uh, this problem is not being solved, and we need to do just that. I'm persuaded uh, that uh, Wish uh, I don't know when this election shall be held. If the situation changes for the better, probably we can have this election sooner. Today, 
uh, it was uh, announced uh, that uh, the government of Ukraine will tackle this problem. So let's continue discussing that because it is a political and a geopolitical question. It's very important. It's also an issue related to human rights, to social rights of the inhabitants who want to, uh, people want to choose uh, their representatives. It is an important part of the reintegration process in building trust of the citizens to the government. If we don't uh, provide Lysychansk and Severodonetsk the opportunity to vote, there is a high risk uh, that uh, the trust in the institutions will fall. The Central Election Committee, if it made another decision, it would be uh, highly risked. The Central Election Committee made this decision and it was political. But people might use other ways of uh, uh, gathering information about the situation locally. Uh, there is a need of uh, qualified information about what is happening in this region. The society shall have trust in the government of Ukraine, in the uh, security service of Ukraine. They need to trust these uh, uh, institutions and to have special, uh, to have facts and to have the full information. In some uh, communities, we understand that it is impossible to have elections, but there are other elections which 100% uh, need elections, and uh, we need to understand why it was decided not to organize elections in these communities. Then, as Katya said, we produce a lot of informational materials, such as videos, because we know that a lot of people don't like to read. Uh, but we also have a lot of uh, long reads, a lot of explainers. I see that regional media, local media in this campaign are interested in these materials even more than it was at the previous elections, because uh, they need to have access to truthful information. The problem is that the government uh, adopted a lot of changes before this election campaign. And secondly, this is a local campaign. Journalists live in the same communities uh, with the candidates, with candidates which, uh, who might violate uh, the new election code. So they want to have the full, the big picture. And I would like to say that we are always open to explain uh, every concrete situation. We are ready to provide our expertise to the local media. As for bias, we, we shall find answers in the election campaign. During the election campaign, the media shall act as businesses. If they are not businesses, uh, they uh, belong to someone else and uh, they cannot provide unbiased information. If they belong to a candidate, uh, they might publish a lot of prefabricated news. If they are paid for, if, uh, for example, uh, a candidate wants to advertise in this media, it shall be paid according to the legislation, and it should be obvious to everyone. If there are violations uh, during the campaign, it shall be exposed. But what shall we do with the candidates who have influence on the media or who are owners of the media? We need to do something with them because the conditions shall, shall be equal for everyone. If a media belongs to a political candidate, uh, it cannot comment on the election campaign. Of course, uh, they can write about other things and uh, their journalists might write their opinions on their personal pages. Last but not least, it is very important to follow the requirements of uh, the new election code. Uh, because there was an, an, a norm, a regulation according to which it was uh, prohibited to comment on political programs or radio discussions. There shall be independent experts from different parties, from different political parties. For example, when we are watching central TV political talk shows, 
such as the right to power, they did contact us for explainers and for information, but it was an excellent case uh, because there were people who said that they were candidates, so they say that they are already taking part in the election campaign, though they haven't been uh, uh, registered yet. Uh, there are also opinionated, uh, opinionated thoughts of people who shall not comment on that. I would also like to ask uh, the same question to Anna. How do you see this opportunity to maintain balance in the regions to prevent influence from the local politicians who may try to uh, influence your covering of the local elections. Uh, I'd like to say that we work just as Olha says. We work as a business. Uh, yes, we do have political advertising of all the participants of the local elections. Uh, we label it as political advertising. We take money for that officially. That is why I would like to say that we also have our own analytical materials, uh, which we publish uh, just because we think so. It's not for the money. In Mariupol, uh, only one party who is uh, that is registered has already presented its election program. But as I've already told you, we lack experts' uh, opinion and we lack experts here on the regional level. Uh, there are few people like that. That is why we uh, cooperate with you. But of course, we would like to uh, widen. Uh, the network of our experts, because this lack of expertise is an important problem for many, many regions of Ukraine. As for the other media in Mariupol, 90% of the media belong to Renata Akhmetov. I'm not judging, but I'd like to say from the experience of the previous election campaigns, there were a lot of violations. Uh, this media were used and abused not as business but as uh, vehicles of propaganda. And the problem is that at the le legislative level, uh, there are no uh, there are no conclusions. There is no punishment for that. And if there is no punishment, nothing changes. I would also like to ask Andriy Dikterenko to comment on that, to say his final words on this. You as a person who is part of a regional and a national media, having the opportunity to have access to a pool of experts, do you feel this lack of information and lack of expertise? and uh, how you can evaluate the uh, media community of the Luhansk uh, region. Are they unbiased in covering the elections? First, I would like to thank Olha Ivazovska for having proposed, uh, for having suggested to discuss this topic of uh, the elections. You can count on us. We will support you in this. And I will uh, reach out to you later for, uh, for an expert opinion. Secondly, what I would like to say about uh, covering elections in Donbass, we know that there are a lot of uh, settlements that are located along the contact line, and a lot of political parties uh, use and abuse this uh, highly vulnerable topic of uh, war and peace. Let's not forget that the process of local elections goes on, but we need to understand that the information war also goes on. And a lot of uh, sources manipulate those issues of the war and peace. Probably they distort this information. And sometimes uh, uh, 
represent uh, sometimes candidates during this information war. That is why I would like to highlight the important role of the media in this process. Yes, of course, in the election times, uh, the media shall be bu a business, but it's very important for the local media to focus on fact-checking and uh, checking those points which are uh, uh, published or uh, spoken by candidates of different political parties. Because in any case, uh, uh, the local population consume, consumes all those news. Uh, the elections uh, will uh, happen or not, but all of this information which is spread in the media, in uh, the mass media, and those media which were created specifically for the election or which are spread using different leaflets on newspapers, they will stay with the local population. So I would like to ask the media to, uh, to keep this balance. How to do that? It's a difficult question. As for the Luhansk region, Luhansk Oblast, unfortunately, the majority of the local media are focused in large uh, cities which are excluded from the election process. I don't know well the situation in Starobelsk, uh, there are good high quality medias and they haven't seen a super uh, uh, activity uh, on the websites of this, of this media which go beyond the election process. We all understand that this election campaign is quite brief. Unfortunately, because of this uh, uh, short timeline, there might be some violations. We will follow the development, the developments, and we will focus our attention on what is happening. Thank you, Andri. That's what I started with. We do not have much time, new legislation, lots of challenges, but another challenge that we're going through this year, it's COVID-19, and it is also reflected on the elections and on media. I know that, uh, you know, a working group uh, uh, was created with in the Central Election Commission that offered you know, recommendations on how to organize elections during COVID-19. I have several topical questions from our audience. I will join them and we will try or try to look for answers to these questions. So question, how serious are the risks if the lockdown measures will be implemented in the way that they will not be well communicated or there will be no uh, they won't be transparent enough tell us about this mechanism first but the thing is does the authority have to prohibit voting or observations and because of the lockdown measures is there a possibility according of normal decision but a bit limitations which can lead to negative effects in the media context as well. And if we speak about distribution of zones, if elections in Donetschina are not appointed, but the red zone happens on the day of voting in other cities or maybe, maybe even in Donetsk or Luhansk where the elections will take place in those communities. So is there a problem that if there is a red zone and no possibility to conduct elections? So tell us, please, what did you include into this document and do you have answers to the questions that I just voiced? I do have something to say. I will share the information. Uh, yes, uh, we did have create the working group that includes lots of experts from the ministries, from the Ministry of Health, and we also involved the military epidemiologists uh, who provided us lots of 
valuable information. Uh, actually, since April, we uh, addressed to many different bodies who are responsible for also for uh, holding elections, and we were studying this experience. But the th this working group was supposed to develop recommendations because the Central Election Commission cannot make decisions on some, you know, providing some uh, recommendations uh, to the executive uh, branch on some actions. And this also refers to the individual protective measures, what kind, uh, their types, which of them should be certified or are certified in Ukraine. So there were a number of questions where we are not competent, so we decided that we would develop our recommendations from the norms and provisions of the electoral court, not to violate the rights of all the subjects of the electoral uh, process. And we have submitted them to the Cabinet of Ministers of Ukraine. And now this question has been discussed, is being discussed by experts and um, employees of the ministries. The document is ready. As far as I know, this week they plan to um, revise it and to adopt it. And I think that at the end of the uh, that at the end of the next week we're going to see it. But the right to choose and the right to be chosen is uh, actually covered by the constitution. We can't restrict it uh, because if something like that happens, then there's a criminal responsibility. That is, uh, to and this refers to all subjects, not only voters or. Uh, candidates, uh, mass media including. So when developing recommendations, we recommend it within the context of different cases because we cover different levels. As for voters, uh, there are certain um, you know, requirements to them. As for observers, candidates and mass media, they also have a certain number of requirements. And even if there are signs, you know, of um, some respiratory disease of the voters, this kind of voter, if he still insists on the realization of his electoral right, he will be uh, uh, he will be given the right to realize his right. And uh, but we did give the recommendation to Minister of Health that in this case it would be well to organize the work in the commission to separate in the very particular building one uh, urn and one cabin for people who have symptoms of uh, uh, respiratory disease. And uh, they, uh, the space to be disinfected after each such voter. Will there be observer, observers or mass media representatives? Yes, because we did have the discussion. And by 641 resolution, the requirements on the uh, distance between them, and there are no, it doesn't actually fit uh, with the provisions of the electoral code. That's why we had to include this. Therefore, n no, you know, obstacles to mass media, no other observers, but there are certain recommendations uh, in, on, in our uh, interagency group. Uh, we offer to include the norm in the draft law of the resolution that no press events are going to take place in the uh, polling station, but the representatives of mass media can be present there. But I understand there are cases where media or famous or candidates who have who are popular and uh, they also vote, then there's a big public uh, event. That's why in this case we would recommend mass media if they want to interview them to do it uh, apart from not, you know, somewhere outside, not in the polling station to minimize the risk of infection. Also, we uh, advise to uh, let the voters ent enter in some cert in certain 
quantity, I mean, it shouldn't be more than three persons to each table of the documents so that to control the number of persons uh, who are at the same time in the polling stations. As for voters, there are other uh, requirements uh, to them as, I mean, concerning the disinfection measures and cleaning uh, the tables every two hours and uh, cleaning the floor every four hours. So we have developed many requirements to, to be more specific about which of them will be implemented. I think that next week we are going to see it in the adopted document by the government. I would like to ask the similar question to Olga. Olga Ivazovska, tell us please. Do you plan for observers such possibilities of potential restrictions or limitations in meters to be between the people? How will observers observe from the distance or will the observers approach people and uh, check the potential violations? Well, obviously that we are to find balance between safety and compliance of, with the electoral code and rights of citizens, including observers. So we plan and we are already exercising procurement of the protective individual protective means. So we are using the recommendations of the Minister of Health. So when the government resolution is going to be adopted, we're going to use it in our activity. And uh, it will apply also to observers who are going to be at the police stations. But we insist that observation from the 10 meters distance is not effective or acceptable and it's uh, the, the limit the violation of our rights. As for the protective measures, the healthy members of the committee or observers who come with any symptoms to the polling stations, we, they have to, of course we are to follow all the recommendations and not to violate the electoral rights. So I would like to speak about the question of identification of red zones and we receive comments. Can you seriously consider a question that you will have, you know, very stiff lockdown measures would, would have to be introduced? Do you think there's a potential, uh, you know, possibility, you know, when it's not going to be adaptive lockdown but is it possible this scenario you know then the lockdown will have to be introduced again so a small comment uh, for Olga I would like to uh, reassure her that we did in our recommendations we did not include 10 meter space between people if we have in our recommendation it's not less than one meter and all observers will have the possibility to observe from in any place that is not prohibited, but for the cabin itself, not to violate the secrecy of voting. And they will have the possibility to observe and will have the access to all the information. So as for the red zones, this question is often raised and really the electoral legislation foresees not so many cases when it cannot be or won't be conducted. And as for lockdown measures, and not, no clear uh, recommendations is actually envisaged. We are only considering two cases. First is the military uh, state and the emergency state introduction. Red zone, according to the resolution of the government, is not the ground to uh, say that uh, some elections cannot be carried out on certain territory. If theoretically, well, theoretically it is possible, of course, because uh, it is possible that uh, it is possible that the state of emergency will be introduced, but according to the decree of the president, it has to be approved by the Verkhovna Rada. So such decisions, if are accepted, it's going to be on the highest political level. And uh, as of t today, we do not have information about certain perspectives to uh, due to some lockdown measures be, to be introduced that uh, the elections must be postponed. Today all state institutions are actively 
uh, have actively joined uh, to the preparatory state of the electoral process. Our first task to do it in correspondence with the provisions of the electoral code, world standards, and to, given the lockdown measures to, to provide safe conditions both for voters and for the for organizers of the electoral process. That's why we shouldn't speak about some abolitions today. But we have a problem with COVID. We have a problem with occupied territories. And there are people who think that electronic voting as one of the ways to um, solve these problems. So and there is a question uh, about voting on the occupied, ter occupied territories. I would like to, for all of our experts to uh, give a word on this account. So what do you think can help? I mean, do you think that the uh, electronic voting can help to solve the problem with the uh, COVID-19 or occupied territories voting? But will it be possible to highlight it in media? And to which extent this topic can be discussed right now in the media space? Because it seems to me that electronic voting is is like for is a work of very narrow field of experts but not of the wider publicity so let's start with andri anna olga and then we'll go back to the guest in the studio well thank you really it's an interesting topic that you are now trying to uh, highlight there are several questions first uh, for certain communities where where there are many people you know using smartphones and who have access to the internet electronic um, voting for them could be effective but we know that in the prefront uh, territory and the occupied territories people do not always have access to smartphones and i know the situation when uh, the checkpoint is crossed by the pensioners and uh, I mean, I can, can't imagine the situation where these uh, pensioners have to buy the uh, smartphone to install DIA on the smartphone. I think it's a matter of discussion, but I don't think that for 100 percent of uh, voters this could be a way out. Uh, no media must cover alternative uh, ways for these people uh, to vote till the next election. Yes, we need to find those mechanisms and uh, write around, uh, about them. Uh, this is an excellent topic, and I think we need to focus on that. I know that Anna Murlikina had a question related to this uh, particular topic uh, about how the elections will cost during the lockdown if the, they will be held offline. But I would also like to ask you, do you think uh, that online elections might be uh, really feasible? I think this is an excellent topic. But to start talking about it, we need a nudge, we need an impetus. We try to understand the uh, technical uh, peculiarities for voting online. We were told that uh, this is uh, this issue can only be solved uh, within the next two or three years. So uh, there are a lot of problems related to that. Uh, so if it will take uh, from two to three uh, years, we cannot talk about it for the next elections. It seems to me that in any case, it is a good way to vote, especially for the young people. Uh, those, uh, a lot of them don't want to uh, vote on offline, so probably they would vote online. As for the occupied territories, I have doubts whether it might be interesting for them. For four years, uh, we've been fighting for the right for IDPs to vote. Uh, this year, uh, this right, uh, these people finally received this right. But when we see information on how many people changed uh, the address for voting, 
I have a question. Was it worth uh, those efforts? Because actually very few people changed uh, their address uh, to vote. That is why it seems to me that information campaign is definitely needed. It shall be an important communication campaign in order to raise awareness, to raise interest of these people in uh, this opportunity to vote online or to change uh, the voting address. Of course, I know the position of Opora, but I would like to ask Olga to comment on their position. Uh, do you think that online voting might be a way to overcome uh, some concerns or challenges uh, related to elections during lockdown? Or might it be an opportunity to uh, implement voting rights in the occupied territories? Well. Personally, I think uh, there, are, uh, there are low chances to postpone elections, to delay land elections. In this case, I think that postponing elections is a, might be the only way it can be done. But I'm sure that uh, every political party uh, pres presented in the parliament uh, will evaluate pros and cons of these elections and they might postpone it, won't postpone it, because we don't know if uh, the uh, state of emergency will be imposed. Uh, we cannot forecast how many uh, people infected with COVID-19 will we have. Uh, most probably uh, the epidemiological situation uh, will worsen. Uh, that is why postponing elections might be a problem. We need to hold these elections and then move forward, continue fighting uh, the pandemic locally. As for the second question about voting or IDPs, I'm sure that uh, this decision was efficient. As of 10th September, 92,000 people were registered. So we are waiting for the final numbers. I think uh, there will be uh, several dozens, thousands more. Uh, so these are good results. Uh, well, there are several, there were several violations, and we need to tackle them until. Uh, uh, there are further problems. As for the voting in the occupied territories, my position or the position of Opora is that we are uh, against it in the current conditions because uh, it would be difficult to organize uh, th such elections according to the constitution and then according to the election code and international standards. Uh, there shall be a transitional period which shall start not from the first day of ceasefire but from the transit of uh, these occupied territories into the legal space of Ukraine because we need to uh, the state must uh, control law enforcement agencies and uh, all the relevant institutions to be able to hold elections and the last question about online uh, uh, elections. Uh, I think that uh, IT people in Ukraine think that uh, we can do that because we have 3G, 4G and uh, we'll have 5G soon. Most people have computers and smartphones, but in reality the situation is a bit more complicated. It's not only about uh, the technologies, it is about protecting the system, protecting it against violations, because uh, because there might be violations from uh, Russia, China or the US, uh, which are actually, uh, I don't uh, say that they interfere uh, in uh, other elections, but it seems to me that uh, the interference of Russia in uh, other elections in other parts of the world has been already proved. Uh, thanks, Olha. Uh, sorry for interrupting you, but we don't have enough time, uh, uh, unfortunately. 
Serhii, can you please voice your opinion, your position, your personal and the position of the Central Election Committee on uh, the possibilities of uh, voting uh, in the occupied territories uh, and uh, the online voting? As for the online voting, I can say that that we differentiate online voting and uh, and voting using different uh, programs or gadgets or machines. As for the online voting or internet voting, as the Central Election Committee, we have voiced our concerns about making this decision. We actively cooperate with the Ministry of Digital Transformation, with international organizations. I'm also head of the working group, uh, which actually introduces um, information technologies into this process. And we plan to organize a forum to showcase uh, the pros and cons of using information technologies in the election process. Uh, we can only say that Estonia is probably the only country which uses efficiently the uh, process of online voting. At the previous election, they started using these technologies and they used uh, it somehow since its independence. So they are the most experienced in it. During the previous elections, if I'm not mistaken, uh, only 40% of voters used online voting. What are the risks? I really like this idea, I support this idea, but until until we find the way to provide uh, safety and security of identif identification of voters in the system uh, to preserve the secrecy of the vote, until we tackle these issues, I think it is too soon to make any important decisions. Internet voting is a voting in an uncontrolled uncontrolled space. For example, there might be one, uh, if this voting is held, uh, for example, in, in a place, uh, in a, a settlement, uh, there might be a big owner or, for example, a big plant, and he might force to everyone to vote for him from the same computer. The second problem is uh, uh, sorry, unfortunately, we don't have enough time. So, and the second question is uh, uh, the trust in the election process. It is very easy to distort to uh, this trust and any fake news from the part of, uh, of, of the aggressor state might impact this process. And we see uh, from our history, uh, started from the Orange Revolution, that uh, we might have a lot of distrust in the election process. We need to to tackle those issues. I would like to thank you, Serhii, and all participants of the discussion. Uh, thanks Olha, Anna and Andri for taking part in our Zoom conference on this important topic. I would also like to remind you that uh, in 15 minutes, we will start our next discussion, which is called COVID-19 pandemic and the European media, Europe's ways out of the coronavirus crisis. We'll have with us a lot of international experts, so please join us later, 11.30 in 15 minutes. We'll see each other once again, and you will be able to ask your questions in the chat box and uh, get valuable gifts for asking your questions. Uh, this is the first uh, forum which is held online because of the uh, coronavirus crisis. So, see you later in 15 minutes and we hope to see you next year offline. Пригадайте свій сюжет, статтю або програму, яка допомогла вирішити проблему читача або глядача. Що першим спадає на думку? Можливо, яма на дорозі, яку після вашого матеріалу все-таки відремонтували. Переселенці, які не мали житла і завдяки вашій статті змогли його отримати. Або ситуація, коли порушені права людини були відновлені після вашого сюжету. Я пам'ятаю, що під час 
парламентських виборів ми знімали дівчину з інвалідністю, яка не мала доступу до своєї виборчої дільниці, тому що вона була на другому поверсі. На другий тур після нашого сюжету і змінили місце голосування. Часто такі матеріали стосуються соціальних прав і свобод, медичного обслуговування, умов праці, соціальних виплат та допомоги. Ці права гарантуються Конституцією України та міжнародними договорами, зокрема, Європейською соціальною хартією. Насправді, зовсім нещодавно були оприлюднені висновки Європейського комітету соціальних прав щодо виконання Україною взятих на себе зобов'язань за Європейською соціальною хартією переглянутою. І висновки є надзвичайно цікавими. Вони констатують і факти порушень Україною тих чи інших зобов'язань. Зокрема, що стосується низки соціальних виплат, які є численними, проте не завжди ефективними. Соціальні права – це базові права людини. Їхні порушення може негативно активно впливати на людей, соціум та країну в цілому. Та чи достатньо уваги ми, журналісти, приділяємо висвітленню цієї теми? З одного боку, може здатись, що соціальна тематика – це неважливо, як її зазвичай звикли називати, це соціалка, там, про те, в кого протік дах, де яка ямка на дорозі, чи куди люди не можуть там доїхати, не знаю, громадським транспортом, але насправді це все набагато глобальніше і це те, що турбує кожного з нас. Кожна людина має знати, які обов'язки держави перед нею щодо забезпечення тих чи інших прав. І мені здається, що саме медіа відіграють ключову роль у тому, щоб донести цю інформацію до кожної людини. Керівниця проєкту Ради Європи розвиток соціальних прав людини як ключовий чинник сталої демократії в Україні Сюзанна Мнацаканян наголошує, є 31 базове соціальне право людини і поки що уваги як регіональне так і загальнонаціональних ЗМІ до цієї проблематики недостатньо. Набагато більше зараз медіа приділяють увагу рішенням Європейського суду з прав людини. Але не потрібно забувати про висновки Європейського комітету соціальних прав, тому що е, там є дуже багато цікавого матеріалу та фактажу, які можна використати для того, щоб зробити і такі розслідування. Дуже важливо, щоб ЗМІ приділяли належну увагу висвітленню питань, пов'язаних з соціальними правами. Крім того, при підготовці таких матеріалів журналістам особливу увагу експерти рекомендують приділяти чутливій лексиці. Однак чи можна зберегти в такому випадку зацікавленість читача? Цього року на Донбас медіафорумі будуть озвучені слушні поради щодо висвітлення соціальних прав місцевими і національними ЗМІ. Хмари рухаються за вітром, а фейки незалежно від погоди всюди, де є люди. Це перегромадське чеканемо, де ми перевіряємо, як ви відрізняєте факти від фейків. Виглядачі теж граєте з нами. У випуску є питання і для вас. То що, поїхали! У Франції дослідник встановив, чим більше в чиновників вага, тим більше в країні корупції. Як ви гадаєте, це факт чи фейк? Судя по Україні, то це правда. Що за дослідник, що за стаття. Які там методологія. Фейк. Думаю, що для нашої країни це факт. Факт. Яка вибірка? Ну, я думаю, що це факт вже. Ну, звісно, факт. Чим більше у тебе власті, тим легче воровати. Перше джерело треба. Я думаю, це ніяк не взаємопов'язано. Ні, ну, звісно, це бред. Більше схоже на фейк. Я б сказала, що так. А так ви сказали б, що це фейк, так? Ну, звичайно, як фейк. Ви не повірите, але такий взаємозок справді встановили в одному з досліджень. Так. Ось таке, так. Ви відповіли правильно. Хочете зробити те саме чотири рази і виграти приз. Вам потрібно буде сказати факт чи фейк. Якщо відповідаєте правильно, ви граєте. Давайте спробуємо. Добре. Ну, добре, давай. Добре, рухаємося тоді туди. Правила нашої гри такі. Я даю вам чотири питання новини. Вам потрібно сказати факт, це чи фейк. Ви можете скористатися один раз правом на помилку. Тобто, якщо ви даєте неправильну відповідь, ми продовжуємо гру, і як наче нічого й не було. Добре. Але не більше. Інакше ви програєте. Угу. Але без призу ми вас сьогодні не залишаємо. Я зрозумів. Готові? Готові. Новина номер один. У Росії зареєстрували вакцину від коронавірусної хвороби. Це факт чи фейк? Я не пам'ятаю, де я її бачив. Я в Фейсбуці це бачив. Десь читав. 
Ну, я видел просто заголовок такой, я не вчитывался, я заголовок видел и все. Вот. Ви впевнені, що там йшлося саме про реєстрацію вакцини? Ні, не впевнений, але я вважаю, що це факт. Наскільки мені відомо, що його ще не зареєстрували. Це факт, що зареєстрували, але чи діє вона, я думаю, це, це ще питання. Добре, остаточний повід – це факт. Скажемо, що це факт. 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 Та що я вважаю, що це фейк. Добре, приймаю. Я нагадую, що у вас є Одне. право на помилку. Да, але один раз добре. Так. І цього разу ви це право не використовуєте. Це добре. справді факт. У Росії справді зареєстрували вакцину від коронавірусної хвороби. І не повірте, вже навіть зробили першу партію. Ось. Так, але кажуть, що ми не маємо цьому так дуже довіряти. І як ви справді сказали, до її ефективності поки є питання, оскільки із результатами досліджень, які проводили російські науковці, ще поки не знайомилась міжнародна спільнота. Mm-hmm. Тому вони не знають, що саме ті вакцини mm-hmm. є. Це лише заяви російських посадовців, можна сказати так. Mm-hmm. У будь-якому разі ви право на помилку скористалися, ми рухаємося далі, усе гаразд. Добре. Питання номер два таке. Угу. В Україні запрацювала технологія, завдяки якій можна розплачуватися обличчям. Це факт чи фейк? Факт. Ось я так ві... одразу. Я бачив в борду десь, що таке є. Да. Ну, я чула про таке, угу. так. Що в Києві десь це вже є. Я ще перший раз від вас чую, і я думаю, що це фейк. Ну, взагалі вірите, що таке може бути? Так, да, звісно, є же Face ID. Вже розпознають давно ліця системи безпеки во багатьох країнах світу. Я досить часто бувала за кордоном, не чула про таке. Але, можливо, просто щось упустила. Угу. І ви не можете пропустити, що є така технологія? Ну, скажімо так, я не вважаю, що Україна в такій сфері, скажімо це так, Впереді планети всі, тому не дуже віриться. Це технологію запустив Приватбанк, наскільки я знаю, перший. Спочатку вона була десь в Дніпрі, угу. а зараз вже більше є посттерміналів, які угу. працюють з цією технологією. А ви користувалися? Ні, не користувалися. Але, але впевнені, що це так? Впевнені, що це так. І ваша сочна відповідь – це факт. Це факт. Факт. Ну, я думаю, що це фейк. Я б сказала, що фейк. За кордоном, як ви кажете, ви не стикалися ніколи Ні. з такою технологією. А в Україні доведеться. Зрозуміло. Це факт, на жаль. Запустив цю технологію Приватбанк. О. Так звані біометричні платіжні термінали, де можна розплатитися з Це вам не Приватбанк заплатив за цю вікторину? В жодному разі, чесно ага. скажу. То я не думав, щоб воно вже так би вже працювало. Але, на жаль, ви дали другу неправильну відповідь. Да. Але я обіцяв, що без подарунку ми вас не залишаємо. І я дарую вам ось таку книжечку з бібліотеки громадського. Тримайте. Угу. Дякую вам. Да. Подивіться на ось це зображення. Ми стверджуємо, що на ньому єгипетські піраміди підсвічені в кольори прапора Лівану після вибуху в Бейруті. Факт це чи фейк? Свої відповіді пишіть у коментарях. Ті, хто дасть правильну відповідь і ще й найперше з усіх, отримає у подарунок ось такий приз від нас. Переможців ми оголосимо у наступному випуску програми. Третє питання таке. У Данії на виборах можуть голосувати тільки платники податків. Це факт чи фейк? Ті люди, які вирішують долю країни, мають щось сплачувати mm-hmm. за це, скажімо так. Ну це цікава думка. Ну що якщо ти сплачуєш так в казну, то ти і маєш право обирати, хто буде використовувати ці гроші. А ну, я думаю, що пенсіонери, які не платять, і домохозяйки, які також живуть в державі, і люди інваліди, які не працюють, вони теж живуть в державі і мають право вибирати власть, яку яка їх буде представляти. Ви бували в Данії взагалі? Так, да, бувала. Я багато де бувала, да. Я бувала в 50 країнах. От Бразилія Ого. була остання в 50. Ого, це ж чудово. Але не дуже так цікавилась вибор, виборним правом, це цілком, це цілком зрозуміло. А, до речі, як в Україні, не знаєте? Гадаю, що зараз голосують не всі платники податків. Можливо, скандинави і живуть трошки по-іншому, може, саме через інший підхід. Давайте спробуємо так. Отже, ваша остаточна відповідь, що це... Фейк. Не думаю, що фейк. Тут буде відповідь лише на інтуїцію, це факт. Це факт. Я думаю, в країнах Скандинавії справді живуть інакше, але що стосується голосування в Данії... Ні, на жаль, це фейк. фейк. У Данії йдеться лише про обмеження на громадянство і на вік, але про обмеження на платників податків там немає і мови. На жаль, ви не відповідаєте правильно, але ви скористались правом на помилку. Усе гаразд. Ми рухаємося далі. Останнє питання. Я сподіваюся, що ви достане нього правильну відповідь. 
Добре. І побачимо, давайте. Уряд Сполучених Штатів пропонує збільшити водонапір у душі після того, як Дональд Трамп оскаржився, що не може нормально помити голову. Це факт чи фейк? Це якийсь жарт. Скажемо, що це факт. Факт? Так, в нього така шевелюра. Тобто ви можете повірити, що він не може нормально помити голову? Можливо, може бути таке, що Дійсно, напір зараз там за низький. Це повинні бути стандарти, але вони встановлюються ну, не парламентом точно, а комісіями всякими. Uh-huh. Е, який повинен бути тиск у душі? Я думаю, що це не є в компетенції уряду, що добре, це фейк. То все ж таки, ви спершу сказали, що нехай це буде факт. Тепер ви кажете, що це фейк. ладно, фейк. Ви бачите, ви мене весь час змінюєте мою думку. Я не хочу зараз змінювати вашу думку. А, не хочете? Хочете, щоб я виграла. Добре, це правда. Ну, ви не можете пропустити, що таке взагалі могло бути. Ну, так, да, враховуючи, що це він, це взагалі це таке могло бути. А в Україні, як гадаєте? Ну, вряд чи наш уряд би вирішив це регулювати, якщо б тільки президенту голову не, не можна було помити. А у США вважаєте таке можливо? А у США можливо. Там президент Трамп, хоча наш недалеко вийшов. Окей. Вашу сочну відповідь я її приймаю. Фейк. Фейк. А хай буде фактом. Правда. Ця новина звучить насправді дуже абсурдно. А це правда, не? А що ви взяли? Я ще не встиг нічого сказати. Але це факт. Справді таке є. Трамп одного разу поскаржився, і от буквально на днях Міністерство енергетики США, у них є така постанова, яка регулює обсяг води, що тече з душової головки, щоб економити воду. На жаль, ви не відповідаєте правильно, але я обіцяв, що ми не залишаємо вас без подарунка. І ось наш подарунок – це книга із бібліотеки громадського. Дуже дякую. Я вас вітаю. Ви перемогли. І ви отримаєте ось такий подарунок від нас. Оп, тримайте. Дякую. О, турбинка, правильно? Тут футболка. Правда в... Ага, правда в громадській. <рес> правда в серці. <рес> Брехня важка. Неси правду. Да, я згодна з цим. Спасибо большое. Да, дякую вам за участь. А ось і переможці нашого конкурсу в соцмережах, який ми оголосили в попередньому випуску. Вітаю! У ви першими дали правильну відповідь на наше запитання. Аби отримати свої подарунки, напишіть нам на адресу, вказану в описі під цим відео. Це був проект Чеканемо, де ми перевіряли, як ви відрізняєте факти від фейків. Не забувайте підписуватися на наш канал і вмикати критичне мислення. So, dear friends, we continue our Donbass Media Forum, we continue the discussion, the framework of this forum, and today we're going to speak how COVID-19 pandemic influences the European media, what are the ways Europe's ways out of this coronavirus crisis. We shall compare our situation in Ukraine with the situations of other European countries, and this discussion at Donbass Media Forum is supported by the EU delegation to Ukraine. That's why our speakers, these are representatives of the uh, European 
uh, EU member states. So we will have discussion in Ukrainian, but with the translation. So my name is Vladimir Mulenko. I'm director of Anal analytics intern use Ukraine. I would like to introduce our participants. It's uh, the French uh, journalist uh, Camille Magnard, Radio France International. Also Maria Person Lovgren, who uh, represents Swedish radio, a very uh, famous uh, in uh, Sweden. I wanna uh, Adela Drazanova uh, uh, from Czech Republic, and Ivana Reichert, New Eastern Europe, Poland. So greetings to all our guests. And as I said, we're going to switch to English right now much for joining the Donbass Media Forum. It's a great pleasure for us uh, to meet you here, to, um, to have the discussion with you here. And my first question would be, let's discuss uh, how the pandemics influence the media sector, the media environment in your countries. We're talking about Sweden, Czech Republic, Poland and France. Uh, and let me start with our uh, neighbor, with Poland, and I would ask Ivona Reichardt, what do you think, what is the situation with COVID-19 and its influence on media in your country? Yes, hello everybody. Um, thank you for this question. Um, I would say that um, uh, the influence of the pandemic was in the first phase uh, of, the, of the pandemic uh, crisis, that is in the early spring. <clears throat> At that time, um, especially me uh, print media were affected uh, naturally because of the closed distribution chains and um, they had to redirect efforts uh, to reach their readers uh, either via online or um, through direct sales. Uh, right now, I think the media uh, environment is coming back slowly to normal life. Um, it's probably not operating at 100% as, um, as it was in February, but I would say more or less 80%. So um, because the bookshops are reopened, the kiosks, uh, the news agents are reopened, so um, journals and magazines return to paper editions. However, naturally, the Digital subscribers stayed, so it has uh, maybe shifted some proportions, but, um, but the most important is that the distribution chains uh, um, uh, reopened. Um, naturally, uh, TV and radio did not get that much affected because um, this was um, available throughout the pandemic, and, and in this regard, it did not change that much. Thank you. I mean, no it's, negative effects. It's very interesting because in Ukraine we also see the, uh, that the pandemics influence primarily the print sector. But let me, you mentioned uh, radio and TV. We will also discuss the specific, uh, specific media sectors. But let me now turn to France and ask Camille Magnard. Uh, French situation was very drastic and it is very drastic. Uh, compared to some other countries. So what is the situation in your country? How the pandemic influenced media, which are very diverse, which are very interesting in your country? Yeah, I think that there have been different moments in this epidemic and the next drastic moments, uh, I'm afraid. So we are in between two, two waves, as we say here, we are expecting to have other uh, drastic situations with the, the, the pandemics. Media, I think the first time has been um, in, in the spring, has been a, a global mobilization, very strong in mobilization of all the media uh, in the frame of what could be done in the lockdown, because uh, it has been very hard to, to go through reporting uh, for long periods, so it was hard to, to know what was happening on the field in the society uh, we had to be mobilized uh, to to spread the the, um, the protocols and all the the, the um, political uh, information to inform people about what we knew was happening as long as we knew what was really happening and in we didn't really actually know what was happening, so uh, it was um, everybody, you know, focused on the, the the core mission of journalism. Media was to inform people on on uh, uh, general interest information, but it was hard to know exactly what we 
we could tell an, an, an informed so to, to be um, like um, say that in a way to to be the uh, I, I'm telling this because I'm working working for the French uh, public radio and uh, our mission in that moment was to to be the, the um, you know the media which was um, giving inform from the government so it was like official information we had to, to share with our audience and people expecting that were, were uh, willing to hear that but it was it's a very you know, um, frustrating way of uh, describing journalism it's not uh, it was hard to have the um, uh, critical distance to what was happening first moment so that was a uh, period for for journalism, I guess say uh, and on the economic uh, point of view i think it's a very hard and, and weakening period media very a lot of fragile fragile medias uh, i don't know if they will survive from the uh, economical crisis that is uh, now coming it's just so we we didn't hear that much from now uh, about uh, media groups and uh, and, and media outlets closing or, or stopping uh, their publication. But I think that is something we have to expect in the coming months. Thank you, Camille. I think uh, it's a very important topic. We'll come back to it, the question of fragility of media and what's happening in the sector and whether media are closing. But right now, let me turn to another, uh, another radio journalist, to Maria from Sweden. What's happening in Sweden and uh, uh, how the, the pandemics influence media in your country? Uh, sorry, we can't hear you. To interrupt you, we don't hear you. Uh, are you sure that you turned on your mic microphone? Can you try to talk right now? No, we don't hear you, unfortunately. Can, can you just turn, make the volume on your microphone a bit, a bit more, a bit better? Okay, there are technical details. I hope my colleagues will uh, check it with Maria, whether it's working or not. But let me now turn to Adela Drazanova from Czech Republic. Adela, uh, we already mentioned, Camille mentioned, and, um, and uh, Ivona mentioned that in their countries, uh, the, biggest, uh, the biggest problem was with print media. You're representing uh, a magazine a reporter in Czech Republic. Well, so is it true that print media are also uh, the biggest hit in your country? Uh, hey everyone, yes that's uh, true. Uh, our situation is a bit specific uh, because we are a monthly magazine. We are um, in a way in slightly better and worse situation. We are a very small media outlet uh, but it gives probably a bit more uh, room for, for maneuver. Uh, I think the the situation economically is comparable to the consequences of 2008 and 2009. We all remember that. That was pretty bad. Uh, this thing was quicker because it was basically it happened overnight. We've already very early into the crisis. We uh, we noticed the, uh, that the, the the income from from advertising, which is our main source of income, goes down rapidly. Uh, but I think we have the advantage of uh, being a small media with the, let's say, with the story, if you know what I mean, uh, because we were, we, uh, our magazine was founded in 2014, uh, shortly after our current prime minister and the oligarch bought the media house we all used to work in, so we left and, and founded this, and it kind of, um, attracts people, readers, um, they are very loyal to us uh, and they kind of identify themselves with us. 
the reason I'm saying that is uh, that it's the advantage that might help to overcome this crisis. Then you have mid-size or bigger size, let's say daily newspapers, print daily newspapers, and I think they are they were hit the most uh, because first, daily newspaper is kind of an obsolete format anyway. Second, they uh, uh, they feel the, the advertising gap. Um, I mean, the, 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 the decreased incomes of, uh, from advertising as well. And they're they're big. They're they're a huge machine that has to work. So I think this this is something that will be hit the most. Uh, print daily newspapers and print sector in in general, obviously. Thank you, Adela. I think this is a, uh, also something that we feel and experience in Ukraine. So probably this is a mm. worldwide trend, and obviously, well. The logic helps us understand that it is the case. Print media are the most hit. But let me now turn to Maria. I hope uh, we overcome these technical di difficulties. Maria, let me ask this question that I asked you. What was the influence of the pandemic on media in your country, in, partic in particular your sector, the radio sector? I think we can't hear Maria uh, again. So we, uh, unfortunately, we can't hear Maria. Let's let's now turn uh, turn uh, on and discuss other things with other colleagues. Maybe I hope we will get her back. Uh, what are the responses of the media sector? It's also an important question. Let's talk about solutions, not only about problems. Let me first ask uh, Camille Magnard from France Culture. What was the response of the French, French media, state-owned media, private media? Uh, what are the creative approaches they were using to uh, keep their audience, maybe to get more money, get more funds, and to overcome the negative consequences of the crisis? Camille? Yeah, can you turn on the microphone? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it okay for you? Yes. Can you hear me? Perfect, perfect. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, so yes, I was saying that talking talking about uh, our public uh, mid um, radio, I, I would say it was uh, really deep, and we have we had to be very creative to point of view to to be able to to broadcast, to report, uh, to be, uh, you know, do our job, just basically. And so that um, made a, a lot of, uh, of work, of uh, reflection, mobilization, all the people in the radio. Uh, the problem is that we were able to, to go in, the, in, you know, in our offices in, in Paris, for example, because there, was, there were really strong restrictions, sanitary restrictions. Gathering in uh, in our offices, so it was uh, you talk creative uh, responses, and we had to really creative on an organizational point of view. I would say from tech point of view, so that's it. And and uh, the nature of our broadcasting changed. We we wanted to be people to to be able to to talk uh, on the on the air to there to be to hear themselves the on our broadcasting, and that, that is something which we do, like open uh, air to people can call us and, and tell us how they feel and how they live, and and they uh, think that was really important for people, I guess, in the area of the of the down uh, to be able to to express themselves and to say what they to to passages, for example, to, to relatives that they could not see. Or, this is something that really changed the way we worked and, and we had to think this very quickly. So that was very, very exciting. But on the and other, um, another reality this period was that it could not work technically and they, they had to stay home and they had to work, which changed a lot. And, and uh, another consequence that the collective um, 
um, life of the staff, uh, you know, uh, editorial staffs of our media was really all organized and, and it was hard to have a collective uh, brainstorming. Uh, of course, you can do uh, uh, Zoom or, or any other, uh, you know, uh, video, uh, video call and so, but it's hard to be uh, a collective um, body of journalists and to think together you are all at home. So that is another one that, that we had to to find the solutions about. So for, for what uh, the reaction of, of uh, all the, the challenge that the, the COVID uh, lockdown uh, um, posed to us, um, for the, the private media, it's hard for me to say, um, a lot of media had to create from home, to, I would say, uh, New uh, media, um, new new like video uh, live streams on internet, for example. I, I know uh, online uh, uh, a lot of of print media had to go uh, uh, one hundred percent digital, for example. And uh, our radio uh, France Culture, which could not do any live broadcasting for a period of the down, had to to go dig deep in our archive to find programs that could fit to what people were expecting to, to, to give them uh, educational um, um, things or uh, a lot of uh, cultural uh, um, programs too that we could not do live in this special period. We had to, we could get out of the archives a lot of things that was that were interesting and people were happy to to rediscover the to to hear this uh, release of all program that were and, and and that would give us a, a way to think in another way with other uh, uh, reflections um, what was happening to in that very short period. Thank you, Camille. Uh, I would like to turn to Adela. Uh, Adela, Camille mentioned this problem of, you know, group work when uh, people are no longer in their bureaus, in their studios, discussing things that they need to stay home, and that's a negative, uh, negative it, it influenced in a negative way the work of the media. But when we talked to journalists, to Ukrainian journalists, uh, some of them were saying that it was also had a positive impact because there was more transparency in, you, in the newsroom, everybody was also following others' work. What do you think and what is happening in the Czech Republic in this way? How the journalists were responding creatively on this and how they were overcoming these negative challenges? Uh, sure. Um, uh, again, uh, in our case, uh, being a monthly magazine and a very small team of people, uh, there were, when it comes to the, uh, both the content and the, uh, the organiza organizational life, I mean organization of, the, of our office life, uh, there were advantages and disadvantages as well as with economical part of the whole thing and both are obviously interconnected. But when it comes to uh, like office life or our, well, coming together and, and, and talking about things, well, we are monthly, as I said uh, before, and uh, so not together every week, twice for a planning meeting, not together there every day is less of a problem, obviously. We were in, in permanent touch uh, over Zoom and phones and, and everything. Um, we also have to be very creative. Um, but anyway, uh, this like purely organizational uh, side of things wasn't such a big problem like in, in let's say, daily newspaper or, or, or anything. When it comes to content, um, again, uh, advantages, disadvantages. Advantages, we are, we are monthly, means we didn't have to uh, cover the daily development. Uh, we had to obviously come with something that would uh, be deeper. Um, we, and the this, this situation was changing rapidly, so that was a bit challenging to come up with something that wouldn't change in a week before we are printed or whatever, uh, if you know what I mean. Um, that was what was interesting. There was a point that everybody felt uh, that uh, 
positive stories are strongly needed. Um, we have to come up with something that will cheer up people a little bit and it will cheer up us as well. <laughs> so that was, that was um, uh, one thing and we, uh, for example, we had a series on, on human stories like people, Czech people who are stuck somewhere abroad uh, because of the pandemics or foreigners who are stuck in the Czech Republic. Then we had some interesting people, not like celebrities, like uh, 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 simple, simply celebrities, but interesting people who are doing something creative and what, how they, how they are uh, dealing with the whole situation. So we were trying to 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 make it a bit more positive in a way to not not to not to get into a depression even more. So that was one one way, um, and obviously um, economically, uh, we also. Um, made some steps. I don't know if, if it's the right time to think, uh, to, to talk about it right now or, or we will get back to it later. Tell me what, what, do you, what do you think. You mean the information, disinformation topics? What do you mean? No, no, no. I mean uh, the, the economic, like the, the economic consequences for the, for the magazine. Uh, we had to come up with some creative uh, approaches and, and, and some initiatives to, to survive, but I think we are now talking rather about the content, right? Okay, let's talk about it right later because I would like to focus more on, uh, on the information issues and the way how the public perceives information. Let's talk about it later a little bit. Uh, but let me ask uh, Iwona um, from New Eastern Europe in Poland, uh, what do you think about these creative approaches? Because Adela was mentioning the positive stories, the solution journalism. Was it indeed in Poland as well a kind of a, a way of responding to the crisis? Uh, yes, in, in Poland uh, initially there was, of course, uh, we were bombarded with negative news and, uh, and then the media switched off to uh, to more interest, I mean, at a certain point, we couldn't even open any websites or magazines when it was so COVID dominated and negative. And that was a popular sentiment that people were expressing. But uh, what I would like to stress as a, as a positive um, outcome of this uh, pandemic uh, with, with regards to media content is that we suddenly discovered that we have experts outside Warsaw. And this is uh, actually very, very enriching for us because uh, we are, I think the TV viewership or uh, radio, listening to radio has decreased because we constantly hear the same people who are just available and willing to come to the studio. And, uh, and you know, journalists work under pressure, they have lists, so, so they like these kind of guys, usually men, who, who have time and energy to come to the studio. And, and now our debate, and I hope this remains, however, of course, the, there is the issue of quality. And then sometimes I myself am not from Warsaw, so I talked over the phone and I am aware that the quality of my recording was not as good as the one from the studio. But I think some journalists uh, opened their eyes to, to more interesting voices uh, to, uh, and, and saw the advantage of, of interesting people, having diverse and interesting people um, on air, um, so so in my view, in terms of content, this was uh, this was the the biggest uh, plus of this pandemic. Thank you, Ivona, and let let me now turn to this information, disinformation, propaganda issues because it is something very important and very hard to follow. What I mean is that, for example, in Ukraine, we are facing a situation when a lot of social media are spreading. Uh, fake news. Uh, they're spreading these, you know, uh, conspiracy theories about about Bill Gates spreading the coronavirus or the chips that are, will be inserted into people. Uh, th there is a big narrative that coronavirus is a hoax, that is is coming from America, is coming from China, whatever else. Do you ma do you also feel? Do you see such things in your media? In your countries because it's very, you know, there is a, an impression in Ukraine that is kind of a very typical Ukrainian situation where, where 
Well, I have a suspicion that it is worldwide and we can also see it in other countries. Let me now turn to Adela and uh, about Czech Republic. You mentioned that, you know, in Czech Republic there is also some oligarchic people are uh, owning media. You mentioned all the, the media that you previously worked on. Uh, and there are some influence, including the Russian or Chinese influence. Uh, what would you say about this issue, about the disinformation and conspiracy theories related to COVID-19? Uh, I would say that, uh, maybe surprisingly enough, it was um, probably better in a way than, uh, for example, when it comes to um, um, migration crisis, even though I don't like to call it crisis, but you remember 2015, 2016, the, the, the disinformation and misinformation and related to that was probably stronger and worse and widespread, more widespread. When it comes to COVID, it was, I would say, mostly limited to social media. Um, traditional media, TV, radio, newspapers, magazines didn't really, it wasn't the case, it wasn't the case. Um, so social media, yes, obviously, but um, there's nothing much you can do about that apart from, you know, trying to do your journalistic job. So uh, I don't know how it was in other countries, but when it comes to COVID, for me, slightly surprisingly, it was better than with migra migration crisis. Okay, it's interesting. Uh, Ivona, what, what's, what's about Poland? What was happening in Poland in, uh, in this area of disinformation, conspiracy theories, propaganda? And if there were some narratives which were extremely popular in Poland, can you name them? Well, uh, the situation is similar to the Czech Republic, that the mainstream media um, overall um, provided reliable information and all the disinformation is on Facebook and uh, all social media. I just read an article today that there is a group, I don't believe in COVID, and uh, it gathers 150,000 people. Um, the author of the article was uh, nervous about this, but I actually think for a country of 38 million, that's not that large of a of a group, and I would expect that such a group would exist on Polish uh, Facebook. Um, the problem in Poland is um, slightly different. We have a very polarized society now, extremely deep uh, political conflict within the country. So we have two um, groups of media, the, uh, the right wing, priv uh, public um, or state uh, actually uh, controlled uh, media and the liberal and the left media. And uh, what we are seeing now, um, unfortunately, is that the state controlled uh, private, uh, I'm sorry, uh, right-wing uh, media is allowing uh, some um, dangerous voices questioning uh, COVID. So the official government policy is, of course, that COVID exists and we should combat it. And um, the prime minister gets actually very angry when people do not uh, believe in COVID, yet the, the public TV allows some um, uh, uh, right-wing opinion makers with um, non-scientific uh, conspir uh, theories, conspiracy theories to enter. But uh, if you ask what kind of uh, theories, I won't actually provide you with anything exciting. It's the same, uh, these are the same ones as in uh, Ukraine. Um, so Bill Gates, uh, G5, G5 uh, all the same, like all, all these uh, theor theories are present here as well. Thank you, Ivona. Let me come to Camille, not Eastern Europe, but not Central Europe, but from, for us it's a Western Europe uh, in France. What's happening in France in this disinformation and, uh, about COVID-19? And uh, yeah. is there any group that is linking it to the United States? Is it used by some groups to kind of incite anti-Americanism in France? What's happening here? Yeah, we have this. It's you no know, super I guess for you. Uh, we do have a lot of this kind of disinformation uh, uh, going on on social networks. Of course, um, we have uh, no like no specific situation in France. Uh, I have to say that it was 
very strong friends uh, anywhere, I guess, uh, in, the, in the last months and, and years. So it's nothing new with the COVID. Of course, such a crisis uh, brings a lot of uh, disinformation, uh, as, as, as you mentioned. Um, something a bit special is that uh, in France, the people who are, uh, you know, sharing conspirationist uh, theories, they also found a, a, a person who was like incarnating their uh, information, so on, which uh, is Dr. Professor Didier Raoult. I don't know if you heard about him, uh, a professor from Marseille, who is really renowned as a, a scientist, but who has a, a marginal or alternative um, way of viewing all this uh, situation and who uh, took like position were not very the same as a, the consensus of this. So there was some pretty strong going on with this guy who, for the conspirationist people, tending to believe in this kind of audience kind of disinformation, this guy became kind of a hero who was um, going like against all the 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 mission the government and press was were supposed to share. So this guy was like their savior and the hero and it's some time to understand even from the the media to understand that this guy was uh uh, not uh, really critical and that we have to, to distance with uh, what he was saying because there's a phenomenon, a really specific French phenomenon around this this person who had expertise is something that uh, 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 scientific credit but to, to hear as someone who is uh, uh, concentrating a um, rationalist um, and disinformation about COVID uh, around him so that the thing I think that would be specific to France, I would say. The rest, uh, un unfortunately, it was uh, all same, uh, uh, all the same, you know, bullshit as I can uh, read and uh, and listen to on the on the social media. Thank you, Camille. My next question is related to what we ask right now. It comes from our audience, but it's naturally. Uh, goes after this question of uh, conspiracy theories and propaganda. The panic uh, in the society, which was stimulated by some media, some social media, we had it in Ukraine as well. I would not say that it was too harsh, but it was present. What about France, for example, Camille? Was, was some you know, social media accounts, some media saying that the situa situation is far worse than it is and obviously in France which were, which is severely hit by the pandemics we could have expected probably this you know panic moods what do you think uh, I it's hard to first moments of the of the pandemic and things like lockdown and so announced but I was surprised I have to say uh, that the people really kind of followed instruction and re respected all the uh, the lockdown um, obligations. So uh, there were, there was not really a phenomenon of panic in the in the society uh, in the first times because people were like, understanding they had to do it. And even in, in, in part of the country, they were not really directly affected by the strong epidemic situation like in Paris or big cities or in clusters like uh, in special part of the countries where the, the, the virus was, was spreading very, very fast and with a lot of people uh, uh, dying every day. And uh, even in, in these regions where uh, the, the COVID was not so strong, the people didn't really panic and they really stayed home and organized to, to, to the respect all these rules. I, I would say, of course, not every respected the rules in the time and, and there were people like going uh, against it, but uh, a minority. I, I was surprised by this, you know, we often say that French people are uh, Latin people and they don't respect any, any rule and, and so. So that was the first time because there was a, a surprise, a shock. We didn't know what we were in front of. 
to, to take uh, this, uh, this uh, measures. Uh, but after that, when journalists, I would say, started doing the job and reporting about what was happening, retirement homes, for example, and the situation was really dramatic, and what was happening in hospital, what the government failed to, to manage and had to lie about the situation, about uh, masks, about the testing that was not, not ready and they organized in a good way. So after that, people started to think that maybe we are not told the exact truth, maybe they are manipulating us, but it's also related to a lack of transparency and a lack of efficiency, I would say, of the political decision that were taken. And when the journalists, because it's our job and it's good, Start starting to criticize this on on uh, with acts to reproach. Of course, people were less um, uh, maybe rethinking the rule. There was a, a panic that was starting maybe. Thank you, Camille. Uh, let me now turn to the question of trust because it's it's an important issue, of course. Uh, trust to media and trust to public institutions. Do you think that in your countries? the pandemics increased trust to media or decreased trust to media? Let me first uh, ask Adela. So uh, did the journalists, did the media mainly uh, uh, do their work in a proper way and it is increased trust or on the contrary people were, tr were trying to look for alternative information in social media and other sources? Adela? Um, uh, that's a very interesting question. Thank you for it. That's. Uh, I would say that uh, there were there were stages, there were phases of, of this. Uh, the first stage or first phase was at the very beginning of the pandem pandemic, um, because it came um, in at the end. Let's say at the end of February, uh, beginning of March, where most of the country, uh, region by region, Hello. we have a spring break. We have a spring break, and spring break uh, means that half of the country goes to Italy for their skiing holidays. And obviously, people are looking forward to it, and people are 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 uh, they have paid for it, and they you know the kids are excited about going to going on holiday, and people were going, and then the 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 um, situation was getting worse, and that was the phase where. Uh, media was heavily, heavily criticized for spreading panic. It was like, oh, these media, you know, media is like they always, they, they don't do their, their job uh, in, a, in a proper way and they ju they're just spreading panic. They don't have any other topic to, to write about and stuff like that, which is something that is not only connected to uh, COVID. It's, I would say, more general, more overall situation and the more general mood in the society uh, recently in the Czech Republic. Media, uh, these journalists, you know, uh, people are skeptical, people are people criticize. Uh, the public broadcast media are under, uh, is under, under uh, pressure quite a lot. It, it's connected to a political situation, to politics, uh, uh, politicians, uh, approach to the media. So that was the phase where people were, uh, even people within the media were saying, oh, you know, it's not that, it's not going to be that, uh, that's uh, serious. We are going on holiday. We are going to Italy. And then the government closed the border, then the, and, and it all started, and uh, people realized that it was actually quite bad. It was quite serious. And then I would say that uh, the situation switched when it comes to the trust to the media as well. Also, practically, people were sitting at home. They couldn't go anywhere. So they were watching the TV, like they were watching the public public broadcast, uh, we, uh, the public TV, uh, still the biggest one here. Um, um, not when it comes to the share of the market, but... Um, uh, they have a special studio, special special broadcast, obviously a 24-7 24, 24 broadcast connected to COVID. So that was when people, I would guess, um, their trust in the media went up again a little bit. I don't know what's going to happen after it's all gone, uh, because it's not the case now. Uh, let's see. But... Um, 
there were these two stages of the whole situation it was developing. Thank you, Adela. Let me come uh, to Ivona and ask a question about rather not media but public institutions. Uh, whether the trust to public institutions were increasing or decreasing in Poland, but you obviously, uh, and we know that, obviously, this polarization of Polish society, how the, the power, the authorities were reacting to this, how the president was reacting, how the prime minister were reacting, what the kind of a repeating the uh, models of other some other populists, you know, in the world like Donald Trump or other people, or were they doing something else? Ivona? Mm -hmm. um, yes, thank you. Uh, I would just uh, would like to add just one sentence to the media question, trust in media. In Poland, the problem, as you mentioned, the word polarization is, um, the question should be like, do you trust the media? It, it, the answer is, you trust your media. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is how polarized the society is. You, you trust the media that you associate with and you don't even read or watch the other media. And, and it's a huge problem when it comes to objectivity uh, and, um, and it's, the divisions are getting only deeper and deeper also um, throughout, they have gotten deeper and deeper throughout the pandemic because of that. Um, when it comes to um, trust in public institutions, this is a very interest. This was a very, inter very interesting here in Poland because in the beginning of the pandemic, um, despite the polarization of the country, which is um, almost uh, right now at 50-50, um, as we saw in our last uh, presidential elections, um, everybody stood behind the um, prime minister and behind the minister of health, who was a hero. Um, uh, I heard uh, voices from people who are liberals who were saying, I'm so proud of my uh, prime minister, I'm so proud of the uh, minister of health, they, they really did the right thing. And um, in the beginning, the, the minister of health was the most trusted guy, uh, pub, uh, public uh, figure in Poland. Um, the situation started to change when, there, uh, when um, information about uh, some corruption scandals uh, with, the, with regards to masks and respirators started to emerge and uh, we learned that maybe not the Minister of Health directly, but his um, close family profited immensely from, the, uh, from some transactions and sales of, of this equipment and this uh, protective gear. Um, so at that time, um, of course, the pro-government uh, part of the society uh, still continued to, to support uh, his actions and trust him, but um, definitely the opposition uh, changed its mind. Um, we faced, and right now, uh, actually, it led to the point that, what, that the minister quit uh, just a few weeks ago, and now we have a technocratic minister of health um, that uh, people actually have almost like zero feelings warm or cold towards. Um, so at this point, he's kind of neutral. Um, we actually had presidential elections during the pandemic, and that was an interesting case in terms of trust because um, uh, the government suggested in the beginning that we'll have uh, uh, e-voting or correspondence voting uh, during the elections. And here the opposition completely did not trust the government and uh, did not trust the institution of the elections. Um, there were voices to boycott it. One of the leading candidates actually uh, said she would quit because of that. And uh, uh, um, so here we showed a huge distrust to the public, to public institutions and transparency of our political system at the moment. The government to encourage people to elections started at that time saying that COVID is um, not so strong in Poland, that it's okay. Um, especially for the elderly to, uh, so when we ran the elections eventually in person, um, there were still concerns um, about uh, the pandemic and, and, and the government uh, was toning the whole situation down that it's, it's okay, um, that the, the pandemic is not so bad. Um, especially this, we saw especially in the second round when um, the seniors were encouraged to, to come to the polling, uh, uh, stations and, and vote maybe in the morning be before and uh, pregnant ladies as well uh, before um, uh, the, the everybody else uh, comes. Um, so this showed that the, mm, the situation with the pandemic is very political and depends whether the government needs to have the numbers high or low. Uh, this will be the rhetoric and this is right now a little bit of the, the sentiment among the society that uh, 
even when numbers change, um, people uh, will notice that when the government needs the numbers to be high, they will be high. When the government needs the numbers to be lower, like to open schools, to reopen schools, the numbers go down. Um, so in this way, the, um, the pandemic affected the trust in the institutions, but uh, you have to keep in mind on, um, in a polarized society, this is more on the opposition side. Thank you, Vona. It's interesting that uh, in your country the numbers are going down before school opening because in Ukraine uh, they are going up and very high up. Let me remind to our listeners that uh, we are on Donbass Media Forum and we are discussing how the pandemics influenced the European media. We have journalists from uh, France, Czech Republic, Poland and Sweden and this discussion is uh, supported by the delegation of the European Union to Ukraine. We have now, finally, I, I hope, uh, Swedish journalist Maria Persson Lovgren. Uh, Maria, I hope you hear us. And uh, uh, of course, we are also looking at the Swedish example. And Sweden is a country that kind of had a different response to the COVID-19 than maybe many other countries in the world, including Ukraine. Can you tell us whether it was efficient, this Swedish response, and uh, how it affected media sector in your country? Well, um, I think, uh, first of all, you have to understand that uh, Sweden has a system where uh, politicians and uh, sort of the institutions are separated. And uh, we never had a political answer in the beginning. We had experts uh, in institutions who sort of uh, put out the Swedish strategy on how to combat uh, this uh, pandemic. And... Um, because of this, I would say that uh, people also trusted more because they were experts, but also uh, all the time they said that we might be wrong, which I think affected the trust among Swedes, that even if you're an expert, you can say that uh, I don't know this yet, but uh, we will see. And uh, the strategy that we had, of course, in the beginning, we had a lot of uh, deaths, and because of this, there were other experts who, who questioned our strategy. We have a quite open society. We didn't uh, demand that you use um, masks in public. Uh, we just recommended people to do different uh, things. Uh, on the whole, the media has uh, not been very critical of the strategy either, and there were some journalists from other countries who uh, complained that the Swedish journalists were not so critical at the everyday press conferences which we had uh, with these experts uh, and who were deciding on the Swedish uh, strategy. But uh, I don't think that uh, trust in media has gone down because of this, because uh, now we have a very low uh, spread of uh, the COVID-19 and we have very low death and uh, that's I think also affect uh, people's uh, trust in both media and the institutions. Was there any, any other impact on the media sector? Was there any kind of lockdown which was experienced by Ukraine, by Poland, Czech Republic, which as we had influenced very much the print sector and other sectors? Was there, was there any such thing in Sweden? Well, of course, there was. Uh, we have uh, the biggest, biggest national uh, newspaper. It's an evening paper. They have uh, cut down uh, on their stuff. Uh, a lot of journalists ha have to uh, uh, leave their work. But at the same time, uh, uh, well, I work in public service. We are not affected because we have a steady budget. And uh, also the government has put some money aside to, to media sector too to help media but still there will be of course effect when uh, the biggest national newspaper has to cut down on their staff uh, but uh, on the whole i think the, it's other fields within culture that affected much more because of course we didn't have uh, theaters working uh, cinema working all the concerts were not on and so on so this this will of course be affected uh, by closed downs thank you maria and we are, we are happy that you, you, you are back. 
Uh, we have a question from the audience, and it is uh, bringing us uh, again to these questions of conspiracy theories, propaganda, disinformation, malinformation, etc. So let me ask everybody. Uh, in Ukraine, we hear the narrative that uh, 5G towers, which are, you know, should spread the signal, uh, a, a more modern signal, a signal, mobile signal, information signal, is also used to spread coronavirus. Now, is it something that you uh, f see, that you see in your countries, that you hear in your countries? And when I ask about conspiracy theories, can you mention something interesting, something unusual, maybe in your countries that is used to uh, back the narrative that it is created by something and uh, uh, created to uh, reach a certain goal. Let me ask with Adela. Adela, what do you think? Uh, you mean this, this 5G thing, um, obviously, I think the set of disinformation was more or less the same everywhere. So yeah, it appeared here um, as well. Um, I have to admit that um, I uh, intentionally decided at the beginning of this whole thing not to pay attention to uh, to anything like this at all, <laughs> not to follow it even, because, uh, I mean, you can't avoid it fully. But it's but, interesting, um, sorry Adela to interrupt, but it's interesting to understand who is spreading it, what are the actors behind, what are the channels behind. For example, in Ukraine we can see that many anti-Western actors and some pro-Russian actors are spreading this, uh, this thing. Sorry. Um, in, in Czech Republic, what is the situation? The same, the same. I think it is very similar to, to we have, we have uh, some Russian influence, um, uh, Russian paid even, um, uh, Russian paid servers and, and, and websites and stuff like that. And um, also the, the situation, the polarization of the society is not even close to the level in, in Poland, but it's polarized, polarized as well. We, as you know, we have a very pro-Russian and pro-Chinese um, a president who um, basically in in any slightly crisis situation doesn't help uh, he's, he's far from being um, you know um, moral uh, whatever um, in the society so that there is certain polariz polarization as well um, and uh, so people uh, naturally tend to to believe this um, thing um, um, conspiration, conspiration of theories and fake news and stuff like that. Um, so yes, there was, there was, um, I was quite surprised that even some, let's say, um, well, people I wouldn't expect to believe these things show signs of, you know, um, um, doubts, let's say. They didn't believe these things fully, but, um, for example, my own um, uncle, who is a normal, uh, well-educated person. I once got a message from him. He was sharing some video, which was so obviously, it was um, American um, video, spreading some misinformation and fake news. And I, I told him, look, don't even uh, uh, send this to me and, and think a little bit, because this is so obvious that you can't really believe it. And then we talked about it and, and, and it was fine, but that was quite surprising. Um, uh, well, yeah, sorry, I, I, I forgot what was the what was the the other question. That I was, was asking about question. well about conspiracy theories uh, and what are some probably unusual conspiracy theories. For example, uh, it's interesting in Czech Republic uh, we know that there are some Chinese influence as well, and that yeah. some of your NGOs are. Uh, unclosing these Chinese influences, is there any attempt by these actors to say, no, 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 China has nothing to do with that, forget about China labs, it's all about Americans, etc.? Um, there was, as I said before, there was a the complete set of things. Obviously, yes, there is Chinese influence as well as Russian influence. The Chinese influence is, um, is strong, and um, the economy is influenced by that. Also, uh, one of the, uh, the, the we have one of the main Prague football 
uh, clubs uh, is owned by Chinese, which is very sensitive for 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 uh, the Czech society. So there was, but I wouldn't say that there was anything special. Uh, especially creative when it comes to conspiration theories um, connected to the Czech Republic. Well, this is sad because the, the conspiracy theories should be creative and inventive and we see that it's all, uh, it's all about the same in Czech Republic, in Poland, in Ukraine. Well, I would, I would have expected something more tricky and more uh, creative from them but l let us see let me ask Ivona. Maybe, maybe they are just maybe they are just uh, just um, uh, tired and of, yeah. they, they're just spreading the same thing too uh, let me let me ask Ivona. i would I'll ask the particularly uh, poland focused question uh, you know Ukrainian situation, there is lots of debate about public television, public service broadcasting. But when we look at Poland, we, uh, we have seen that under peace government, the, uh, uh, the law and justice party, uh, there were attempts to basically hijack the public uh, uh, service broadcaster. Uh, what's happening now with public service broadcast and how it reacted to this COVID crisis? Do you, do you think it's fulfilled its, its job to inform people and to provide uh, true information? Uh, well, as I told you in Poland, the problem is that everybody watches their own media. So, um, unfortunately, I do not watch a lot of um, public TV anymore. And it's not that I uh, don't want to understand, but it really is unwatchable. Um, so you can watch it once in a while to understand, to see the other side. But um, of course, there are people who do watch it on a regular basis because they research, but it's, it's psychologically draining. It, it really is difficult to watch it. So you said there have been attempts. Um, it's not the word attempts. They have been hijacked. This is... Um, this is a dire situation, what is happening in public media in Poland. Mm, to the point that we cannot call it public media, we have to call it state-controlled media. And this is true right now for, absolutely true for TV, and it's unfortunately becoming true for the radio, which used to be the last bastion of sort of semi-free speech um, in public media. Mm, how they responded initially, well, maybe it is a blessing for Poland that we have the right when government who believes in COVID, uh, because uh, I was actually talking to my husband that if this government, people who are right now in power were in the opposition, I think the amount of conspiracy theories and questioning of COVID would be much greater because they will be questioning what the government would be doing. But uh, they actually adopted a reasonable uh, stance on COVID, uh, rather science-based. So. In the beginning, as I said, the, the public media just informed the citizens on the, with a the clear pro-government um, stance, showing how great the government is doing, managing the, especially in Poland, we were worried if our hospitals will manage, you know, Italy was, uh, we were seeing pictures from Italy, so we were worried if Italy didn't manage, how would we? Um, we don't have such a good health sector, or at least the GDP. Uh, so, uh, here the government was reassuring and they, they actually were effective in the beginning, um, I must say. Um, as I said, till today they do um, uh, believe in COVID and they promote this message also through their media outlets, but slowly they allow these conspiracy theorists uh, come and join their programs and um, I've seen one of those when a guy as, and I was que uh, quoting a questionable American doctor and uh, uh, the journalist did not confront him on that, actually kind of welcomed the, the new theory. And uh, so, um, but this is still a marginal trend, yet um, uh, we've started noticing it. Thank you, Ivona. Let me now turn to both Maria and Camille and ask also the question about public broadcaster because you both represent public radios in your countries. Uh, we see the negative example of Poland, maybe negative example of some other Central European countries, but what's about France and Sweden? Do you think that uh, the COVID proved that public media is really a must in countries uh, during the crisis? Maria, what do you think? 
course, I think uh, it is a must uh, during the crisis, but uh, unfortunately we have had uh, quite a lot of uh, attacks on uh, public service media from uh, some spheres uh, within some politicians uh, on the well uh, right side and far right side. They, they try to, they see uh, Hungary as a good example of how it should be for public uh, media. So um, we are more under attack than before, but still there is every year done this um, uh, survey of trust. And uh, I think Swedish radio and IKEA is uh, still on the top of the people's trust, the, the institutions that they trust the most. So we are still there. It's very good news, at least in some countries, public media are still trusted by many people. Camille, what, what do you think about Radio France and all this, you know, uh, sector, maybe uh, some channels like uh, France 24, your Radio France Culture, uh, did they prove that they are really needed during the times of crisis? Yeah, I think that one thing that is important to, to align uh, a positive thing that uh, all this, and not on media, but in health and, and everything, it really showed that the public services were so important in terms of, of in, in moments of crisis and emergency, but yeah, and that we have to think about this because uh, when, when the crisis ends, we have to remember that uh, this to anyone criticizing uh, the public services, including the government, who is cutting uh, over and up in budgets, public budgets. So it, we had, as public uh, workers in this media public services, this hope that this would very clearly to all the people uh, denouncing the uninfection. Uh, that were denouncing um, the fact that it was too cost to 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 services. I'm afraid, uh, after all, now that is less emergency situation. I would say um, that we are going back to normal, and normal is criticizing the public uh, public service. So so didn't really learn uh, learn this uh, from this lesson. The, the, the really top of the of the, the crisis, and so. In this moment, people, and uh, as I say, that it was really important to uh, public information uh, um, media uh, because uh, we can reach any part of the territory and any people. And even if everything closed down, have a this pretty that makes that we will always be assured to keep and keep broadcasting, even if there is a nuclear problem uh, in the country, so that's something very strong in, in, in moments of emergency, the public service is really needed and, and uh, important. But uh, the, the opposite of this, the negative part is that, as, as uh, one of our said, uh, we have to take care of the uh, difference between public service media and state and in this period when we are needed for a political uh, mission that's uh, to relay the information of the government and the action of the government and the protocols that are government, uh, we tend to become a control media, which uh, has a mission to, to relay this information with no call distance. And that is very, very, very dangerous, I would say, because if we lose our editorial independence, which we have, I have to say, in, in the uh, we will become less trusted. Uh, and we will give uh, all the, the space uh, for you know bad information, uh, disinformation. Uh, uh, it's linked to your previous question of trust. I would because when uh, as, as we think and we that the government and, and uh, Emmanuel Macron are trying to make uh, public media become big. Controlled state control, yeah, with a with a really a, a mission to to contents that are controlled by media, by the by the governments. I think we we will lose a lot uh, if we don't take uh, pay attention to this. 
Thank you, Camille. Uh, and we have only 10 minutes left, but I would like to ask a very important question, economical question. We started discussing it with Adela, and I think uh, everybody understands that economic crisis is something that is, uh, it is a big problem for everybody, for Ukraine, for France, for Poland, for Czech Republic, but it hits especially the media sector, the independent media, because advertising revenues are going down, because uh, state, which so supports some of the media, for example, public broadcasters, reallocates, uh, reallocates the uh, funds anywhere, elsewhere. Uh, are there any examples in your countries? Let me start with Adela, in, for example, in the print media sector of Czech Republic or online media sector, where the journalists are showing, the media are showing uh, other ways of fundraising, where they are trying to uh, earn money, where they are trying to get money, to get financing. Are there any creative approaches to this uh, economic crisis that we are facing? Adela? Um, yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, obviously, uh, the, the, the easiest and the most obvious way to gather money um, in the time of crisis is crowdfunding. And I would say it worked uh, very well, again, um, with what I said at the very beginning, that when you, when you are the media outlet that has some kind of story and um, uh, the the readers or the or, or listeners or viewers uh, identify themselves with you. Um, it brings um, it brings an advantage. It happened to us. It happened to other media outlet. Um, um, let me give you these two examples. We asked because we wanted to start within the crisis. We we, we got really scared. I have to say because as I said, we are a small small media outlet and. Um, it could have been existential for us, so we decided to start a new product, um, a series of online um, um, uh, interviews and, 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 and podcasts and whatever. Uh, and we wanted to, to, uh, to gather some, some money for it, uh, to raise some money for it. So we had a crowdfunding campaign and we asked for, if I remember it well, uh, 350,000 crowns, which is something like 13,000 euros. And um, it was running for a month. And we raised uh, 1 million and 350,000 crowns, which is, which is um, 51,000 euros. So it was very, very successful. And we immediately started the series of the, the product we wanted to have. We immediately started it. Then there was a, we have an online TV channel also focused on interviews and it's run by, um, it's a different publishing house and it's run by very, two, two uh, quite popular moderators who left years ago, they left the Czech TV, the public broadcaster, and they founded this. It was back then quite a pioneering project, it wasn't anything like this wasn't really happening or, or, or working and they started that's a daily interview um, uh, actual uh, up-to-date interview they are both very um, experienced people so they started years ago and now obviously they were scared as well that what would happen to them and they asked for 750,000 crowns um, more than us and uh, they uh, they raised um, 10 million so um, again, that was the crowdfunding was probably the, 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 the most used um, uh, thing, and everybody started to think about new ways to reach their their um, readers or viewers or listeners and, and new products, new media products. I think so far it has been relatively successful. Thank you, Adela. Uh, this is wow. I would say wow when I see those figures, when I hear those figures the uh, the bet and then the actual result. Let me ask Ivona, are there any kind of successful stories in Poland from independent media of crowdfunding or some other types to raise money? Well, the, um, yes, uh, we had similar gestures of solidarity in the beginning, um, so crowdfunding campaigns worked uh, well. Um, or, for example, just letters from, um, I received, for example, a letter from a, a journal that uh, was in a difficult situation. But keep in mind that, for example, the liberal and the left-wing media is uh, relying on, uh, does not rely on um, state funding in this country. So they already had experience with um, gathering money in alternative ways, but uh, 
uh, definitely uh, acts of solidarity were uh, increased, um, were higher in, um, in numbers in the early stage of the pandemic. In the beginning, we worried the most about uh, freelance journalists um, with, who are in big numbers uh, in Poland, unfortunately also working for big uh, media outlets uh, like Gazeta Wyborcza, which is our main liberal um, uh, newspaper. But uh, here I have to say that the government actually did the good job and overall, as critical as I am of the government, uh, the economic assistance is okay. So the freelancers receive the um, equivalent of, uh, mm, I think, average salary or um, maybe a little lower, but um, something quite livable. And uh, small companies like, for example, the foundation that publishes my uh, magazine, we received some release, uh, relief from uh, taxes for three months and uh, some small uh, financial assistance. Um, and here it was regardless of the political views, of course, it was just a formal criteria. You had to file uh, um, an application and present how many people are working in your um, organization. So this was used by many institutions in Poland, in private sector and uh, by nonprofits as well. To the point that um, at a certain point, uh, we were talking about this with colleagues, but I also experienced this uh, from talking to people. Um, there were people who knew more positive, um, uh, had more positive stories of uh, economic assistance from the government than they knew people affected um, by COVID. So that also, you know, had an impact on the perception of the of the pandemic um, here, um, and and the trust in the government. Uh, and this is a reference to the previous question, but. Um, Overall, I, I think um, the media is, is uh, surviving. I mean, uh, for sure, it's not as, a, as a, at the stage that it was before the pandemic, but um, especially the freelance uh, journalists that we were the most about are back to work and uh, in, in greater numbers. Sadly, there were firings in, in big ma uh, newspapers, but, but, um, but this is unavoidable. So like I say, it's not 100% there yet, but, uh, but it's, it didn't prove to be as terrible, as dramatic as a lot of people feared in mid-March. Thank you, Ivona. And very briefly, Maria, what would you say about Sweden? I know you're working for public radio, but maybe you know other stories from private uh, media in Sweden who uh, show their creative approaches to raise money. But we only have one minute for your answer. Well, there were examples of crowdfunding also in Sweden, but uh, again, we are a bit of a luxury because uh, just the other day, the culture minister decided that uh, people like freelance journalists and uh, single entrepreneurs, they will get support. So I think that the situation is uh, not so bad here. Thank you very much, Maria, and thank you all for this uh, wonderful conversation. I hope it enlarges the horizon of uh, Ukrainian journalists and uh, can show, you the show them the example of European media. We see the challenges are pretty much the same. Responses are different because we have different states, we have different societies, but I hope uh, our discussion gave a kind of a perspective and, and uh, horizon view. So we had Maria Persson Lovgren from Swedish Radio, we had Camille Maniach from uh, Radio Culture in France, we had Ivona Reichardt from New Eastern Europe in Poland, and we had Adela Drazanova from Reporter Magazine Czech Republic. My name is Volodymyr Yermonka. This was Donbass Media Forum discussion. This discussion was supported by EU delegation to Ukraine, and follow the program of Donbass Media Forum. Thank you.
Що це таке за брехня швидка? Перша літера F, а остання К. Правильно, фейк. А це проект громадське чеканемо, де ми перевіряємо, як ви відрізняєте факти від фейків. Ви, глядачі, до речі, також граєте з нами. У випуску є питання і для вас. То що, поїхали! Добрий день, маєте хвильку? Ні, перепрошую. Вона так подивилася на мікрофон, таке, типа, ні, не маю. Всі бояться мікрофона, а я не боюсь його. Слухаю вас. Дивіться, в Іспанії посадили літак, тому що український турист відмовився надягати маску. Як вважаєте, це факт чи фейк? Факт. Який турист? Український? Ні, я вважаю, це фейк. Не повністю певний, але я допускаю, що таке можливо. Я думаю, це фейк. Я думаю, що так було, так. Думаю, що, скоріш за все, фейк. Я вважаю, що факт. Це фейк, але краще було б факт. На жаль, це факт, таке справді. Серйозно? Так. Блін. Ви відповіли правильно. Ви можете відповісти на ще чотири таких запитань і виграти приз від нас. Хочете? Давай. Давай, смотри. Добре. Гра така. Я ставлю вам чотири питання. Вам потрібно сказати факт, це чи фейк. Ви можете лише раз користатися правом на помилку. Це означає, що ви даєте неправильну відповідь, але більше помилятися не варто, інакше ви програєте. Окей. Але маленький спойлер. Без призу я вас сьогодні не залишу. Добре. Готові? Так. Добре. Ну давай, як ти, коротше, це не таке. Щоб я щитив інформацію, не знаю її наперед. Погнали. Погнали. Перше питання звучить так. Попри коронавірус, Володимир Зеленський дозволив паломництво хасидів думані. Як вважаєте, це факт чи фейк? Це ж релігійна подія. Пасху в нас відмічали, і, наскільки я знаю, людей, в принципі, пускали в храми, то чому би ні? Там люди з-за кордону мають приїхати. Ну, по-моєму, ситуація поки не дозволяє їх приймати. І, по-моєму, навіть самі ізраїльтяни запрещали приймати хасиди в цей період. Це їх місто, де вони поклоняються своєму пророку. Ну, вони знайшли якось шлях, як сюди приїхати. Ви слідкуєте взагалі за паломництвом хасидів в Думані? Ні. Маєте чимось керуватися у своєму виборі? Новості читав, просто відео слухав, що цього не було. Отже, це фейк. Так. Фейк. Факт. Факт. Я приймаю вашу відповідь. У вас є право на помилку. Точніше, воно у вас, на жаль, було. Було? Це фейк. Це фейк? Не дозволяли ще. Не було такого дозволу. Ви відповіли неправильно, але я нагадаю, що ви скористались право на помилку, і ми рухаємося далі. Так. Це гаразд. Друге питання таке. Науковці перейменували 27 людських генів, тому що в Екселі їхні назви помилково переводилися в дати. Це факт чи фейк? 27 людських генів? Я щось чула про це. Ще якісь меми були з цього приводу. Я вже не пам'ятаю, які, але були. Ви Екселем користуєтеся? Ні. Так. В нього є така особливість, що він любить переводити щось у якийсь інший формат? Ну, може, можна перевести. Там числа, дати, цифри, можливо, звісно. Я просто не розумію, як можна взагалі перейменувати гени на світовому рівні. Ви генетикою не цікавитесь? Я біохакінгом цікавитись більше, ніж генетикою. Скажу так, інтуїція моя говорить про те, що це правда. І так, це факт. Я думаю, що вони їх не перейменували. Пусть буде фейк. Окей. І так, відповідь. На жаль, це неправильна відповідь. Ви відповіли неправильно. Справді було таке, що переводилося назви 27 людських генів у дати. Це в англійській версії Excel, звісно. І оскільки Excel сам змінювати нічого не може, то довелося знакомця переміновувати гени, аби не було помилок в обрахунках. Ось так. Ну, тоді інтуїція мене підвела. На жаль. Мені дуже шкода. Ви, на жаль, відповіли неправильно. Ми не залишаємо вас без подарунка і даруємо ось це. Книжечка від нашої бібліотеки. Дякую. Подивіться на це зображення. Ми стверджуємо, що на ньому зображені зйомки логотипа компанії Metro Goldwyn Mayer. Факт це чи фейк? Свої відповіді пишіть у коментарях. І якщо вважаєте, що це фейк, поясніть, що ж це, на вашу думку, є насправді. Ті, хто дадуть правильну відповідь першим із усіх, отримають у подарунок ось таку футболку. І ми на переможці ми голосимо в наступному випуску «Чеканемо». Третє питання таке. Вакцина від коронавірусу буде неефективною, оскільки він мутує. Це факт чи фейк? Буде ефективною. Якщо в це вкладають гроші, то значить вони працюють. Ні, вакцина буде ефективна, тільки питання, на яку версію коронавірусу, тому що їх кілька вже. Перша версія, 
і обновлене. І вторая версія. В принципі, да, віруси мутують, але мені здається, що вакцина саме від коронавірусу буде ефективна. Якщо ти захворів коронавірусом, а потім вилікувався, то антитіла не захищають тебе після двох чи трьох тижнів після того, як ти вилікувався. Я просто переболів коронавірусом, я знаю про цю, Нічого собі. про цю історію більше, ніж ви можете себе представити. А вже є вакцина від коронавірусу? Ну, пишуть, що є. Ага. От Росія, вроде би, там ага. то полуфейковий запустила. Остаточна відповідь – це? Факт. Пусть буде фейк. Фейк. Ви вже, на жаль, скористалися правом на помилку, да. тому помилятися вам вже не можна. І ви не помилилися, справді це фейк. Замечательно. Він мутує коронавірус справді, але вважають науковці, які ще поки розробляють вакцину, бо немає ще точно готової вакцини, що це не вплине на ефективність. Угу. Тому ви відповіли неправильно. неправильно. Але я нагадаю, що ви скористались правом на помилку. Тому ми рухаємося далі. Договорили. Так, ми дійшли до останнього питання. І, можливо, вам тут знову допоможуть меми з інстаграму. Угу. Готові? Так. Да. Майк Тайсон поплавав за кулами в океані і одну з них знерухомив. Це факт чи фейк? От це слово «знерухомив» — це значить «остановив» — «обіздвіжив» — «обіздвіжив» — так. Якщо ти рятуєшся від акулу, треба бити саме в очі, тому що на декілька секунд можна її збити з пантелику, і вона може там, відкинутися на пару секунд. Предположимо, він її вдарив. Він молодець, він красавчик, він змог це зробити. А ви взагалі вірите, що Майк Тайсон вирішив би поплавати за кулами? Навіщо йому це от? Ну, для якихось відеосйомок, можливо. Вони ж не всі опасні і, можливо, яким-то воздействием мог її встановити. Окей, ось точно відповідь це? Так, да, це правда. Пусть буде факт. Факт. На жаль, ви помилилися. Не ударом, він полоскотав її за ніг. Фізіологічна реакція кули, вона заціпаніла, знерухоміла. А зробив він це, не обираючи сміливість, і перед своїм прийдешнім матчем, здається, з Рой Джонсом молодшим. Ось так. No. Це правильна відповідь, це факт. Я вас вітаю. Ви виграєте Клас. в нашій вікторині. Єс! Yes! Я побідів! Побідітель, ти бачиш? Але ж ви ж не просто виграли, але отримаєте ось такий подарунок від нас. Дуже дякую. Давай дивимося. Це, мабуть, чудо-футболка чи чудо-сумка. Футболка. Так. Дякую большое. І вам теж дуже дякую за участь. А ось і переможці нашого конкурсу у соцмережах, який ми оголосили в попередньому випуску. Вітаю! Ви першими дали правильну відповідь на наше запитання. Аби отримати свої подарунки, напишіть нам на адресу, вказану в описі під цим відео. Це був проект Чеканемо, де ми перевіряли, як ви відрізняєте факти від фейків. Підписуйтесь на наш канал і вмикайте критичне мислення. Ключовим видом вооруження в этой войне является информация. Украина програла інформаційну війну. Якщо ми маємо 2, 3, 4 українських канали, які розказують, що в державі все погано, бо, ну то і, і маємо той ефект, який маємо. Воно зворотній ефект має, коли поділяють людей деякі на деяких каналах з огляду на редакційну політику, наявну або ненаявну. Патріоти, не патріоти. Наші, не наші. Одне діло, коли ми зробимо доступ, а друге, а що ж там будуть показувати? Смотрим российские новости. Думаю, Украину не пропустят. Ну, до всех событий, разумеется, я российское телевидение практически совсем не смотрела. Я смотрела украинское телевидение. Я могу разговаривать с телевизором, могу ругаться с ним. Но это даже для меня интересно. Я просто это как, ну, знаете, для веселья делаю.
понятно, что и снимаю какой-то стресс. Путина клонировать надо, на ток-шоу говорят. 84 Путина. На каждый федеральный округ по одного Путина. А подскажите, пожалуйста, я просто еще не вижу, а место ваше сейчас есть? Ну, какая-то местная газета. У нас газета. газета. Вы имеете в виду почитать просто новости? Так, про место там, что-то, про область. Нету такой газеты. Закрылась. Полгода назад закрылась. Ирта еще есть у нас uh -huh. канал. Это областной канал. Он к нам переехал в Луганск. Мы показываем то, что происходит в регионах без привязки до политических сил и не заангажован. И вот в этом, мне кажется, наша главная ценность. Нацполиция просит посилити відповідальність за сексуальні злочини проти дітей і прийняти закон 6607. Можна цю тему на тлі того, що на тому на тлі того, що ну в Маріуполі ж там педофіла затримали от нещодавно. Да. Ну, мабуть, про нацполіцію. Ну, я погоджуюся, мені теж здається, що ця тема вона буде вона буде актуальна. Якщо ми говоримо про те, що дивляться люди російський контент, російське телебачення, я думаю, що це питання цивілізаційного вибору. Сейчас в основном показывает только российское телевидение и ЛНР. Украинских очень мало там каналов, там нечего и смотреть. Мы же это, устраивали митинги даже, чтобы нам здесь украинское телевидение делало в 2014-2015 году. Они обещали нам там антенну, но оно так до сих пор практически ну, результатов таких ощутимых нет. Вы какие смотрите каналы? Ну, украинские я смотрю 1 плюс 1. Так. И СТВ. Недоволен этими каналами. Брехня Нет. вся. А российские? Российские тоже брешут. Россия, Россия 1 и 24 смотрю. А НТВ тоже смотрю. НТВ да? смотрю. У вас и российские, и, и Все, да, украинские в каналы. Российские. В основном ни одного. Все, что они показывают, в принципе, что здесь у нас гражданская война, что у российских войск нету. Вы в это верите? Как вам сказать, верю, не верю. Вы знаете, здесь российских войск нет. Не, ну здесь-то понятно, здесь украинские войска. Я имею в виду Луганские. Луганские. Э... Я все-таки чувствую так сердцем, что Россия, Владимир Владимирович, помогает Луганску. Уже давно бы они загнулись без помощи России. Російська пропаганда, вона досить потужна, власне, це через те, що вони грають на емоціях людей і на якихось страхах. Будучи під впливом стереотипів, людина втрачає навички критичного мислення. Якщо ми говоримо про боротьбу так, з пропагандою, я б сказав, що людина, яка хоче бути обманута, вона в будь-якому випадку буде обманута. Ну, про якусь велику місію я б не говорив, я просто намагаюся якісно зробити свою роботу і просто дати глядачам об'єктивну інформацію. У Маріуполі. У Маріуполі поліцейські затримали підозрюваного у вчиненні розпусних дій відносно дитини. У Маріуполі поліцейські затримали... Доброго вечора, шановні телеглядачі та слухачі українського радіопульс. Мене звуть Максим Бондарів, це передача «Тема дня». Ідея в тому, що ти, власне, можеш створити щось своє, унікальне тут. Тому я живу і працюю тут. Многие разочаровались. Ну, смотрите, а СМИ наши, кому они принадлежат, основная масса? Олигархам. А, соответственно, они говорят то, что им тоже положено говорить. А журналист, как я понимаю, он должен говорить факты, а не должен э, в какую-то сторону двигаться. Говорят факты, а люди сами должны делать выводы. Ну, или я не права? По-моему, так.
Отже, вітаю усіх, вітаю всіх, хто нас дивиться і слухає. А сьогодні... Good afternoon, everyone. Today we will talk about disinformation. My name is Lyubov Cebulska. I'm a researcher of disinformation and I've been working with it for many years in a row. Today I will talk to the best experts in this topic. Our experts include Dmitro Dubov, expert in resilient Ukraine and specialist in the National Institute for Strategic Studies. We will also be joined online by Vitaly Rybak, analyst and Geointer News Ukraine. Uh, we also have Dmitry Teperik, program director, resident Ukraine. And uh, we will be joined by Robert van den Norda, journalist, a co-author of the study of Russia's troll factory. We often say in communications uh, that uh, the most important is to tell a story. You shall not uh, go into details, so the most important is to have a comprehensive story. And this is exactly what Russia does. It tells stories about Ukraine internally and externally. A key instrument of storytelling is a narrative, and today we will discuss it. We have seven from seven to ten minutes for opening remarks and then we will proceed to a Q&A session. So, Dmitro, let's start with you. Can you please paint a big picture on the narratives and why are they efficient? Okay, just stop me if I uh, speak for more than ten minutes because it's an exciting topic for me. Uh, well, uh, this is a very exciting, but un and unfortunately, very uh, relevant problem, disinformation. We've been uh, discussing these narratives for many years in a row, but even I, s I see that for many people, uh, this concept is more scientific than practical. Well, but it's actually a very practical problem. Those narratives define our outlook on the world. Uh, they show us who is our friend, who is our enemy, how shall we treat some events or conditions in life. Uh, this is what forms our outlook in the world. Uh, this is about uh, religion, ideology. Usually uh, these are stories which are comprehensive, uh, which paint uh, a picture of the world for a person. Of course, uh, there, are, uh, there are general topics of narratives and uh, they are divided into smaller messages. When we are talking about uh, uh, the fight of the narratives, we must say that uh, this is some kind of uh, fight for reality in which we live, because of these narratives influence our way outlook on this reality. Uh, most often, disinformation are spread uh, uh, by these narratives, as well as on the, on the level of messages. Uh, this is the level that uh, the spread of disinformation is based at. Uh, the Russian Federation knows how to do it, it loves to do it, because they understand how to do it. They have resources and they have st skills and a huge experience where everyone is involved, starting from state structures and ending with different celebrities or opinion leaders. This is what's called active measures uh, back in Soviet times. So these are operations which are aimed at uh, other countries. Uh, the Russian Federation actively uses modern technologies, trends, uh, some techno technological te trends. Uh, for, for example, uh, three or five years ago, we were discussing the problem of uh, so-called uh, uh, bin websites, where there are a lot of uh, fake information. Uh, these websites are now more toxic than ever. And now we have a new trend, uh, Telegram channels or Viber channels, uh, groups in uh, Vibers, 
and we see uh, how it can be used. For example, like it happened when people from China got back to Sanjari and they were attacked by the local citizens. It was caused by uh, fake information, fake disinformation spread in these groups. For me personal, the story with Telegram channels and the story with narratives is related to one more problem, a macro problem, I would say. Uh, we lose uh, the uh, the value of uh, of truth because everyone wants entertainment these days. People sometimes understand uh, that what they read uh, are fakes and disinformation, but it seems like uh, they don't care because they want to be entertained. And this is a question uh, related to media literacy and education. What is media literacy? We provide people with skills and knowledge and then people need to actually use them because if they don't want what can we do we need to understand how to overcome this negative trend we must make people to have the skills and to use them in real life but another part of this problem is uh, uh, the loss of interest in information loss of interest in long reads five years ago we were told that five minute videos in YouTube. Well, these are very short news. And now we are talking about the generation of TikTok and we understand that even 15 seconds uh, is enough to spread a fake. Because yes, of course, fakes can spread even on TikTok. And it's very difficult to refute those fakes. As for the narratives about Ukraine, which are spread right now, I would say that they haven't changed since 2014. Narratives, the power of narratives is that they are resilient. They rarely change. Some topics might change, some messages might change, but narratives, no. Uh, we are now see uh, those narratives which worked against Yushchenko, against Poroshenko, they now work against Zelensky. For example, if we are talking about a popular topic of total, uh, uh, total uh, spread of agents of Kremlin, they say there are a lot of agents uh, of Kremlin uh, uh, in uh, the parliament of Ukraine. Uh, this narrative is about uh, the failure of Ukraine to build its own state. Uh, this is a story about fascism, uh, uh, rewarding Ukraine. This is a stable topic uh, which never goes away. Uh, there are a lot of petitions being registered starting uh, from 2019 about uh, those uh, 5G, about uh, biological labs in the US. Uh, this is a general narrative that uh, the US are enemies uh, of Ukraine. There are a lot of stories which are spread by the Orthodox Church about, about refusal to uh, vaccinate children or to about uh, those chips. So there are a lot of narratives uh, which tell Ukrainians kind of get back to their roots. These narratives don't change often. Some of these narratives are actually migrating. They migrate not only externally, but also inside the country. Uh, now it seems uh, like uh, some part of these narratives have moved uh, to Belarus. Uh, Ukrainians are blamed uh, for uh, making chaos in Belarus. Uh, Ukrainian activists actually uh, are blamed for taking part in the revolution in um, Belarus. Again, there is this topic with uh, fascism, which raises its head all over the post-Soviet uh, territory. This is what the Russian Federation wants uh, to us to believe, that there are enemies everywhere. So we continue finding the same narratives which we have been fighting before. The topics change, but what is of particular concern to me is that other politicians are very polarized. And very often uh, they take part in spreading those narratives, even without understanding that the power of narrative is the power of a story. Well, 
Uh, thanks a lot. I would like to add that our group has carried out a research uh, where we started uh, all uh, news programs at uh, three Russian TV channels. It turned out that one third of all the Russian news are actually news about Ukraine. So we can add that the power of the narrative is that it is repeated and that it dominates, this information dominates in the information sphere. And now I would like to ask Dmitry Tiperik, uh, who joined us on Zoom. Dmitry, can you hear us? Happy to see you, hello. Okay, so we are talking about narratives. I know that you have a lot to say, everyone has a lot to say about this, but now let's discuss uh, the topic of the audience. What kind of audience is the most vulnerable to these narratives? Which parts of the population are uh, the most vulnerable? And what is the secret behind the efficiency of these narratives? Thanks so much, Lubov, for the opportunity to talk. I'm very happy uh, to be here today, and I'm grateful to the organizers for providing this platform for discussion. And of course, I'm grateful to our research team. Last year, we carried out uh, a research within the Resilient Ukraine program, where we focused our attention on different vulnerabilities of uh, the eastern and southern Ukraine in communication and cybersecurity. And today I will tell you briefly about uh, those vulnerable groups which uh, we managed to identify. First of all, I would like to highlight uh, the, uh, the concept of cognitive resilience. Because when we are talking about the resilience in general of our cognitive sphere, we need to understand that a lot of people are talking about this resilience, but uh, no one measures it. Of course, it is a comprehensive pro process, it's very difficult. We can think of different measures, to uh, ways of to measure this resilience. Uh, we can use different parameters of uh, vulnerability of the current problems, but first we need to know what these problems are. We can also set parameters which will help us define our strengths and our achievements. As for the concrete groups, uh, I will tell you about them, but we need to understand that representatives of those groups can be targets for attacks uh, by the, uh, by the for foreign agents they might be targets of disinformation campaigns, but also these groups might be the source of those topics which will help further polarize society. So if you speak about certain groups, we have to understand that everything that is connected with the war of Russia against Ukraine, so those people who are involved into this war, of course, the military today, today military and veterans, and a separate category to veterans who were wounded, the disabled people and their families. So all the social group is vulnerable in the invasion, information and communication dimension. Another group is volunteers who were involved since uh, 2014 helping the armed forces of Ukraine against Russia to, to uh, and this social group is also vulnerable because on the one side there are many emotional disappointments among them and expectations from the authorities and uh, the entire society of Ukraine. A separate vulnerable group consists of different religious societies. I'm not going to mention different confessions, but religious communities. And uh, they might be the object of manipulation. 
targeted attacks and they can be the source another group are the forced IDPs I think that to all of us to all, all of us in Ukraine know about this topic and not from the very positive point of view so I shall not dwell on it separately of course it's a very vulnerable group of people another group that has a lot to do with today's events are journalists so journalists and those who are connected with media industry in Ukraine and they can be both the targets of manipulation and attacks and they can create by their bad quality work news or they can facilitate some migrating narratives and also facilitate the spread of mimicry narrative so we're speaking about some you know strange narrative enter into our cognitive space pretending to be something that belongs to us that's why the journalists ought to pay attention to it especially those journalists who have financial interest or very low standards of their work another vulnerable group are ideologically charged youth and we're not going to divide them into right or left and so on but all uh, polar all ideologies polarizing the society uh, are a very vulnerable group and the last I'm not going to say that this list is exhaust that th this this is the list but another group is the corrupted officials of the you know you can speak a lot about corruption in Ukraine but these people of the you know middle level who do not make very important decisions but nevertheless some decisions they are the objects of those manipulations and uh, I would like to mention briefly about the topics that can be connected with these groups with these vulnerable groups so the topic that touches the questions of possible reintegration and reconciliation is the topic that is being observed already and a lot more will be happening lots of information you know manipulations and disinformation companies by Kremlin and local uh, agents of influence and we are to say that this topic is also connected uh, with the electoral processes is the language topic and it's the topic of the historical memories that's in brief and clearly that not only Kremlin and uh, its agents of influence can speak about this or uh, to push the disinformation campaigns on its topics but they are also uh, and also the internal activists have a certain impact on it and can bear even bigger danger because they they promote these mimicry narratives all of it is possible thanks to the fact that us as consumers of information and producers of information we have a number of cognitive distortions or traps of thinking and of course scientists are researching this area of these cognitive distortions there are more than 150 of them described it's worth understanding that in different situations the different uh, 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 some of them are used against our resilience I will tell you about five of them we have detected on the surface so the first and it's uh, those who do analysis of communication information safe to know about this that gaps in information uh, we people always fill in with stereotypes generalizations that's why you should never leave the information vacuum even if especially during the crisis because people it's uh, because the our psychology will uh, bring up the very first information we once heard and 
if you speak about the historical memory, we, that's a second cognitive distortion, that memories, they are always edited. So our memory is very picky. Everything that is connected with positive or negative, uh, I would like to add here, I would like to add, you're saying, uh, you're mentioning the memory, and we all see to which extent Kremlin is actively working with historic narrative. In Russia, new TV channels are opened that have, uh, that are only explain or interpret history for the Russian population. And this reminds me psychologists who were studying narratives, Brockmayer and Rom Khaira, who said that narrative is not the description of the reality, it's the instruction to understanding of the reality. And this is what they are doing with the history. So they are explaining the way we ought to understand what happened and what, what took place and what is happening now. Wonderful description, Lubov. What's especially what's happening this year since there are, uh, you know, the the anniversaries uh, since the Second World War and what the Kremlin does does the you know instructions on the historic memory they're trying to do the to of course uh, interpret all the historical discourse and all the countries who were and are the victims of that process are to have the coordinated position to counteract I will describe in brief why exactly this editing retrospective edit to edit addition of uh, uh, the memory is necessary because people are psychologically creating the illusion of understanding of the past and that illusion is actually creating the future the idea of the future we always get into that trap we think that if we understand the past then we can somehow predict the future thank you thank you it's just that we are pressed for time so we're uh, one more minute and then we'll have to move on because we have lots of questions from our audience i would like to ask including it to you as well yes uh, well actually i think i'm uh, i have finished but my last remark would be that those distortions that we can realize and communicate them to the media consumer and those decision makers can decrease the risk because uh, first of all those decisions that would be made would be wrong and they can also decrease the risks with the social behavior and what i mean is the electoral process how people who people are voting for and the behavior that is connected with the crisis and pandemics here that started since spring and is still going on the observations uh, uh, observing these vulnerable groups and what decisions they're making how they behave becomes a very valuable experience thank you thank you for such a, a wide analysis thorough analysis then i would like to ask my question to robert i don't know whether or not robert can hear me perhaps i'll switch to english and we'll ask a question in english robert yeah, yeah, you fine of course hi hi thank you for joining us uh so we are talking about narratives here and i know that you've been analyzing um coordinating the uh, coordinated disinformation uh on social media and namely uh, uh, activities of bots and trolls do you see some dominating narratives on Ukraine now there? And do you see some changes or evolutions uh, in, uh, in these narratives? And generally, do you, see, do you think that these accounts, trolls and bots accounts, they're changing uh, and changing their operation after uh, some big companies like Facebook or Twitter started fighting with them? Um, yeah, thank you. Yes, you can see. Um, well, of course, there are new topics which which arise. So, for instance, uh, 
with Belarus, we can see that, uh, and that was that was expected. Actually, you can actually predict if you if you know what you what, what is going on, then you can predict the uh, the narratives. So for Belarus, uh, I was sure that the, uh, the one of the narratives that would be pushed quite quickly uh, would be uh, that uh, foreign countries are meddling in uh, in Belarus. And funny enough, in this case, uh, Ukraine was mentioned. Uh, if you look at social media, so I started analyzing tweets. But it's, uh, it's not just um, Ukraine. Also, the Netherlands was specifically uh, uh, mentioned here. Um, but if you look at the, uh, especially, uh, well, we're all interested in, in, in Ukraine, of, of course, then uh, basically, yeah, most a lot of the narratives remain the same. So uh, blaming uh, Ukraine that they're all far, far right. Uh, of course, it's very handy uh, to always blame it on this uh, as, as all Battalion, uh, it switches from Poroshenko propaganda now to Zelensky uh, uh, propaganda. Uh, the war in eastern Ukraine, of course, we speak, we keep seeing that uh, it's, it's always Ukraine who supposedly violates the ceasefire, uh, but there is more evidence that it's all that it's almost always Russia, um, and I'm deliberately saying Russia because I think there's enough evidence that we cannot call this some sort of local war. Uh, so yeah, if you if, if you know what what is what is going on, then uh, you you can predict the, the the narratives. Another interesting example is uh, is Navalny, the poisoning now, uh, which immediately became apparent that they're not willing to admit anything, uh, but, which is very difficult, uh, because I mean, uh, Navalny uh, flew to uh, Germany. There they analyzed uh, uh, that it's uh, Novichok, so it's very difficult to uh, say that it's something else. And then all these crazy narratives that he was poisoned after he was transported to uh, to Germany. Yeah, that's almost uh, uh, funny uh, in 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 a way. But, but the whole case with Navalny, it very much reminds us the case with uh, Skripal, right? It's yes, not just yeah, about it's... poisoning; it's about the general, generally the way how it uh, was done, and uh, their reaction is the same. Yes, yeah, denial. That, that, uh, whether it's Litvinenko or or Vladimir Karamurza or or Skripal, it's it's always a lot of denials, et, et, et cetera. But if we add it to a big list of um, anti-Kremlin people, whether these are journalists or politicians or or opposition, whatever, yeah, it, it's growing and growing and growing, and nobody seems well. Everybody's shocked, et cetera. But that that's that's it. Uh, I mean, no real action is, uh, is, is is taken. So even if you poison, if Russia poisons someone abroad, then uh, they get away with it. Uh, time after time after time, that you can shoot down uh, MH17 and well, the court case. I think that will uh, end really good. So far, it's it's, it's going really well. But uh, yeah, the, the, all of these narratives are the same, or just an, a, a, re a repetition of the same narratives, but different case. Um, but what I really like, the former speaker, um, who is susceptible to this uh, propaganda and uh, spent years studying which people uh, are like uh, vulnerable to this. And in, in the Netherlands, it's uh, you know, the, like the, 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 the sort of 20, 30 percent. And a lot of these people uh, are associated either to, to like far, far right. Uh, or they're very susceptible to, to hoaxes. Uh, that also goes with the research showed that it's also uh, uh, applies to uh, religious, uh, very conservative uh, type of, uh, of people. And this is very handy uh, for, for, for Kremlin because there will, and it's probably a bit different depending on, uh, on, on, on the country, but in the Netherlands, there is definitely about 20% or so uh, vulnerable to this propaganda. Uh, the percentage will vary uh, per per country, um, but it but it's there, and uh, I think that's enough uh, for for Kremlin that there is this always a base layer of, uh, of of people within a certain country um, that that's yeah they will uh, trust this kind of propaganda. And have you noticed any positive any examples of? positive narratives, counter-narratives on what Kremlin says? Yeah, no, I think with, I think with MH17, there have been with, with, uh, with uh, companies like, like Bellingcat and uh, 
uh, main stream media, New York Times, etc. I, th I think that uh, a, lo a lot of these MH17 uh, narratives are, are countered. I wouldn't. The thing is, we always tend to uh, to, to think of it in a negative uh, way. But I think with all, all the the great work from from this from from Bellingcat and mainstream uh, media organizations, I think uh, most of the MH17 uh, propaganda was successfully countered. That doesn't mean. You may never reach this. I don't know. Per, that depends on the country. This 10, 20 percent of this uh, of these people who are vulnerable to these types of hoaxes, and these people may also be, I don't know, believe in anti-fox kinds of crazy uh, theory. So we, it, but it, so it, it it pays off more. I think that's often for, forgotten. I think we should focus more on uh, on on, uh, on this. Uh, that it's, it's also quite successfully count countered. Thank you. It would have been. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, thank you. Thank you so much. Let's continue. I would like to ask Vitali. So, we analyzed a couple of narratives. We understand that there are a lot of stories which have been spreading for many years in a row, internally and externally. Uh, for example, that Ukraine is a failed state. It's uh, one of the grand narratives. We know that there are some key players in the media market of Ukraine uh, that use this uh, propaganda. So it seems that they are allies of the Kremlin. We are talking about, uh, first and foremost, about TV channels uh, that are owned by Mr. Madvachuk. I know that you are an expert in this topic. Can you please explain us uh, how Mr. Madvachuk uh, helps uh, spread those narratives? Lubov, thank you so much for the question. We are the uh, analytical department of Internews Ukraine. Uh, so a spike in anti-democratic narratives after the elections in 2019. It started after the presidential and doubled after the parliamentary elections, and especially during the pre-election campaign. There were a lot of uh, reasons why it happened because OPFL opposition platform for life received a lot of places in the parliament uh, Shari party also was quite active and uh, servant of the people party also had some groups of influence which belonged to the oligarchs and they disagree in some ways with uh, European and Euro-Atlantic course of uh, Ukrainian development. Starting from 2020, we have been monitoring these narratives in the information sphere in Ukraine. And now I would like to list at least about, to tell you about five most popular narratives which we detected. I have to say that we monitored not only TV channels, but online media. Uh, together with Semantic Forest Agency, uh, we downloaded data and uh, uh, made a, a search using keywords uh, in social networks at about 9,000 of websites and also using such social networks as Facebook, Contact, and so on. It turned out that the first narrative was about George Soros and uh, his so-called uh, servants in Ukraine. So these are actually, uh, we are these people, right? Like Soros minions. And they say that uh, the key task of the Soros minions is to please their owner, George Soros, who is not only one of the key financial figures of the world, but he's like a general image of all the globalists, of all the democratic uh, uh, Democrats of the American establishment whose main aim is just to steal from Ukraine. So this is like a shadow of government of the world. Second narrative is that Ukraine is under foreign uh, pressure. It is ruled from abroad and the only task of it is to get all the natural resources out of Ukraine and get as much money as it's possible from Ukraine. It is interesting that these narratives are aimed at constructing 
a so-called image of an enemy and in the, this case the West is painted as uh, an enemy of Ukrainians so this is actually what the Russian Federation have been doing has been doing for a long time now they paint the picture of the Western state as the enemy well actually they know what they do they unite the population uh, around one leader which helps maintain his ranking uh, in Ukraine, they construct uh, this image of an enemy to consolidate uh, uh, the population around Vladimir Putin. But in Ukraine, we have several figures like that. Uh, Madvachuk and the position platform for life. Uh, then Shari works with another group of people, deputies uh, uh, from the servant of the people. Uh, they work with another group of people. But the key aim of all this work is to change the, the European and Euro-Atlantic integration direction of Ukraine, which was supported by the previous government and parliament of Ukraine. This is what uh, anti-Western players don't like for a number of reasons. If we're talking about Medvedchuk, we understand that uh, he and his political uh, force wants uh, Ukraine to get back uh, to Russia, actually. If we're talking about the servant of the people group of deputies, of MPs and Kolomoisky, they don't really need that. But not all Ukrainian reforms, such as anti-banking law, which was lobbied by the West, are not uh, beneficial to Kolomoisky. This is what is financially bad for Kolomoisky. That is why he wants to paint this picture that it was this reform was done in order to uh, do that for the benefit of Hontareva and uh, Poroshenko. Well, but it, it is obvious that all of these narratives are beneficial to Russia because it actually creates chaos in Ukraine. Any polarization, any political conflict in Ukraine between different political parties or social groups makes a huge contribution and it, it's actually a benefit uh, to Russia because it supports their narrative about Ukraine as a failed state. Uh, this history, this story about uh, foreign uh, governance is actually also, it actually also works for the benefit of Russia. Uh, they want to uh, say that Ukraine is a failed state. Yes, yeah, so these narratives often work with emotions. In this case, everything is the same. It's quite easy to uh, to say that the Western is working against Ukraine, and it's actually quite difficult to refute this information. So these, uh, stereo these narratives work with basic stereotypes and fears of people. Another narrative is that all Ukrainian lands will be sold to foreigners and Ukrainian rural population will be left completely poor and without any resources. This is what people are afraid of. They become really anxious. They, be, they worry. Uh, the, uh, the law on land is very complicated and only experts will be able to understand it completely. Uh, that is why the, uh, there is a lot of space for manipulations. Uh, the same is with memorandums with IMF and with IMF loans. Uh, these documents are very difficult to understand and for many for many months uh, they have been uh, hidden from the public. So when there is no publicly available information, it is very easy to create manipulation, to manipulate public opinion, to say that uh, these loans uh, will completely ruin education and public health of Ukraine. Uh, this is what uh, the Metro said, that uh, a lot of these narratives mention uh, US as the key enemy. So the fifth key narrative is that the US controls media and activists in Ukraine. If you take a look at the Russian reality, this is what they have had for many years. But now we kind of import this narrative. So it's quite easy if something is wrong, something goes wrong in a country, it is easy to blame not uh, corruption, not blocking of reforms and absence of progress in reforms, but it is easy to blame it on some foreign influence, uh, to blame it on the US, for example. 
So in your personal opinion, is it only Russian or pro-Russian narrative, or is that this narrative has already been used by Ukrainian politicians? We have a question. How often uh, narratives of Russian and Ukrainians, Ukrainian pol uh, politicians overlap? Well, we cannot say that uh, Kolomoisky narratives, for example, are pro-Russian. But in this particular case, the interests of Kolomoisky and Russia overlap. So it's like some kind of a situational uh, alliance. I don't think that it is coordinated from a single source. But there are such cases when interests overlap. It is easier to explain a lack of political will uh, to reforms by other factors other than lack of political will. And I would also like to tell you more about uh, spreading all these narratives online. It is important to understand that very often MPs from the opposition platform for life, as well as videos by blogger Shari, messages uh, in Telegram, an anonymous channel, they get a lot of views, uh, shares, likes, and so on and so forth. But we must understand that we cannot fully understand how real is the audience which spreads these fakes and these narratives online. If you take a look at Viktor Madvachuk and his Twitter account, Twitter is not very popular in Ukraine, but it is uh, the most transparent of all social networks to analyze. There are a lot of tools which allow uh, analyzing manipulations in Twitter, such as Social Blade service. Sometimes it uh, allows, find, allows finding interesting things. For example, we used it to see that in July 2018, Twitter account of Viktor Madvachuk uh, lost 75% of its followers. Then just in a month, he lost 311,000 followers. And we understand that it's not a coincidence. It just cannot happen overnight. And then we noticed that in July 2018, Twitter deleted a huge amount of bot bots, including Russian bots, about 70 millions. So if we analyze other accounts, we can see a sharp decrease uh, in the number of followers. Even Twitter account of uh, Vladimir Putin also lost 9,000 voters. So it seems to me that there were a lot of bots involved. Not all, Medvedchuk is not the only one who uses it. Yulia Timoshenko, who now likes telling something anti-Western and blame Ukrainian, Ukrainian politicians uh, on uh, their cooperation with IMF, uh, her Twitter account also lost a lot of followers. So we can analyze those cases when uh, these politicians get a lot of new followers or lose, lose uh, new followers. It is obvious that it's not a natural way to grow your audience. Well, I understand that there might be a viral video, but we need to analyze each case like that to see if there is any manipulation. So we now switch to giving particular names and a lot of questions we have connected with it. People are asking, why are we only speaking about Medvedchuk and Shari? What about other politicians? What about Poroshenko? This is a question from Facebook. Let's speak about elections a bit and about names. We know that elections are coming up and it's clear that lots of candidates are uh, streaming some narratives. Some of them are pro-Russian and let's recollect who exactly does that. For example, Falchevsky, I shall start. Texts org UA publication made a very good analysis and showed how elegant and how exquisite Falchevsky works with Russian narratives. So he's packing them not in straightforward and literal literary messages because it's a bit more complex. He knows that in Ukraine there's support of certain reforms and uh, support of the movement to NATO and to EU. Tell me who else is preparing for elections, appealing to this audience.
those that you already mentioned, uh, the situation with Kiva, who was was running with Nahan first. So half classical father of Mahno, who was trying to play something socialistic. Although for lots of our politicians, the question lies in not fully realized, but it's a situational, you know, union that that you can exploit successfully at this particular moment. Some of the current MPs, some of them use uses this narrative, really believing that they're doing something good. The scariest thing when people are doing everything sincerely. So because these people sincerely think they are doing good business when they disseminate this or that Russian narrative. And I think that in any party, I don't know about the part of European solidarity, but maybe even there you could find persons who, would, who are spreading such narratives. But the Russian narratives, they usually, they often become, you know, uh, something that uh, the argumentation is based on. What they're, but what they're trying to do is to create the feeling of the dead end. You know, in the KGB manuals, very distinctly, it is described how the operations, how to um, execute the operations um, of meddling into the countries. And you know that demoralization like campaign, for example, or operation uh, requires like 15 years. Yes, all the their methods, they didn't change. And Russians have a nice peculiarity. If something works, they don't change it. If it's, if even if this methodology guideline was created in the 1960s or 1970s, then it still, and it, it, it can still work. Uh, in 2015, we prohibited the Russian channels. But when Kiselov was t talking nonsense about some nucle nuclear topics, and this was perceived with a smile, but when it's aired on the Ukrainian channels by Ukrainian experts and Ukrainian presenters, then it seems like an internal discussion, and that's another level of the trust. And somehow we cannot close these channels anymore because they are acting with within the current legislation and it's hard to regulate them. And then again, if we speak about the influence operations concept, and the way these agitation positions are developed in other countries in order to create their own uh, media, it's a classical a tool and this is the methodology that has been validated by Russians for many years, and they know how to do it well. I just remembered the narrative we hear from Russia and China now about coronavirus being invented in the American labs. Russian propaganda says that these labs are in Ukraine, located in Ukraine. And several years ago, Russian propaganda said that in Georgia, there was a famous laboratory uh, lab, Luhar, that were creating bio weapon against Russians. So a bio weapon that was targeted at Russian DNA. There was a fake news like this. But we also remember the story of 1960s, 1970s, about HIV, that uh, HIV was developed in the American lab, and to this way Americans wanted... So yes, it, it's really nice to, you know, feed some uh, news uh, through another third country. Yes, you're right, so the situation has changed, but the big narratives remain. Okay, let's also talk about these channels. What can we do? So we are saying that there are a number of bad narratives which undermine the national security of Ukraine. 
So what can be done? Can we influence anyhow on the level of the state by strategic communication, perhaps, or can we uh, bring back the uh, Minister of Information policy, uh, which is now a part of Minister of Culture? So what can be done? Because we have identified the problem, but we are to offer some solutions. So I have this question to all of you, and including our online participants. Let me start first. It seems personally I do not support big restrictions or limitations, so you shouldn't shut down these channels because we know that our Western partners, um, they are, are very attentive to the freedom of speech and because of that, I think that the Medvedchuk channel and other channels need to, need to they still have to exist. But it's important to tell the population why it is disinformation, why it is false information, how to detect the truth. And I think here the state and the civil society are to work together hand in hand and play a long game and develop media, media literacy in the society and to probably introduce lessons of media literacy into schools and universities. So this is the long game. So these people have to study, remember, grow up and then start voting. So we can lose the country by the time, you know, they grow up. Yes, that's in the long term perspective. But from, for the short term perspective, try, trying to disseminate by other channels the explanation about these narratives and also um, to explain in simple words the reform, the land reform, or like the land market reform, and to explain in plain words that this is not the loss of the land, but it's uh, making it uh, more expensive and the possibility for the peasants themselves to use it and exploit it as much as they can without limits set by the state. So let's also ask this question uh, to those who are online. So Dmitri, what do you think on this account? Uh, thank you. Uh, so I will go back to my remark that you have to know uh, your vulnerabilities in your or vulnerable groups in your society or those gaps which are around information and communication and cyber security the enemy can uh, use against you so awareness about your vulnerabilities about your problems is step number one because even if according to the results of our research the biggest part of ex bigger part of experts in the regional and local level from different spheres even even bigger part of them do not see threats but you know if if in Kiev they will uh, uh, say that we have to fight something but people don't feel the threats then you have to to carry out work to increase awareness about the point of the threats, explaining how does it threat the economic stability of Ukraine, why it can be a threat to territorial integrity, and to even understand whether economic stability, territorial integrity, the language question, and many other polarized topics are valuable for ordinary people. Maybe those are not the questions which are worth answering, but if to be brief, yes to have the idea which vulnerable groups we have, uh, which vulnerabilities we, we have, and which groups may be targeted, uh, which targets of attacks, which social group is being eliminated from the focus of the public attention or, or vice versa, which one, which is uh, you know, forgotten by some state institutions or discredited by Kremlin, then this social group is very vulnerable then. And in the context of the local uh, elections in Ukraine, what we see, the fight between the office of president and the mayors of different cities and heads of different, you know, local authorities, it can be, of course, to be interpolitical and 
many reasons can be behind it, but uh, all in all, this is the vulnerability Kremlin is going to uh, exploit. Uh, bad narratives. We are not sure if Dmitry, if Robert can hear us. Uh -huh. Connection, I think, for a few seconds. So. Okay, our question was, uh, how can we resist bad negative narratives? Uh, maybe on governmental level, on civil society level, and uh, are we doing it sufficiently? No. no. The, th the thing is that uh, in order to really fight all this disinfo, I mean, I, th there was this remark um, a few minutes ago that uh, because of the democracy uh, being against shutting down these channels, whatever they are, oh, well, that's great. You can be against because it's, it has to be so democratic. But it's, this is an attack on uh, the, on democracy. So if you allow, whether it's media like uh, Sputnik or RT, or whether it's uh, uh, propaganda on, uh, on on social media, and you're not going to do anything because you think these people have a democratic uh, uh, voice, and uh, you, you you shouldn't stop this. Yeah, that's that's fine. But then you need to understand that it can destroy your entire country. And your and your democracy. You've seen, we've seen what happened uh, in uh, in Hungary. Uh, there, uh, they threw out this whole Soros University. Uh, people's rights are going down. Uh, corruption is uh, or some 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 referendum or God knows uh, knows what pump out propaganda on on M H seventeen. They don't play by the rules. So everybody in Europe is like, ah, we need to respect democracy and we need to play by the rules. Yeah, that's fine. But you will lose this battle. So unless EU has some really heavy rules and legislation in place, and not just EU, but between uh, governments and probably uh, with, with, with parties in, involved like uh, United Nations, uh, NATO, etc. Et, et There's some really good legislation how to, to tackle this and this hybrid warfare and protect your democracy. And that there is some really good deal with social media companies that are hopefully willing to, uh, to to help here to to battle this 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 info. Otherwise, it will uh, it will get worse and worse and worse. If you, if you look at how many of these campaigns, it's it's rising. So there were in 2017, Oxford University detected 40 of those campaigns, and now uh, last year, end of last year, it was already up to I think. 90 or, or 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 so and it will get worse because it's working people see that it's that it's working and countries like us and uk are not doing too much about it because it helps trump in us and in the, in the uk it, it helps all these people uh, like uh, uh, farage who are against this uh, uh, who want this brexit so it's it's actually helping them so there's no interest in, in really in, in investigating this so in order to really do something about all these narratives we need to fight a different battle, definitely. Thank you, thank you. I, I fully agree. I think that the Kremlin uh, is actually very free in doing it because we are absolutely tied with democracy, right? So if we cannot prohibit these channels, at least we could try to regulate them. Maybe this is the option. Yeah, I, think, well, I would look at Lithuania, this very short. They are really good at, uh, at at battling this, and way ahead of a lot of uh, countries in, uh, in 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 the EU. Absolutely. Uh, the same question to you, Dmitro, but I have an additional uh, question to you, maybe challenging one. We all remember that we have a media that are owned by oligarchs. Those media who have that have a lot of uh, uh, readers of yours, so they mostly belong to oligarchs, and it's very difficult to uh, spread uh, truthful information by them. So, how can we explain threats to the people when big leading discussion platforms are? mostly interested in showing threats in their own way because they uh, follow s some concrete political interests. During our discussion, 
I I thought that we have a regulator in our country. So what do they do, the National Council? Uh, so the question is uh, how active they are, uh, how efficient they are. Maybe we shall review its uh, responsibilities, its principles. So why, for example, our regulator is less efficient than the British Ofcom? Uh, Ofcom uh, can block uh, some broadcasters if uh, they notice violations. Of course, when we are talking about countering uh, this misinformation, we understand that uh, their activities is related to money. Nobody will spread those facts for free, I think so. So in the end, this is a question of the money. And we need to follow where this money uh, goes from and who, who pays it and who receives it. This is a question of transparency and accountability. If we are talking about uh, the ways to tackle this issue in addition to uh, television, we need uh, to have this uh, broad media liter literacy campaign because fact-checking is important. Uh, and media literacy is important, but sometimes we face the challenge that people are too lazy, they don't want to spend any time on fact-checking. Uh, the key function, function of the state is to create uh, uh, targeted state programs at uh, raising media literacy. And I always say that the state shall do it itself. Well, it cannot do it itself, because there are a lot of people from the non-governmental uh, sector who have been doing it for years. We just need to create a mechanism of their support so they are able to reach those target audiences that they uh, couldn't reach before. For example, we have a lot of media literacy... Pro uh, we haven't had a lot of uh, media literacy programs for doctors, but how many trainees were held for regional journalists, for example? The question is that uh, very often uh, these uh, groups, these programs are targeted at some groups, for example, journalists. It seems to me that the, these groups are the same and even people are the same. Uh, but what if we uh, organized uh, similar media literacy programs for the military, for CEO or even important companies? those people who might have an impact on people's opinion, doctors or teachers in rural in uh, rural settlements and so on. So those people who don't have any access to these media literacy programs. Once we visited with a similar project Kharkiv and uh, we met with representatives of the regional organizations, they listened to our training and they said, wow, we are so surprised, we wish uh, uh, we knew more about it, because they didn't have uh, the time to do it on their own, and when uh, we provided them this training, they were happy to listen. The problem is that usually people don't want to work at a very local, rural level. So it seems to me that the function of the state is to support those initiatives, uh, grassroots initiatives, which aim to reach everyone. When you're talking about uh, the function of the state, uh, what exactly do you mean? Uh, what institution, what state institution do you mean? Because we know that the questions of strategic communications uh, coordinated communications from the state is a very hot issue. We've been, discussing it, we've been discussing it for a long time now. We have invested a lot of money within the past few years, uh, the money of international donors, but we don't have a strategic communications program yet. And uh, we don't even understand who shall be responsible for that. In some countries, uh, this is uh, the Ministry of uh, Defense. Uh, in some countries, this is uh, Office of the President uh, that is responsible for, uh, the, for strategic communications. Well, it's not only about uh, communication, but about countering propaganda. We have only one structure. We, don't, we have uh, the 
security, our security office, which is responsible for this. Uh, because if we're talking about strategic communication, I'm afraid the Office of the President won't be able to coordinate these activities. Uh, only the Council of National Security can do that. If we, are one, if we want to create an efficient model, we need to develop in that direction. As far as I remember, in the US, they also have this coordination at the level of the uh, Council of National Safety and Security. So it seems to me that uh, this council is of the institution that shall do that. We have a lot of working groups uh, that don't have the uh, responsibility or the opportunity to do that. It seems like people just organize different meetings and uh, talk a lot and then don't do anything in real life. We've got a question from our listeners what are alternative channels of mr medvedchuk you uh, can you tell us about alternative media which will counter uh, those uh, spread by medvedchuk channel we need uh, they need concrete answers it seems i would like to say that unfortunately we don't have obvious medias like that who could counter this propaganda there are several groups so that can that could uh, do that. First, this is of course independent media. Uh, these are mostly online media. There are a lot of media like that. Uh, for example, Ukrainian Pravda or Ukrainian Truth, Liga website. So we have those websites. As for the TV channels, it is uh, quite complicated because uh, uh, within the past uh, 20 years, uh, the television sphere has been dominated by oligarchs. A good way out, a good alternative would be a public broadcaster, if it could develop in a better way, because right now its development is being blocked. Uh, Great Britain or Germany, I think, can show us uh, good changes in financial, in funding, because in Ukraine, a public broadcaster is funded from the state budget. Opponents of Suspilna, of the public broadcaster, they say, okay, this is a state-owned channel, a state-funded channel, they only care about the state. But the purpose of creating a public broadcaster is so that it belongs to everyone, to every citizen, and represents uh, interests of the state rather than of uh, concrete politicians. In the UK, for example, people pay uh, for, uh, actually, people pay for the budget of the public broadcaster. They support it and they know that they work for them. So people support them uh, to become better and to provide better news. When talking with my colleagues from uh, a German public broadcaster, uh, they told me that uh, people often send them different proposals or suggestions, uh, and they say, okay, I paid 17 euros, why didn't you do it like I wanted? Can you do it better? So it seems to me, uh, you know, online we can work with uh, independent media, and when it comes to TV channels, we can uh, I help improve uh, Suspilne, I mean public broadcaster. Uh, this is uh, exactly what the model of the public broadcaster uh, was aimed for. But what about alternative channels? <laughs> uh, well, the question, the question is quite specific. The question is right. When we are talking about it, it's sometimes quite difficult to refute fake information. It is easier to watch or read fakes, but it's much more complicated, maybe less interesting to uh, read or watch refutals of those fakes. I also think that uh, the public broadcaster is the way to go, because I don't think that any other channel aims to uh, do those refuse, uh, refutals, to uh, organize media literacy programs and so on and so forth. So it seems to me that Suspin, uh, the public broadcaster, uh, can do this work, which 
Well, there is one more pro problem with refutals. When you refute uh, something, you need to report a fake, but you will never cover the same number of uh, listeners or, uh, I mean, audience, because much more energy, much more efforts are spent on uh, identifying fakes. Usually an average person who receives a lot of information won't check, uh, won't fact check. We are living in a busy world with a lot of informational noise. So if we can check at least one or two pieces of news every day, I think it will be just great. From the point of view of fact checking, it seems like we are trying to control this ocean of fake news. And I, I think it's quite difficult, almost unreal. So I also think that I'm quite skeptical to media literacy programs, but it's the same with democracy. Maybe dem democracy is not ideal, but this is the best we have. So I'm also for media literacy, and I'm also for forcing uh, everyone to know the truth. I would also like to tell you a couple of words about researchers research. Psychologists say that people are eager to choose those news which correspond to their outlook. For example, if we already consider that the West is an enemy, we will choose Russian media. If we think that we support uh, NATO, uh, we will read other types of media. So, probably uh, the society is so polarized polarized that a part of it reads one media and other uh, reads other media media this is what happens in the US uh, there are traditional media that uh, verify information stick to journalistic standards and there are other media that support Trump and their audiences don't overlap I will ask you for one or two phrases to, for final remarks Yes, yeah, so this is the social bubble, and actually this is what uh, Medvedchuk tries to create in Ukraine. Okay, so we were talking about narratives, about uh, misinformation. We came to a conclusion that almost all the groups are vulnerable and fragile. It just depends on the task of uh, those people who spread propaganda. All these are uh, vet uh, veterans, all these um, IDPs, uh, elderly people, families, and so on and so forth. Russian disinformation uh, promotes fixed narratives, but it adopts them, transforms them according to the challenges or new events which happen every day. I am grateful to all of you for uh, this uh, discussion. I'm very grateful to Dmitry Teperik and Robert van den Norda. I hope that it's not our last conversation and we hope that we'll talk later. Thank you. Наша позиція була однозначна, ми виступали проти встановлення блокади. Воно не принесло тієї мети, яку декларували. Ми підтримуємо все, що стосується захисту національної безпеки і оборони. І якщо блокада буде потрібна для такого захисту, то ми готові її підтримати. Возвращатися до цього питання потрібно, але для цього потрібно виконати ряд питань. Блокада Донбасу допомагає послабити агресора. Торгувати з окупантом не можна. Ну що, ти знаєш, що піс оф зе піс, що мир во всім мірі. Не пить бросай. Ты смотришь, как она растет, наливается, и у тебя это получается. Так вот думаешь, ой, какое счастье, боже мой. Сереж, иди сюда, она зацвела. Наташ, иди сюда, смотри. А вот тут первая ягодка. И вот так вот мы все время живем. Даже в условиях вот этой блокады, вот этих всех боевых действий. Мы так и живем.
2014 год, когда более или менее перестали стрелять, началось, так скажем, перемирие. Мы начали выезжать в Луганск. У нас другого выхода нет. Абсолютно. Ездить в сторону, опять-таки, Лисичанска, Северодонецка, да, туда. Дороги ужаснейшие. Так, давайте я приеду сюда. Иди. Туда хожу, сюда. И погнали. Наши городских. Да. Ну, то что, вот это ж... Сейчас выбираем, да? А время к шести часам идти на переход не знаем. Пускает, не пускает. К чему еще сегодня прицепятся, скажи, пожалуйста? Да. И... К весу, не к весу, к малине, не малина. Что, в банках, не в банках? Ой, я не могу, у меня просто вот прямо... Так, все, все. Пустят. Мы ж не уйдем. Будем настаивать на своем. Это наше. Это не ворованное, не куплено, не купи, продай. Не барыги. Упрекают нас в том, что каждый раз вы кормите сепаратистов. Да не кормим мы сепаратистов. Все. Все. Получается, сепаратисты могут кушать 75 килограмм плавленных сырков, а... 10 килограмм, 20 килограмм малины они не могут кушать. Они сразу превращаются в сепаратистов, а когда едят колбасу украинскую, они не сепаратисты. Ой-ой-ой-ой-ой-ой-ой, куда людей? Малина не проходит сразу. Не, 10 килограмм. Почему? А, пробу снимать, снимайте. Знаешь, больше, потому что ягоды вообще не знаю. Почему? Ягода не предусмотрена приказом, поэтому предусмотрена. Извините, Нет, вы с собой чуть-чуть можете взять. Мы не, 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 не. Пропускайте. Выйдите, пожалуйста, к нам. Выйдите, пожалуйста, к нам. Что вы там сюда. спрятали? Выходите сюда. Че вы прячетесь от меня? Вот на ту сторону можно, да, вот это, да? Можно? Вот он, да, для себя везет? Или кому он везет? Вот кому он попер от этого сыры? Вот, я выращиваю лично, вот этими руками, с дочкой, с семьей. Вот я буду каждый я день сюда говорю, ходить, и каждый день мы, сюда, да, мы идет, едем да. реализовать, потому что рынка сбыта здесь нет. Я не Его могу, я только есть, что говорю, было, я, я не могу. Выхожу. Меня, когда я вышел в школу заканчивать, меня учили говорить правду. Ну как можно? Вот скажите, вот объясните, как, что мне, блядь, все делать? А? Вот что мне, блядь, все делать? Что, скажите, мне все делать? Тихо. На голову вывесы пойдем, блядь, или что? Тихо. Вот объясните мне, что мне делать с ним, блядь? А? 19 у нас начинается у всей станицы, начинаются большие проблемы, большие неприятности с заработком. Они подрывают вообще всю экономику нашей станицы, реально. Если это блокада, да? Блокада. То пусть эта блокада будет вот, вот вообще блокада. То есть проходят люди с сумочкой. Все. А другого источника дохода у нас нет. Что дальше? Когда ты целый день здесь находишься, ты трудишься, ты на что-то надеешься, а тебе стоят люди и стараются как-то тебя унизить, чем-то оскорбить за твой труд. Но становится очень обидно. Очень обидно.
hate speech – язык вражды или по-другому – язык ненависти. Речь идет о создании негативных стереотипов и всех видах высказываний, которые оправдывают или поощряют разные виды дискриминации. Жертвой hate speech а может стать любой человек. Украина-Харьков матч «Шахтер-Динамо». Болельщики бело-синих осыстали бразильских игроков «Шахтера» и изображали такие звуки. За расизм фанатов киевский клуб проведет матч без зрителей и заплатит штраф в полмиллиона гривен. А это Испания, Мадрид. Зазуля нацист. Кричали недавно на трибунах. Так фанаты команды соперника, известные своими левыми взглядами и поддержкой группировок ЛДНР, встречали украинского футболиста Романа Зазулю, который играет за один из местных клубов. Поведение фанатов назвали ксенофобией, а Зазулю поддержали сам клуб, международные футбольные ассоциации, МИД и президент Украины. Язык вражды бывает трех типов тяжести. Самые тяжкие призывы к убийству фиксируются в Украине нечасто. Например, нападение на центры ЛГБТ-активистов. Несколько дней назад на Брайтхабе в Харькове появилась надпись «Смерть ЛГБТ». До этого крыльцо офиса заливали кровью животных. При этом в украинских медиа преимущественно низкий и средний тип дискредитации, в том числе и жители оккупированных территорий. Кількість цих матеріалів була 13% від кількості матеріалів з ознаками хейт-спічу. Проте, якщо рахувати від загальної кількості матеріалів, це досить низький показник, оскільки, але передусім це не тому, що наші журналісти дуже чутливі, а тому, що просто зараз дуже мало інформації, яка стосується жителів окупованих територій. Революція, окупація Крима, війна на Донбасі і сотні тисяч переселенців стали тяжелим екзаменом для українських журналістів. Значна частина людей, які свідомо вибрали життя на окупованих територіях. Люди, які живуть під цими кольорами, не приховують. Багатьох влаштовує навіть погана копія СРСР. Ціна питання – подвійна пенсія. Марина Курапцева – журналістка із Янаківа. Болі п'яті літ – пріоритет її роботи, тема переселенців і жителів окупованих територій. Говорить, люди до сих пор сталкиваються з негативним відношенням регулярно. Переселенці можуть відказувати в оренді квартири і трудоустройстві. До сих пор присутствує травля в соцсетях, як і язик ненависті зі сторони окремих медіа і блогерів. Але не всі СМІ роблять це спеціально. Є окремі медіа, які... Не обязательно поставили себе за цель издеваться вот над переселенцами, жителями оккупированных территорий. Нет никакой массовой неприязни, скорее всего, а есть просто медиа отдельные, которые зарабатывают клики, к сожалению, путем хейт-спич. Некоторые медиа распространяют язык вражды, но гораздо чаще ярлыки вешают политики, активисты, блогеры, эксперты. Громкие примеры, вот эта цитата, политика Ильи Кивы. И резкое высказывание экс-министра социальной политики в интервью BBC. Про украинцев все выехали. А то, кто хочет отремонтировать две пенсии, там и тут. Хай потерпит. Мне их не шкода никого, абсолютно, честно скажу. Не шкода тех солдат и офицеров, и их родин, которые убиты там. По мнению правозащитников и медиа-экспертов, зачастую такие месседжи об определенных категориях граждан распространяются политиками с определенными целями. Когда это постоянно кажется, конечно, с боку чиновника, конечно, это формирует определенную громадскую думку о людей, которые действительно мало чего не выехали. Якщо вони такі проукраїнські, якщо залишилися, то вони підтримують Путіна. Цей дискурс він підтримується. Тому що а якщо вони такі вже наші, на що нам використовувати наш бюджет, на що нам використовувати якісь нові механізми, якщо вони не такі наші. І мені видається, що в деяких випадках це дуже така умисна політика використання мови ворожнечі, використання штампів і стереотипів стосовно людей, які залишилися в окупації, тому що так простіше не вирішувати їхні проблеми. Особенно общество поляризовано перед выборами. Наглядный пример президентской и парламентской кампании этого года. Деление на своих и чужих породило оскорбление ярлыки, парахоботы и зеботы. Баталии между двумя лагерями не утихают до сих пор, еще больше разделяя общество. Политикам выгодно использовать язык вражды в своих целях. Следующая кампания к местным выборам не станет исключением. Играть на чувствах людей, чтобы настроить в свою пользу будущих избирателей, либо наоборот, против своих оппонентов. К сожалению, как бы здесь средства массовой информации могут стать инструментом в этой борьбе и как раз... Профессиональная журналистика будет заключаться в том, чтобы убирать градус эмоций, не распространять манипуляции, 
а больше все-таки сосредотачиваться на сути и пытаться, скажем так, не заострять на таких манипуляционных вещах внимание. В украинском законодательстве нет термина «язык ненависти», но в Уголовном кодексе и законах, касающихся медиа, есть понятие разжигания национальной, расовой и религиозной вражды. Статья предусматривает наказание 5 лет лишения свободы, а при отягчающих обстоятельствах – 8. В прошлом году было заведено 47 таких дел. Национальный совет Украины по вопросам телевидения и радиовещания проверяет медиа на соответствие законам Украины. Если в эфире зафиксируют разжигание вражды, вещатель платит штраф до 20% от лицензионного сбора. За последние пару лет Нацсовет оштрафовал несколько каналов. Самые громкие истории – штраф телеканалу «Интер» за антиукраинские речи ведущих на концерте ко Дню Победы и «Ньюз Ван» за использование клише российской пропаганды. В то же время на других каналах выходят программы, в которых используется язык вражды, например, вата-шоу на прямом или антизомби на ICTV. Комитет Верховной Рады по вопросам гуманитарной и информационной политики планирует закрепить в законопроекте об аудиовизуальных услугах определение понятия язык вражды в СМИ, блогах и, в частности, в высказываниях народных депутатов. Понятное дело, что он не сможет мониторить весь интернет, и это, ну, в этом нет смысла. Но если будут жалобы на язык вражды, если будут жалобы на манипулятивные вещи, которые будут иметь характер дезинформации, то есть умышленного вброса недостоверной информации, чтобы был орган, который на это реагировал и который применял санкции. Решать, блокировать ресурс за нарушение или нет, будет суд. Также Нацсовет будет сотрудничать с крупными платформами, такими как YouTube, Facebook для улучшения механизма фильтрации контента. Сейчас YouTube изменил правила. Модераторы могут удалять и запретить монетизировать контент с использованием языка вражды. Сейчас, если журналисты и больше чутливі до випадків мови ворожнечі, то ця мова ворожнечі більш активніше поширюється якраз в соціальних мережах. І з цим теж треба якось цьому протистояти. Це новий більш виклик, тому що якщо не зміг хоч якось ще можна повпливати, то на соціальні мережі, відповідно, Впливу законодавчого немає і врегулювати це досить складно. Дані всеукраїнського опросу СКОР показують, що серед українців немає віри в відкритість діалогу з жителями восточних регіонів. Людей з востока країни бачать в негативному світі ряд центральних і західних регіонів. Що Західна Україна, чим більше проєвропейською вона є, чим більше економічно безпечною вона є, тим вищий буде стереотип до Східної України. І це суперечить взагалі сутності про європейської ріднації, толерантності і цінностям людським. У соціолога Марії Золкіне іноє мніння. Уровень довір'я ніже, вважає вона, і за меншого кількості міжлічностних контактів. Але, згодно дослідженням Фонду демократичних ініціатив, до жителям окупованих територій нейтральне, або позитивне відношення. Це транслюється по всім регіонам України, особливо на підконтрольній частині Донбасу. За роки розгортання конфлікту не виникло відчуття, що за лінією розмежування знаходяться чужі, не виникло ворожнечі до людей, які знаходяться на окупованій території. Ставлення до них є радше співчутливим і їх вважають скоріше жертвами різних обставин. Воєнний конфлікт і язик ненависті підпитують друг друга, образує некий заколдований круг. Язик ненависті не можна вважати безвредним, тому що це всього лише слова. Наоборот, в віртуальному пространстві язик вражди розпространяється з огромною скоростю і в ітогі він може привести до серйозним, а во час війни – катастрофическим последствиям в реальности. Ватники, укропы, сепары и бандеровцы – такие обозначения уже никого не удивляют и стали, к сожалению, нормой для нашего общества. В борьбе за хайповые заголовки и просмотры теряются реальные человеческие жизни. My name is Eugen Zaslavsky. I'm an executive director of Media Development Foundation. I'm going to be your moderator today. And I shall speak, we will speak today about how the coronavirus pandemic has changed local media in Eastern Ukraine and how to handle media crisis in the regions. I am moderating this, this panel because Media Development Foundation develops 
uh, works on development of organ organizations for them to have good strategies on this content or distribution of content and a reliable business model. Today we shall speak with our panelists, with Valeria Pacenek, who is the coordinator of the Donbass Media Fellows Network. She's online and she will join us soon with Valeria Garmash, the 6262 Comua Slavic City website CEO. Hi, Gaigi says is Gildi of Genomics Media, and Andrei Boborikin, the manager, media manager, director of the digital marketing of the products of, of the Suspilne. Clearly that the crisis touched all of us and we were talking a lot about the drop, 15% uh, drops in sales and more, but those are just numbers. What does it, those are just figures, but what does it mean for journalists who create content or any other audience who reads? So the economics uh, drop by 15% and we cannot imagine well enough how much it can influence the specific media outlet. I would like to ask a question to Valeri. Tell us what do these figures mean exactly of this drop for your media and what strategies do you think are worth following when you understand clearly that uh, you close May, for example, with the result of minus 50%. And, you know, now again, they have the uh, orange zone and uh, you understand that September, you will have good figures, but in October, you will see another drop. When you go to your sales department or when you go into your newsroom, what do you say then? Well, first of all, if you take a look at what happened for the time of the lockdown from March till May, of course, we had at least 40% drop from the direct sales of the direct sales, which shifted our understanding of how we are to create content, which resources to be used for content to be interesting. I will switch to Russian. It will be easier for me to speak. So we tried to do the following. We had a following budget for development for the time when we were in the lockdown. Uh, we uh, ate this budget a bit and uh, we were producing the kind of content that could be monetized. So, of course, the strategy that was in place was to find the companies which understood that at offline is something difficult and useless and you are to switch online. And a lot of attention was dedicated to the co to communicate this necessity to transfer to online ad to the companies. So uh, you're you're saying that you are checking the strategy that is the transfer from online offline budget to online budget ad. So digitalization, you are responsible for digitalization for them. Yes, it looks weird and funny, but that's what it looks like. Uh, how bad the situation is that very short timelines? Well, first of all, the, the budgets um, are being cut and you cannot ignore that some people can be fired and of course this will be depicted on the content so if you do not feed the content the audience wants to hear and see you lose the you lose this audience and you become less interesting for the ad company ad agencies and you are to stick to the balance that you can create good content and also fit in the budget that you have it, given the sales drop significantly. Wonderful. You mentioned content. I would like to speak with Valeria and discuss the topic of content with her. I think she has a very relevant experience for this. Can we uh, hear Valeria and will be will we be able to see her? She's always with us. Okay, she uh, was with us all this time. Okay, so hello Valeria. Greetings. I hope you can hear me. We do. 
So a question, how did editorial strategists change in media and how were they supposed to change? Maybe some part of media followed the false way, feeding the audience with uh, fast content. What do you think could have been done differently? Thank you for your question. I would like to first give a short remark, uh, you know, concerning your per first question on the ways and uh, on the monetization of your media. Coronavirus and this whole corona crisis, especially in the act active phase of the lockdown, showed an interesting uh, tendency. The direct at agency who were working directly with the media outlets, they left, but the donors, they even extended their vectors of work and their topics and tender propositions for media. So, and judging by our network that is represented by 12 independent editorial offices all over Ukraine, the media specialists were using these uh, possibilities very actively. This was the chance to have a, like a financial pillow. Of course, it's not going to replace editorial budget or operative budget it's not going to cover lots of expenses of the editorial office, but certain projects which seemed frozen, which seemed to be impossible to implement because of the lack of the funds, they could have been implemented and they were implemented thanks to donors assistance. And this is vitally important because often our regional media, they don't just ignore, but maybe they consider they do not have enough experience or they think they have lack of possibilities or ideas to apply for such tenders. And this crisis was encouraging them to look for this way of the additional um, money. And I would like to say that for the past several months, I have been monitoring the results of different tenders for mini grants, for bigger grants, for some seri more serious support and I couldn't notice a single short list of winners which wouldn't exist at least one of our editorial offices which is a partner which show says that this works and the editorial offices they understood this mechanism and started using it so I encourage all those who doubt to themselves at least try because more possibilities emerged in my opinion and many you know point projects that can be even provided by the local editorial office and now i will answer your question on the strategy and editorial policy of course for editorial offices it has become a challenge especially in the spring when we had a total lockdown but it was a challenge, but not the matter of life or death. Uh, at first, it seemed that this would kill the work of the media's uh, representatives in uh, editorial offices because small editorial offices did not have the mechanism of sub remote work. They did not have set connections of online work and they had no experience of work in that regime and there were also technical issues when the regional television cannot work from home right region editorial offices of the regional television it has to at least to at least be partly working from the studio and first it seemed that it was a life or death question, but then it turned out that the mechanisms of how to change your works or reprofile, and they have been, are in place for quite a while. So it's worth paying your attention at network media, at networks that have their own core points in other countries or within one country, but in different regions. So they work wonderfully through remote programs. I mean, Slack or Trello, there are millions of chats and messengers that they, sh they offer good set of functions, which works. 
and we even have examples when journalistic story or report was made by means of Zoom, which we are using now. And the comments are recorded that way as well. So in my opinion, this was a challenge for managers. Sorry. and for the editors, and they coped with it. Yes, it seems to me that a lot of them have coped very well, and now I would like to give floor to Andrei Baborekin. You wrote about the success of Suspilne in the digital area that they didn't have before, but that they can now boast of. So you, as an experienced media manager, went and achieved certain results. And the key thing is that you didn't lose them. So you are uh, increasing your audience all the time. You report a lot that you can distribute very well. T tell us to us, please, how for other media, how did you do it? Clearly that you have gained uh, lots of audience during Corona crisis, but what do you do next to keep this tempo and not to lose? What will your recommendations be? I should mention earlier, we did not have such results because we did not have new site of Suspilne. It's a new project that emerged at the end of the last year. So there was nothing to report on before. And in the result that we have gained during Corona crisis and that we still have, my share of this result is not very big since bigger part of its audience comes to regional content that is created by the departments in the regional offices of Suspilne. when coronavirus broke off, when the pandemics broke off in Ukraine, we received a big increase of the audience because we already had the, you know, the local audience which were subscribers of the, to the pages of the Suspilne and the model of distribution of content of Suspilne in this case I mean, the digital use of Spilne is rather unique because very often media who have big communities on Facebook, they have one or two big pages. But Suspilne has many small and uh, bigger pages that have a very uh, centralized audience. When the lockdown started, we, we were writing about it and, and it was a super focused targeting without targeting. So people who were subscribers to Suspilne Lviv or Suspilne Kharkiv, they received content, they were interested in. I mean, news about whether to go to work tomorrow, what to do with your children, to go to school or not. And in this, in this sense, if it get back uh, to your previous questions about question about uh, the quality of the content or shocking content, we have a lot of discussions of what is trash in, in the media. But in my opinion, if the media writes a lot about coronavirus, it is very difficult to uh, tell, the, to say that this content is not of high quality. If it corresponds to all the requirements or to all the standards of uh, good quality journalism. If this is the content that uh, the people need, uh, for example, when we started writing about the lockdown, of course, this news had the biggest number of views and shares. Well, uh, your example, the example of the Ukrainska Pravda and many other websites uh, that lost a lot of their traffic. 
you managed to retain your audience. Well, you did, but less than the others. So there shall be some uh, methods that uh, you use to do that. So, for example, you decided not to feed those uh, fast food news to the audience. You decided that we will provide uh, longer features. Uh, you will you will change your content somehow. Your content will explain what is happening in the country. Uh, well, we continuously work with the central editorial office and with the offices all around the country to improve the quality of our news, to uh, broaden our formats. But I think that uh, the result that we have it can be explained that Suspilne has a lot of regional, uh, uniquely regional content, which is not related to coronavirus or to political news or social news. For example, recently uh, there was uh, there was a feature about a grandfather who called the police because he didn't have anything to eat. It happened in Rivne, and it was a human story which corresponds to the to the needs uh, of uh, our audience people want to read stories about other people about their neighbors in other regions of ukraine as i've already told you suspilna has uh, small and uh, medium communities in every region of ukraine uh, we have our own brand it seems to me that you made your content paid content it seems like it seems like your paid content increased mm, probably i don't really know in order to get a lot of traffic from facebook uh, you need to post a lot of content uh, this is actually my rule i try to uh, implement this rule whenever i work so i think it this is one of the reasons behind that, but if you calculate the number of editorial offices of Suspilne in Ukraine, uh, we have a lot of uh, news, a lot of features every day. We publish about 200, 250 uh, uh, pieces of uh, news or features every day because there are a lot of editorial offices. Unfortunately, not all the media has uh, the, have the opportunity, or maybe fortunately, uh, they don't have the opportunity to publish uh, uh, so much content every day. And now I would like to give word to Guy, because I know that he consult regional media a lot, including national media. And you really try to understand what can go, what uh, could what went wrong and why the media manager took this or that decision. Maybe the manager didn't know what he could do. But because we don't have a lot of media managers in the regions, I mean those people who are experts in building modern media companies. What in your opinion are the key challenges and key problems of media managers and how can we tackle those problems? Well, in fact, uh, at least on the Ukrainian market, the situation is uh, the following. A lot of uh, managers of the media, national and regional medias, are former journalists. Uh, they are excellent in what they do. They are excellent editors, excellent journalists. So they create uh, super content but when it comes to management or marketing or financial management or hr they start to do everything using the intuition we know that in ukraine there are no many platforms uh, uh, that teach media managers people study at the universities for five or six years and we just try to use different platforms to teach those managers everything that professionals uh, no, in just uh, three or four months. Because of that, a lot of media are focused on the content part. 
and forget about organizational, administrative, and financial parts of their work. During the lockdown, I worked with four different media from different regions of Donbass, from Mariupol, Pokrovsk, Bakhmut, or other, or other media. Some of them worked in exile. They had different challenges. But the most important is how efficient their processes had been before. Those with the most stable and resilient uh, management uh, structure, it was easier for them to work. Others had to adapt very quickly to the new realities. People also were uh, quite depressed because of the constant uh, because of the indecisiveness, because they didn't know what would they expect in the future. I call wife. Uh, I call life our super motivator. When you have to uh, really act and do your best, I noticed a lot that there were a lot of managers or media who didn't succumb to the panic. They started from optimizing all their activities and optimizing. Uh, their work. I think this is a first step towards solving the issues. Secondly, we also recommended them to diversify uh, their income. My colleagues have just said that donors were quite active in helping media organizations. We also said that it is important. Uh, the most important is that the media doesn't depend on a single source of income. Valerie said that they created a unique, uh, viable proposition for the media. Uh, there is one more factor which was very important. Uh, this is support of the audience. Uh, this is the most valuable part that a media might have. Uh, you said that traffic is increasing, but you need to say that the traffic, uh, those media uh, who were trusted managed to increase their traffic. This is what happened not only in Donbass or not only in Ukraine, but all around Europe and the world. Independent media managed to increase its traffic. Uh, the growth rate was much higher. When you ask your audience for support, uh, they are usually very eager to uh, respond. They might be active or passive, but still they react. I saw how businesses decided to help the elderly during the lockdown to bring their food. Uh, this is how people helped during the war. All of these things are very physical. When you see a person in distress, when you understand that your help might impact on the life of this person, you will help. There are excellent cases when, thanks to COVID-19, before we before the lockdown we estimated how many how many um, how much money people uh, donate for charity it was uh, about 10000 of uh, thousands of grivnas uh, now it is about 80000 dollars donated by the audience monthly to the media uh, this is so called reader revenue Thank you for the excellent uh, numbers. How do you think why media didn't ask for such kind of assistance before? I think this is just the ideal way to go. For example, when the business said we will help those in need, we will help those clients or those who have no money. Uh, the state said that they, uh, that it would also support the population. So everyone seems to help others and the media also jumped on this wagon. Well, I would disagree with you. Before, uh, during Maidan, uh, several media managed to collect a lot of money. So we had this experience in our history. But uh, Washington Post, uh, their subs subscription increased after it was bought by Bezos. If you take a look at the peak it was of this process it was Trump pump our media reached out for the audience for support 
but we haven't we, we have never worked on it in a systemic way we just asked help us but we didn't do it on a systemic scale uh, 50 grivnas or 300 grivnas is not a big amount of money but it really helps the media how did but we didn't explain our value to the media during the coronavirus crisis they understood what uh, that they pay us uh, so we can provide them with uh, news so i think the problem was in um, uh, absence of systemic work in this direction it all started in march and april this year and now a lot of me media introduced membership uh, variants others introduced a paywall and now i think that there is a more systematic approach to these fundraising activities so before uh, the media just asked people sporadically for help but now it's a more systematic approach i would like to comment on what uh, guy said in this systemic approach uh, which we still lack which we are still working on this systemic approach also requires a product approach we need to evaluate how much money uh, so this is about unit economics which has been used for many years in IT companies we only start using it in Ukraine in for the media in Ukraine for example New York Times evaluates uh, dozens or even thousands of indicators about uh, their readers this is what we need to do as well there is no such analysis of the media uh, that use reader revenues we need to develop those skills and those expertise we will really need these knowledge and skills and i would also like to say that you you had a question actually right yes you can you consult uh, the ukrainians within the mdf uh, project well of course i don't ask you to for insider secrets but maybe you sh can share some information maybe uh, the reasons that will be a media in Donbass who would that would like to do the same it is interesting to read to the stories of the ambassadors of the Ukrainians maybe you have any suggestions or recommendations on what to do to say that my audience loves me it will support me and I will be able to survive using this money well, we are not only starting in these directions, we are only starting working with uh, the Ukrainians. We do what I'm actually talking about. Uh, we bring this product approach to their models of reader revenue. Everyone, all the media that starts working with this approach in Ukraine, they start with value propositions. Like what can I give? What can the audience give me? How can I answer their questions? But at the same time, you always have to link it to certain indicators, which will provide the possibility to make some forecasts, to make an analysis. This is what we are working on. Going back to regional projects of this kind, I think in regions, there are much more possibilities to create a successful radio avenue project they have because they have a more focused regional community you can com talk to if you're a regional media you know the problem of the regional community of yours on the other hand you have less competitors there unlike all national media which have many competitors and who do not have paywall or don't ask anything from the readers so the competition gets harder this does not exist in the regions but 
in the regions, the economic capacity of the average reader is a lot less or lower than in Kiev reader. So there are pro and cons, but it seems to be membership model can be easier launched in the regional level, on the regional level than on the old national level. Valeria, I have a question for you. Valeria, I'm sure you can hear us. Maybe you have the answer why are there are so many media in Lviv uh, which are trusted by their um, audience. What did they do to get this, that their audience is so responsive and started giving them money and support the media they are reading? I do not think that I can tell you details which processes they have undergone because each editorial office has its own process, but it seems to me there are a few important issues here. Yes, the media, like our, I support my colleagues to say that media are very inconfident usually. It's the story from Kharkiv, one of the participants of our network. Um, the Nakipila, they arranged crowdfunding campaign to collect funds for their needs. And they were very surprised how fast and how effectively this model worked for them. So I would like to emphasize on this, on being surprised. Why were they surprised? I think our regional media having a good possibility to communicate with their audience in their news feed, not in comments to some publications, but communicate more closely and to have a better understanding of their audience, they often ignore this possibility because if you uh, systemically study your audience and apply a scientific approach to it that this presupposes many funds because these are the studies, researchers, focus groups, so certain work that requires funds which local editorial offices usually do not have. But if we skip this formal part, then our media, our regional medi media, have many opportunities to communicate with their audience, to study their needs, because in order to launch a certain paywall, you have to meet the needs or satisfy the needs of the payer for your product, of the consumer. And you have to treat your content as a product, but not when the editor is thinking, what would my audience find interesting? Well, I am thinking this is interesting, so I think that my audience will think this is interesting as well. So you asked about Lviv. In Lviv, there are many examples where ambassadors and paywalls appear and other support from the audience is observed. It's because they have the tradition to get feedback from the audience. So in order to take this step, it is important to turn your audience to be an active audience, to understand what you can give them, what they lack on this regional media market, what they, their audience would like, which kind of information would they like to see, and making your product user-friendly and interesting. The media are, cre are creating, are uh, getting the added value. These are not new things. It's a well-known thing, but uh, we often neglect these steps. So by modernizing your work and communicating with your audience, you can already count on readers being thankful and they will be willing to join and and it's not about some serious, you know, idea. 
or ideology yes there are media you would like to associate yourself with because of their idea like the ukrainians it's about willingness to be part of this community because of the key idea of this media but also also because they ha offer a good quality content but not every media has super task not every regional media has this super task around which you can group the audience but after you study the needs of your readers or your audience you can expect that your audience will be willing to pay for the content which is relevant for them useful and the one that you are used to thank you valeria can you also reflect on this? I also have a question. Do you think can, uh, do you think you can build in reaches not donations but paywalls? Do you think this resource can fit in the regions that is going to say, dear friends, this model is more convenient for us. We understand that you could pay us monthly on the monthly basis, uh, sending us donates, but this way we will make better forecasts. What do you think? I think that reader revenue or the revenue from the audience is not the dominating uh, source in Ukraine. But it's growing from $3,000 to $80,000 per year. It's a big indicator, but that's uh, like something that we are discussing of it's the alternative source that has been in the market before this but if we think from the perspective of membership or paywall how do they differ i explain it very simply paywall it's the media as a product you sell the exclusive content that has no alternative to it that's the value of it but membership it's the media as a service it's about a different thing it means this that you additionally provide some benefits and it can be very different anything can be anything but in both cases you are trying to engage them with your mission when a person gives you five hryvnas or a thousand it he or she makes a more emotional choice like Eugenia asked me I trust him I will pay him and this ambassador way can also work well and now speaking about paywalls in the regions paywall i agree with andri uh, the the models of subscription is a very tough version when you make the person to pay but uh, for many media do not have big traffic and uh, they are uh, they might even lose some part of traffic when when you may, when you bring up the wall between you and your audience and it, it can have a negative effect in the long term perspective it, the, this could be wonderful solutions people did sell uh, newspapers before right but I would start with a so milder form. Support as much as you can, or start with crowdfunding. Like, I want to collect 50,000 hryvnas for three months and to make an investigation for the ecological state of my region. I mean, to analyze the water, food, and so on. And then we can see that we have personal data of these people, and we know we launch the second campaign and see how many people from the first campaign will support it in the second campaign or didn't support us or how many people are recurring and then I would attract those who are there for you all the time would be actually the members and then you can create for these members this exclusive content so you know you applying soft model first Okay, so, but you know what? I ha we have 20 minutes, right? And it's a standard 
the one that the New York Times is building. Yes, but they have a crazy traffic. Don't forget about this. Yes, but there's a brand. If you have a brand, if you have traffic, then you can do it and content right it has to be the content unique one yes it's a bonus i would like to comment i'm very skeptical about uh, paywall and paywall perspective in ukraine for another 5 10 15 years because the effective paywall requires a certain market uh, guy mentioned and uh, which one is small uh, market of reader revenue but paywall requires a much bigger media market in general so if we compare our region with Poland where market is 10 times or maybe a hundred times bigger than the media market in Ukraine and the uh, digital advertising market as well then they do have the level of competition that allows you to play and allows you to create some unique product on the on this market in Ukraine right now we do not have the size of the market and nothing is indicating that the general market of money in media or in digital even if it is going to grow it, it it, it, we do not we will not have hockey stick growth but if you speak about regions and regions it's even slower so I believe more in the membership models development not just in Ukraine but in the world it's a trend paywall I can it's hard for me to imagine what how the content is to look like so that the regional content could be uh, you know for paywall even you know even if it's high profile investigation it shouldn't be under paywall anyway because it contradicts the logics of journalism especially regional uh, regional um, journalism what the 20 minutes does it's an experiment it's a cool experiment that will give us many data for media research studies uh, of paywall perspective so I do not I do follow what uh, so I do not I'm not optimistic about the paywall at all so um, I know that, uh, uh, you know, he, he understands that even if from the 0.7% somebody would subscribe, he will have money for the editorial office. If PNL works, they haven't subscribed yet. So going back to media business, sorry, Valeri, that we were talking so much about additional or if we speak about business and maybe even about HR. Okay, you took part in our discussion about the regional media and one of the questions is most media say that they want to preserve the core of the editorial office of the because they do a product but uh, when we're talking about uh, the positions so that you want to find uh, the way journalists designers and other creative journalists so these are usually people that spend money rather than uh, generate money if i can say so uh, during the crisis we shall employ people who bring money not spend them well what can we do if uh, there is a loss in revenues in our experience, in our case, so we uh, we were looking for salespeople. For us, so the, this was the key element because we understood that if the uh, the sales coefficient uh, falls in one salesperson, then we can find other salespeople. We uh, broadened broadened uh, this funnel by employing new people. 
I have a strange formula that uh, per one person that spends money, we shall have two that generate money. Uh, this is a road to success in our case. Designers and uh, uh, core of the editorial office, editors and journalists are very important. They generate traffic, but they are human beings. They want to get salary for their work. They want They want to get money, they want to get paid, they want to develop further. But we need to get this budget from somewhere. That is why we focused on looking for people and looking for other ways of monetization and getting additional revenues, maybe to find other avenues of getting income. During the crisis, we launched a completely new direction, which led uh, to, uh, which helped us uh, here pains of our clients. We understood that they didn't want to develop uh, their business through other platforms. So they want to do it through their websites, YouTube channels and social networks. So we sold our expertise in how to do that. We provided our uh, consultations because we know how to distribute content. A lot of private companies, uh, small, medium and even big companies used our expertise and bought uh, our c consultations on uh, producing, on selling content. Uh, this is what helped us strive when we started receiving less advertising revenues. Part of the clients uh, that chose this new direction of activities managed to increase their revenues almost in eight times. For example, before that, uh, they spent 10,000 grivnas, and now they spend about 80,000 grivnas per year. This is, these are completely different numbers, and they are ready to invest more. The crisis showed that you need to be more creative, you need to promote yourself. Those people who understood how to do that started building this communication and understood that it is quite efficient. I really like your point of view because we discussed corporate media. And it seems to me that uh, this market in Kiev, ha in Kiev has already been closed. Uh, and that media won't be able to make money. But your experience showed that it actually is quite efficient, that small and medium enterprises also must know how to distribute content, how to produce content and you have to be as a provider into this new world. We have professional expertise, knowledge and skills, so why not use our knowledge? We are one of the most popular websites in Slovensk. We show growth during the lockdown. Some of the media managed to retain uh, their readers, if we know how to interact with our audience, so then we are the experts on this, of course. Now a lot of companies uh, use not only social networks, so they also ask us to create content and distribute content in YouTube, so they entrust us with these responsibilities. This is what a lot of media do by themselves. Uh, the benefits of this process is that no editorial office doesn't do anything against its editorial policy. They just create uh, additional services, so they propose it to the market, and they can create interesting content by uh, getting money from these new avenues of revenue. Can I please ask a uh, guy the following? If we try to think about Ukrainian market, then it does change. Previously, it was strange to for the companies to build a SMM and targeting uh, uh, activities inside to create an event agency inside uh, the media office, but now the media business is quite uh, diverse. So 
do you feel that managers have this collision in their minds and souls so that they don't know who they are because we are jack of all trades now we produce content we sell uh, our products we know what uh, what cinematographer is so we do a lot of things who we are Thank you so, for such an excellent question, which is quite challenging at the same time. It seems to me that for journalists, it's very important to uh, to do their core content, to produce content, to meet the needs of the audience, to show the way, to show what is happening around. I think that they need still to focus on that. But in addition to what Valeria has just said, you need to have money for that. In the digital era, we are not competitors any longer. We compete with digital giants, with businesses uh, that learned how to interact with, the, uh, with their audience and social networks. Your traditional approaches, uh, your traditional subscription models no longer works because people do not consume such content as it was in the previous century. People no longer trust in direct advertising using CPM formula. So, for example, people see advertising and the media gets paid for that. All of these uh, approaches are quite traditional and outdated. There are new points of contact with uh, with uh, the audience. Before we were intermediaries between the audience and the business, we took money from each of them to ensure their communication. But right now this model is no longer efficient after the emergence of the Internet. So the question is, what do we suggest now? For me as a business, for me as an advertiser, it's not interesting what media might offer. Six grivenness per one uh, contact in native advertising, it's nothing. Why do I need to do that? They don't generate any leads, so there are no sales. So maybe brand awareness is one thing, but it's not enough to be able to survive. I will manage only to survive if I have a resilient model of development. Here I completely support Valeri and other colleagues who find all the non-traditional ways to business development. If they want to organize events, they can do that. If they can make money doing that, you are welcome. They just need to be careful that they still stay true to their core business, journalism, producing content and all the other uh, ways uh, are only supporting ways to do that. You also asked me about other ways of doing that. There are several hundreds of them. And if I take a look at my notes, I can tell you about 200, 250 ways of additional revenues. I agree with Guy that uh, these monetization activities shall not overlap the value of uh, the core business. But at the same time, it's quite difficult to reach this ideal balance because I often see that the media builds uh, an excellent event project which works every year and supports this media brand. But at the same time, if, uh, if this event project gets its own brand, and if uh, the editorial services are no longer relevant, then we have a separate event business which doesn't bring any added value except money. And the media doesn't bring any added value to this event business. This actually happens quite often. There is no answer uh, to whether the media need to do that or not. Of course, they might do it if they want to survive, because no one will pay salaries to your employees. But at the same time, I see a lot of cases when media inter 
uh, include this uh, media component into all those diverse models of monetization. When they have a lot of side projects that bring money, some of them are successful, some of them uh, start uh, living as a separate projects. And they interfere with developing of uh, the core brand of the media. My next question will be quite easy, but when I'm talking to chief editors or owners of the media, for them this question is quite challenging. Programmatic advertising. Maybe you've seen a lot of people, media managers, who don't want to do that, who don't want who don't know what uh, will appear on their website, they, I'm not sure if uh, it will bring money, uh, they don't know how to make money using this programmatic advertising. There are a lot of stories like that. So my question is quite easy. Shall the media use programmatic advertising when they have uh, traffic and it increases? What are the first steps that need to be done? I'm not a specialist in programmatic, uh, but uh, if we are talking about increasing traffic and switching to programmatic advertising, I think it won't have a huge effect because keyword blocking when content which is related to COVID-19 uh, doesn't include advertising or includes uh, advertising with lower CPM. It seems to me that I read in an interview with Suhir Musaiva that they had a similar uh, process uh, at Ukrainska Pravda when there was a spike in traffic. There was a, actually a decrease of revenues from advertising from banners. If it doesn't look uh, well on the website, well, I disagree with that. I think that any cool programmatic uh, advertising specialist might advise how to do that so it looks cool and uh, so it doesn't interfere with the user experience. If you turn on Google Advertising, this is actually, you are showed what you googled. This is your story. But there are other different networks that, all, uh, in addition to Google, that don't take, in, don't take into account what you Googled. The problem is that in order to take money, you, need, you shall have really high traffic. Only in this case, it will have sense in your PNL file. You shall have at least 10 million sessions per month, it seems to me, so it has any sense. If you have a website which has 1 million or 5 million sessions like that, potential revenue from programmatic will not be huge. Uh, this is not uh, because of the platform which dominates around the world, but because in Ukraine digital market is too small. There are no competition for advertising in Google or Facebook, for example, and the audience is huge. We have 20 or 25 million of uh, people who use internet. A big number of placements, but not a big number of competition for this. And this what has an impact for the price for each click on the ad. So the competition that is even present in Russia when they do not have a, a very big market, but their competition is much higher. And the site which has one million audience can already make money from the program, programmatic, unlike Ukraine. And this problem is, is more relevant for regions because lots of ad agencies, they have the ads only for big cities or Kiev. Click on the ad in Vinica will cost less than in Kiev. But I think Ria Media, they have monetization, right? Yes, absolutely. And offerings and some publishers sell 
it directly. But I agree with Guy that every brand now, every smart brand assesses this cost of contact. And with every crisis that we go through, s level of how smart of the market managers is their skills are growing. At the, at the end of the 2000, not so many managers, 10 years ago, not so many managers were paying attention at click or a value of um, the contact or lead generation. Maybe there, there was no even the term like this. And it all appeared because the brands had to uh, increase of ESR and um, and I think that uh, the media experts they have to cling to it and work with brands with corporate media in this direction but in the long term it's like uh, digging a grave because the brand who knows everything about digital is not going to go to media because it's it's not uh, uh, economically feasible yes i wanted to ask about long term perspective valery what do you think about small regional media of donbas and where we are all heading because it is obvious that a second, third, and fourth wave are approaching. We'll have other drops and more panic. And the newsrooms will have to work again with Zoom and others. And the motivation in the teams is decreasing. What would your advice be to the colleagues how to uh, go through October December. Well, it's too soon to speak about it, that it's going to be like this, but we ought to prepare for it. But regional media, they have, when there are many pages, and we all want to know about neighbor, our neighbors, due to this process, mostly regional media are working like this. When almost all organizations are not working, but media is still in its place because we can work remotely but in our processes we fully transferred sales department for the remote work but the editorial office kept on working so i would advise to have common meetings so people would show that we are working together we pr and we still communicate to have uh, to give a uh, uh, individual call to talk with each one of them maybe to think about at least what to, to have a meeting in the workplace at least once a week in the editorial office because no matter how much you know it, whatever we say but we are social beings and we are used to communicating a lot with people that's why we are to be given the possibility to do this but the regional media, they do not have many uh, the, many employees. It's some, usually up to 10 persons. So you have to organize at least um, two meetings, you know, when one meeting for five, with five people. And so you're saying to divide, to divide the team into groups so that they would not, that they would, would have the possibility to interact with each other and that would you know soothe them and charge them i think that's all because um, in the previous period of the lockdown that's what we did and we are happy with the result because uh, we did not have the outflow of our staff and people who had a goal to work and develop in this direction did not lose confidence in this work they did understand that there were challenges or difficulties, but they even f managed to find some pros, you know, because 
people are all used to be working in the company's organizations. Not all of them had the possibility to work remotely. But then when communicating with the neighbors, they found out that a lot of their friends or neighbors, they were fired, but they have the possibility to work from home. Uh, they, but they have work and they keep on making money. And maybe they need to hear this. This is the specifics of work that uh, gives you the possibility to work in the convenient format. So you didn't lose people, uh, I mean, your employees, you didn't lose traffic and didn't lose the ad agencies. No, we uh, lost, of course, money when, because when we were selling at for the site, that's where we lost. But, uh, but we managed to, uh, you know, to replace it. We found the way to interact with business to make it convenient for us and for them to see the result. The aim of this interaction, we often say, why should the business be interested or why should we be uh, interested advertising business? But it's weird. If the business is fine, they will have money to pay us. And if we build up the communication of business with us, with the audience in the right way through different platforms that the business will only have a plus because then they will be able to pay for our services even if the prices go high so this is in the long-term perspective it's not that we have to sell it now but we have to have a partnership relationship with business because when we understand that we are partners and we have a mutual benefit We have uh, companies that are with us for six years, and they are and such companies are more than seventy percent. So those that we have started working with are working with us for years. And the reason is because we give logical processes. We teach it, teach them how to make it right. They have some income. They see growth. And then the effect is the following: Why would they stop? working with us if they have money to pay for our services and to interact with us. I would like to add, go ahead, you said what's next, strategically speaking, that would be useful for our audience, for our participants. I think we need like a mini action plan out that would consist of three or five points. So first is to revise your strategy and to develop a bad scenario and good scenario. And it's not content strategy, no, 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 the organizational strategy, the script of your region, of your country, or to write it. And if you don't have it, then you are to create it. What if things go like this and if things go well? Secondly, I would also think about the decision of the on the processes of how we are going to work offline online with this team so to have a preparatory work third i would also communicate with all stakeholders all of them customers business partners team members uh, then shareholders if there are any and to also be aware of how they are preparing too so that we would know where everyone is going not you but all who go around you and then i would also check my product list and price list just having discussed it with all stakeholders we would know what's important now and what we have and what we don't need and then with a smile on my face meeting a new crisis go ahead if you have something to say okay no we still have five minutes do you have anything else to say like which strategies would you advise to the regional media uh, well I support guy but from my experience I see that not so many regional media have a clear strategy and understand who is a stakeholder in their organization. So it's a psychological step that must be made.
and it can make everything a lot clearer than it was before. From the point of view of content and distrib content distribution, all these processes which are ongoing right now, they will remain. So if we have a new wave or a new lockdown, this content or the base, the content uh, that was created in spring will be again relevant. And then you will have to create the new content that will also be relevant for the audience. And we will hope that that those media who are making on banners, they won't have such a drop because of keyword blocking. So the brands will somehow adapt to this new reality. So it, all we have now is going to keep on being relevant. Valeria, could you please make uh, give uh, the recommendations or advice to the regional media managers how on how they ought to enter this s second axis. You asked about whether or not there will be a panic. I don't think there will be a panic because uh, uh, first when uh, this uh, lockdown was introduced we were it was quite unexpected for us, but now we are expecting it. So I would like to say that we are discussing very progressive things on monetization, on the strategy, on the work of media managers. But it's worth understanding that local editorial offices, for them, it's mostly in theory. Yes, they are very progressive editorial offices, which are following the trends, not Ukrainian, not just Ukrainian trends, but also world trends for whom the word strategy and paywall is something significant, not from parallel reality. But at the same time, there are many editorial offices which are still slowly adapting to it all. And it seems to me any crisis moment is not only a challenge, but also a possibility. I would highly recommend the editors and media managers and often editor is managing the entire media project on the original level. So I would advise them to draw the focus of attention on some, uh, you know, education or training, not on the content production, but on editorial work and on managers work and address the issues that are usually, you know, postpone some work with the team or automatization of the process, automation of the processes, studying, adequate studying of ways of monetization and some strategy, some business strategy in new realities. So we, they focus that it's going to be at the end, the second wave will start at the end of the fall. So we have these weeks still or months when we still can improve a bit more, study something important, not to uh, repeat our mistakes. Thank you, Valeria. I, I, I hear that we have to stop. Thank you, dear friends. Uh, I think our key message to the regional media managers and journalists who would like to become regional media managers is to study and communicate with the colleagues who are experts at something, make calls with them, uh, trying to get all this information from them and to move fast, as fast as possible because business is very competitive and many threats, many mu much pressure, but many successful examples. Cool media managers are living uh, next to you who create cool media content. Please follow them and follow the Donbas media forums and create a cool Ukrainian journalism and uh, I'm sure it's going to be on its high. Thank you all.
Ежедневно на просторах интернета и на телевидении о COVID-19 появляется масса информации. Это топ-тема 2020 года. Информационные издания, телеканалы, радио, газеты не упускают возможности повысить рейтинги, часто переходя грань и нарушая стандарты журналистской этики и даже законы Украины. Засобы массовой информации, на жаль, дуже часто гоняючись за сенсационностью, за збільшенням глядачів, слухачів, читачів, вони намагалися нагнітати, так би мовити, ситуацію. І в тому числі, там, починаючи з публікації мапи з позначкою домів, де є закрилі люди, і закінчуючи там якимось іншим матеріалом. Як журналісти повинні працювати зі столь деликатними даними о людському здоров'ї в умовах епідемії? З однієї сторони, інформувати суспільство максимально обо всьому відбувальному, при цьому не нарушуючи прав людей, розглянемо далі. За полгода карантина в Україні, думаю, ви часто зустрічали новини про заболівших коронавірусом. Звісно, в цей доволі безпекний період ми хочемо знати як можна більше детальної інформації про випадках, щоб оградити себе від ризику. Але стоїть пам'ятати, що інформація про здоров'я людини – це частина його особистої життя. І Гражданський кодекс України гарантує право людини на тайну про стані його здоров'я. СМІ або інформаційні паблики будь-якого іншого характеру не мають права без передварительного згоди людини публікувати дані, о его заражении или тем более о его месте проживания. Как пример, публикация издания «Вести» с адресами по районам, которую осудили в независимом медийном совете Украины. В редакции издания утверждали, что получили списки из круга медиков, и если это так, то это еще одно нарушение. Медработники также не имеют права разглашать личные данные пациентов, как в случае с эпидемией COVID-19, так и в любой другой ситуации. Это врачебная тайна, и ее нарушение несет за собой криминальную ответственность. Не подлежит разглашению без предварительного согласия родственников и личная информация о человеке после его смерти, вследствие коронавируса или любой другой болезни. Наибольшее внимание СМИ, как правило, уделяют новостям о заражении коронавирусом публичных людей. Но они как раз таки и являются в некоторых случаях исключением из правил. Например, если подаваемая информация несет общественный интерес как предостережение заражения большого количества людей. Ну и к тому же публичные люди зачастую сами заявляют о своей болезни. Тем не менее, журналисту при публикации такой новости все равно стоит убедиться в правдивости данных и соблюдать журналистскую этику при написании текста, понимая, какие последствия может нести информация для публичного лица и его родных. Посадовая особа, яка має зустрічі, має так би мовити, менший захист, відповідно, і до практики Європейського суду з прав людини, менший захист щодо інформації про цю особу. Тобто про нього можна більше говорити. Про членів сім'ї цієї особи можна говорити виключно в тих випадках, коли це стосується безпосередньо виконання обов'язків цієї посудової особи. Чиновники или любые другие люди в публичной сфере, которые сложили свои полномочия, приравниваются к частным лицам, а значит публиковать информацию об их состоянии здоровья уже нельзя без предварительного согласия. В то же время не запрещено законом публиковать информацию о человеке, который несет угрозу обществу. Який уникає госпіталізації, порушує правила карантину, наражає на небезпеку оточуючих через те, що він не дотримується передбаченого законом режиму, тобто не зважаючи на те, що він є хворим на ковід, він все одно продовжує без маски, наприклад, заходити в магазин. Тобто це також є вже суспільно важливу інформацію. Если человек сообщает о своем заражении коронавирусом в социальных сетях, СМИ имеют право сделать из этого новость. Главное, сперва убедиться, что это не фейковый аккаунт, а настоящая страница человека. Первое, о чем должны помнить журналисты, что на них лежит огромная ответственность за информацию, которую они разглашают. Поэтому все должно быть тщательно проверено. И стоит отметить, что републикация личной информации о зараженных коронавирусом не освобождает издание от ответственности за нарушение закона. Можливо, журналисты уже перестали бачити в новинных приводах людей, але хочу нагадати, що це все ж таки люди, які продовжують жити далі після цього інформаційного матеріалу. Матеріали про ковід – це дуже чутлива тема. І якщо неправильно, нераціонально, незаконно якось нанести просто можна шкоду дуже великої людині… 
Еще больше интересных роликов смотрите на нашем YouTube канале. Чтобы их не пропустить, подписывайтесь и нажмите колокольчик. И давайте уважать личные границы друг друга. До встречи! Ежедневно на просторах интернета и на телевидении...
Пригадайте свій сюжет, статтю або програму, яка допомогла вирішити проблему читача або глядача. Що першим спадає на думку? Можливо, яма на дорозі, яку після вашого матеріалу все-таки відремонтували. Переселенці, які не мали житла і завдяки вашій статті змогли його отримати. Або ситуація, коли порушені права людини були відновлені після вашого сюжету. Я пам'ятаю, що під час парламентських виборів ми знімали дівчину з інвалідністю, яка не мала доступу до своєї виборчої дільниці, тому що вона була на другому поверсі, на другий тур. Після нашого сюжету і змінили місце голосування. Часто такі матеріали стосуються соціальних прав і свобод, медичного обслуговування, умов праці, соціальних виплат та допомоги. Ці права гарантуються Конституцією України та міжнародними договорами, зокрема, Європейською соціальною хартією. Насправді, зовсім нещодавно були оприлюднені висновки Європейського комітету соціальних прав щодо виконання Україною взятих на себе зобов'язань за Європейською соціальною хартією переглянутою. І висновки є надзвичайно цікавими. Вони констатують і факти порушень Україною тих чи інших зобов'язань, зокрема, що стосується стосуються низки соціальних виплат, які є численними, проте не завжди ефективними. Соціальні права – це базові права людини. Їхнє порушення може негативно впливати на людей, соціум та країну в цілому. Та чи достатньо уваги ми, журналісти, приділяємо висвітленню цієї теми? З одного боку, може здатись, що соціальна тематика – це неважливо, як її зазвичай звикли називати, це соціалка, про те, в кого протік дах, де яка ямка на дорозі, чи куди люди не можуть там доїхати, не знаю, громадським транспортом, але насправді це все набагато глобальніше. І це те, що турбує кожного з нас. Кожна людина має знати, які обов'язки держави перед нею щодо забезпечення тих чи інших прав. І мені здається, що саме медіа відіграють ключову роль у тому, щоб донести цю інформацію до кожної людини. Керівниця проєкту Ради Європи розвиток соціальних прав людини як ключовий чинник сталої демократії в Україні Сюзанна Мнацаканян наголошує, є 31 базове соціальне право людини і поки що уваги як регіональне, так і загальнонаціональних ЗМІ до цієї проблематики недостатньо. Набагато більше зараз медіа приділяють увагу рішенням Європейського суду з прав людини. Але не потрібно забувати про висновки Європейського комітету соціальних прав, тому що там є дуже багато цікавого матеріалу та фактажу, які можна використати для того, щоб зробити і такі розслідування. Дуже важливо, щоб ЗМІ приділяли належну увагу висвітленню питань, пов'язаних з соціальними правами. Крім того, при підготовці таких матеріалів журналістам особливу увагу експерти рекомендують приділяти чутливій лексиці. Однак, чи можна зберегти в такому випадку зацікавленість читача? Цього року на Донбас медіафорумі будуть озвучені слушні поради щодо висвітлення соціальних прав місцевими і національними ЗМІ.
Доброго дня усім. Дякую, що приєдналися. Hello everyone, thank you for joining our, our discussion on gender-focused journalism, standards and guidelines of ethical reporting on violence against women. We are the Mass Media Forum, supported by UN Women. My name is Elizabeth Kuzmenko, I am head of NGO Women in Media Association. I would like to represent you our speakers today. This is Alexandra Horchinska, journalist at Novoye Vremya UA. And we also have with us Marina Ridzic, TV anchor, Al Jazeera Balkans, Bosnia. And we also have Mila Moralic, number one reporter, CNN affiliate in Croatia. So let's check our connection. Can you hear us? Marina, Mila, can you hear us? Hello? Can you hear us? Marina, Mila, can you please say if you can hear us? Because we have online uh, broadcasting, you can leave your comments in the comments se uh, section. I would really like to hear our speakers from Bosnia and uh, Croatia, Mila and Marina. Can you hear us, Marina, Mila? Okay, when I announced uh, the name of our discussion, the title of our discussion, Gender Focused Journalism, I thought that it sounds like it's a separate uh, type of journalism, like there is decision journalism or investigative journalism, though in my opinion, gender-focused journalism shall be one of uh, the standards, just as, as just as telling the truth from the, uh, the facts from the comments. So, Sasha, I would like to ask you to share your opinion on what is gender-focused journalism for you. Well, in my opinion, this is not a separate part of journalism. This is not a guideline. This is a guideline uh, on supporting gender balance, uh, balance of thoughts. It seems to me that gender-focused journalism can be a part of all the other types of journalism. Okay, talking about Novoye Vremya, do you have those standards in your daily work? We try to follow these standards. We try to avoid hate speech, for example. We want to try to be objective and advised. So probably you have uh, gone through a special trainings to do that, to enrich your terminology. Well, yes, of course, every journalist uh, undergoes uh, individual or group trainings. I've been to many trainings uh, in Ukraine and abroad, which were dedicated to how to write on uh, vulnerable topics about vulnerable and fragile groups of population and what terminology to use. While we check uh, connection with our speakers, I would like to ask you, you had an interesting reporting which is called I told everyone about sex that we haven't had it was about uh, stalker and I was surprised that you were telling about threats about harassment in this article and you say that uh, these women were victims to psychological violence when you were telling this story you tried to be uh, as sensitive as possible when working with this topic why do you think that this that the media shall explain what kind of uh, violence it is yes of course the media shall explain what kind of violence it is because not everyone understands that uh, there is such thing as psychological violence for many people violence is only when uh, women or people are raped uh, and threatened well, we also know that there is economic violence when, for example, a husband or, or a wife confiscates all the salary from their partners. It's also violence, economic violence. Uh, there is also digital violence. Well, this is about Internet, right? Yes, uh, cyber threats, uh, different 
uh, different pigs sent. This is like a porn revenge, right? Okay, tell us more about this story, which you described on the Novo Evremia website. What kind of stalkers they were? I think uh, the story of a stalker was the most interesting. This was uh, the guy who told that uh, he followed, threatened uh, uh, his former girlfriend because he wanted more attention, he wanted her to forgive him, he wanted her back. But there were also stories uh, of the victims of stalk stalking. There was a story of a woman and of a man who were victims these were stories of uh, people who suffered from psychological and moral pressure and violence uh, from their ex-partners. They followed uh, on the streets, uh, those people evaded them near their houses, uh, they threatened them. Usually the stalkers use uh, the so-called carrot and stick trick. They write you a message about how much they love you, they ask to forgive them, they say that uh, they won't do uh, those bad things ever again, and when the victim doesn't uh, want to forgive this person, they start threatening, they say, I will meet you on the street, I will kill you. Uh, what was uh, the idea? Why did you decide to talk about this topic? Well, I had a personal story similar to that. How easy it was for you to find victims, to find those women who suffered violence and were eager to talk about it. I wrote a post on Facebook that I was looking uh, for people who could tell their story. There were more than three people who agreed to talk, but their stories, uh, uh, one uh, woman um, uh, refused to talk, uh, didn't want us to publish her story, uh, so there are a lot of people like that, but not all of them are eager to share it publicly. Did you publish the names of uh, these uh, women? No, they wanted to uh, wanted me to share their names. They wanted to remain anonymous. They were just their names. Okay, I just want to to ask you. Of course, you collected comments from these women victims to the violence. But why did you decide to take the opportunity for the stalker to comment? Because you provide a platform for a person who does, who is involved in violence. It seems like you enforced his position. I wanted to uh, understand his motivation. Uh, the victims didn't know what to do, but the person who actually did it, I wanted to hear his position, I wanted to understand why he did what he did, I wanted to understand whether he understood that what he did was wrong. I'm asking you because uh, when I see uh, reporting on uh, LGBT events such as Kiev Pride, I see that journalists try to be to invite, uh, for example, C14 nationalist group to comment on that, to provide balance. Do you think that is, this balance is adequate because they spread hate speech? It seems to me that it depends on the person and on the message which are uh, uh, translated by this person. If it is an adequate person who tries to uh, adequately explain its position rather than uh, yelling uh, slogans or telling propaganda. And it's also very important that there are no calls to violence. This position shall be neutral. There shall not be any uh, calls to violence. And I see that we have other colleagues from Bosnia and Croatia Marina and Mila. Hi, can you hear us now? Uh, thank you for joining us. We would like to hear cases from Bosnia and Croatia from other foreign experts. So I would like to give floor to Marina Ridžić, TV anchor, Al Jazeera Balkans, 
She's also an expert in communications and she has more than 10 years of experience. Uh, right now, Marina is a TV anchor at Al Jazeera and uh, her uh, reporting is focused on uh, these topics. And um, I would like to say that uh, I entitled one short presentation for your audience, uh, short news without a broader context. Uh, it's actually a presentation of your audience to find more data from Bosnia and Herzegovina, and uh, maybe they can track online if they would like to find uh, more ideas uh, what's going on in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and how we are, as reporters, deal with uh, gender issues and, and gender-based violence. Uh, it's important actually to say that um, we cover gender-based violence on a daily basis, uh, which is a positive indicator, but um, it's very important to understand in which manner uh, reporters and media uh, see these issues and, and our responsibility as, a, let's say, public persons in process of starting a broader conversation and, of course, discussion of violence against uh, women as a social problem. Um, it's also very maybe important to, to underline in the beginning of the discussion that uh, finding from uh, 2017, uh, it was a huge research conducted by the UN Women team here in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, they uh, analyze more than 500 media content and they found that there is no sufficient attention regarding this issue. And very uh, important, there is a lot of unethical uh, reporting on sensitive cases in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, also, that conclusion brings us to the reality where media do not initiate topic of uh, violence against women. Uh, it's more about uh, feeling crimes and accidents chronicle uh, than open broader discussion and report thematically about uh, many cases in, in my country and of course in this region. Um, it's also very interesting to say that one in three in Bosnia and Herzegovina think that men should show who is the boss to uh, his partner. So media reporting just uh, reflects the situation as it is. And I would like to always explain that media are just a mirror of our society. So uh, probably media persons should more uh, question stereotypes in our reports. And we have to remind ourselves uh, what is the mission of, of good journalism. Um, for the beginning of this discussion, I would like to underline that one in two women in Bosnia and Herzegovina is a victim of some kind of uh, gender-based violence from the age of 15. Um, and statistics reached by the analysis I have already mentioned show that male journalists, it's very interesting, more often uh, write about specific examples of violence against women, while female journalists uh, go more in depth. Uh, and uh, female journalists write more about uh, uh, that issue as a topic uh, in the longer form, which clearly uh, is important and female journalists recognize uh, that concept. Um, it's very important to uh, question what is media and uh, editorial role uh, in, in uh, our newsroom, because we know that editors uh, could decide uh, about headline, about position, about size or story, and of course about angle, how we are reporting about specific case. Um, maybe it's important for further discussion to analyze uh, what can we do and what online communities such as bloggers, uh, influencers, to do in preventing and uh, advocating for uh, uh, better treatment and prevention of violence against women. Um, unfortunately, as you have already mentioned, there, is, there, there are a lot of needs and uh, different perspectives on domestic violence. And uh, I could share with you one uh, recent case uh, where uh, uh, originally, massive girl originally from Bosnia, uh, she was beaten with severe con consequences by her parents. She had a few broken ribs. Uh, they shaved her uh, head just because she was dating with a boy originally from Serbia. And why that uh, was interesting for me, because I could track two stories uh, in French media, because everything happened actually in French, uh, all of them live there, and in Bosnian media. In French media, uh, we could find relevant information um, from official sources, sound bites also from um, 
police, from hospital, from psych uh, psychologists, uh, social worker, etc. But in Bosnian media, um, focus was uh, on on their differences uh, based on religious, and uh, I was terrified by by comments of readers below the fact where they actually support parents to uh, uh, save her from from her enemy. Uh, just for your understanding, uh, 25 years after the war in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, for majority, it's completely unacceptable to have a couple with mixed religious background. So uh, this case uh, could uh, uh, show us that among many triggers, uh, nationalism also could be a trigger for, for domestic violence in the post-conflict zone. Um, what is also interesting to uh, see when we are looking into uh, media landscape and media reporting in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, many actors of stories about violence against women are mainly uh, perpetrators. And I would argue that women are almost invisible in daily newspapers when compared to men. And especially, uh, it's, it's very sad to say that uh, women survivors uh, also cannot be heard, uh, heard in, in uh, Bosnian media. Um, other aspect of this story is that large number of women do not perceive themselves as a victims of violence. So uh, that is why like almost 60% of women who were exposed to physical violence, they claim that they are not victims of uh, physical violence. They don't understand that concept of, of violence. And the percentage is even higher when we talk about uh, different type of violence, such as psychological, uh, economic or cyber violence. And cyber violence is, is growing in my country, and uh, it's particularly damaging because uh, it cannot be prosecuted as a criminal offense under the laws governing prevention and protection under uh, gender-based violence in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And a good example of this could be uh, a series of media content, uh, so-called Sheikh from Alipashino. He posted a video recorded harassment of his former girlfriend uh, on YouTube, and it took several months uh, until YouTube uh, deletes, deletes that content. So maybe for now, uh, I open a lot of issues and try to target uh, key points uh, from my presentation. Of course, in broader discussion, I would like to hear maybe from you uh, what topics need more coverage, because as I said, majority of media coverage in uh, Bosnia um, is connected with uh, a physical violence and psychological, economic, and other type of violence are, full, are completely under shadow. And uh, how can media and, of course, media persons be more actively involved in the prevention? Because I know that media people cannot uh, uh, completely help to uh, domestic violence and gender-based violence disappear. But probably this is also a great platform to uh, share some experience and to find more how we could play an active role and help to uh, have a better numbers and, and better cases in our countries in the next few years. Дякую Марину за досвід Боснії. Він дуже схожий на досвід України, і ми те про що ми говорили з Сашою на початку. For sharing your experience from Bosnia and what we were discussing with Sasha in the beginning. In media, they started speaking more about violence and gender-based violence against women, but still such topic as psychological and economical violence are not uh, covered fully, and they are worth talking about more. I would like to hear about the experience uh, uh, from uh, Marina uh, Mila Moralic, and she is the reporter uh, at N1, which is the CNN affiliate. And before that, she was the executive uh, director of Croatian National Agency of Radio News. Mila, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, everyone. And thank you for this great opportunity to share my thoughts and experience on this uh, very important issue. Uh, what I would like to emphasize is, in the beginning, is that I have uh, almost now 20 years of experience in uh, as a working journalist. So what I think is crucial in Croatia's, uh, in Croatia's background and dealing with this subject is to, is to find this um, thin line. It's still very thin, but you can feel it uh, before and after EU membership. I think uh, that this was uh, kind of a line that transformed the Croatian society in many different ways 
uh, and also when we talk about uh, how we deal with violence, how we, uh, how we cope uh, as a society with these issues, and especially in our, uh, in our line of business, how we as journalists are uh, covering it. So overall, I would say that in the last uh, seven years since Croatia has been a member, things have improved a lot. Uh, also, this additional step was uh, signing and ratifying the Istanbul Convention, with which we also uh, were dealing as a society, as I know that it was the situation in Ukraine. Uh, but uh, finally, it was signed and ratified, and it, uh, of course, didn't have much to do with the media, but with the justice system. And uh, there were some significant changes uh, in the way uh, that the police and the Justice Department is dealing with uh, Crime, crime against women, uh, and uh, crime within family. Uh, I would say that one of the also the most important things that happened in uh, Croatia regarding this issue within the last couple of years was the media code uh, that was accepted by all relevant uh, 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 media outlets in Croatia, all television, all uh, news outlets, which are defining on um, how uh, to uh, report on violence against uh, women and domestic violence with, uh, with more sensitivity and uh, 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 with more uh, aspect towards the victim. So we have defined protocols within our newsrooms on how we deal with these issues, which I think is very important. Although we have to be fair and say that it is not always that it is not always that we do things uh, uh, by the book and uh, sometimes there is a lot of pressure, a lot of editorial pressure, a lot of peer pressure, I would say, from different media, but still uh, this is something that we need to take into account and that most uh, serious and responsible media in Croatia have adopted and uh, are doing it uh, by the book. Uh, I would like to mention two big cases in Croatia that have kind of uh, uh, touched into the into the minds and hearts of the public and that have made some, uh, I would say, milestone changes. Uh, one was a case of violence in, uh, in a bar in a little town called Zadar on the coast where a significantly older uh, partner of a 18-year-old girl uh, basically uh, beat her up in a way that her face was unrecognizable. And he did it in a, in a bar in front of people with uh, his friends and the owners of the bar uh, turning up the volume of the music so that uh, uh, up here in the street uh, so that the neighbors didn't call the police and everything was caught on camera. Uh, this was a very important case because in the first, uh, in the first I, I, I always put this reporting in two phases. Uh, first was the first 24 hours where everything comes out uh, uncensored, and this is the most critical time. Uh, in this period of, of time, we had this footage, we didn't publish that, but some media did. We had this footage, we had this video, and it was all over the place. It was a kind of a trigger that, uh, 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 that, that made the public very sensitive towards this issue. And after this first 24 hours where everything kind of cooled down and uh, uh, there weren't so uh, everything with the footage and the, the videos were, were, were uh, put out of the public space, but the information was already there and uh, the identity of the victim wasn't already known, but it was a small town. So uh, uh, it wasn't out in the public space, but everybody knew about it. And the crucial in this, uh, in this situation was uh, the girl's mother who was communicating with with the media and with the journalists and uh, who turned out to be a very brave woman who uh, managed to understand what was going on and how important on one hand is to protect her daughter, which is of, of course the most important thing in this situation. Uh, and the second one to uh, kind of channel all this information that was going on and that was very, very important uh, uh, in the way that to come out. Um, after this, uh, this was some time ago, so uh, I don't want to go into much detail, but 
we had protests on the street. Uh, we had very uh, uh, important and serious um, associations and organizations uh, uh, checking into this uh, uh, into this case. We had a situation where, where it was a, practically the first time uh, that people within that bar were prosecuted for not reacting. Uh, we had uh, other people who were uh, um, witnesses were uh, prosecuted for false or for stating false statements about this case. So it was kind of a milestone. The other one, not to go into too, uh, too many details, was also um, a case of a rape within a very important uh, uh, public government government owned uh, company in which the molester was uh, a member of the ruling party with very good connection and the victim was uh, a mother of two kids and she i think is the bravest person that i came across in my in my uh, life work in the in, uh, in, in as i said almost 20 years of experience uh, she decided to come out with a story and uh, it turned out that it of course as it usually is я хочу тільки буквально уточнити, доповнити ваші слова. Influencers, actors, singers, um, who also organized the protest and used uh, uh, their public appearance to to, to start changing things. And uh, it was kind of interesting because, on the one hand, uh, they uh, they managed to change something, and on the other hand, they were uh, normal enough or smart enough. To, to put it to a certain level and they say okay this is not we we made we opened the public space for you but now please come and uh, 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 they, they called it to the to the NGOs and to the uh, judiciary system and they said okay so now you're coming in and we had some significant changes uh, to the to the laws uh, uh, and uh, of course to um, changes of the laws into the judiciary and the police system, which was very, very Milo, thanks so much for sharing your experience. I would like to clarify, you were talking about a protocol. As far as I understand, this is a protocol on uh, N1 TV channel. What does this protocol regulate? Can you elaborate on that? You told something about protocol protocol is this something that you follow on your channel the news on how we deal with this subject um, one of the most important things is that it states that in any of these cases, when we talk about uh, uh, this type of reporting, it is not important to be first. It is not about being the first, uh, and it encourages uh, editorial uh, editorial boards and journalists to have two or three, if necessary, staff meetings uh, uh, when dealing with a subject. It, it cannot only be up to one person if we're going to publish the, uh, the topic or not. Uh, the other things, uh, the other uh, step is it analyzes very, very, and it scrutinizes every step that needs to be taken. You need to uh, contact the police, of course, you need to contact the social services. Uh, everything that uh, has to do with minors cannot come out with names. Uh, uh, then it also uh, states very, uh, uh, very strongly the victim's perspective, you need to warn the victim, which I think is very, very uh, important. Um, you as a journalist, you need to warn the victim uh, what media exposure is going gonna, is gonna to bring to her. So it is your duty to explain, because victims usually they're disappointed in the, in the police, they're disappointed in the 
judicial system and they come to journalism. But it is also our responsibility to tell them, okay, we'll, let's do this, but media exposure, media exposure is going to bring you this, this, and that. Uh, also, it states uh, that you have to stay supportive because your relationship with the victim uh, doesn't end when the story is out. It has to go on and it encourages uh, journalists, uh, journalists to stay in touch and uh, regarding a certain protocol, uh, uh, talk about uh, if problems come out again, uh, then who you should contact. Again, the police, the judicial system, and the social services. Uh, if something comes out in that way, this is, I think, the most the most important thing. Thank you, Milo. I think that. Thanks so much, Mila. I think that we need such protocols in every media, in every editorial office, because right now we have only very general editorial standards. Uh, probably we have uh, a code of uh, journalist ethics uh, where there are eight uh, points uh, which tell us about the balance of thoughts, which include for, uh, but they don't include a step-by-step -step instruction on what to do, how to talk, for example, with victims of violence. I would like to mention one more case which happened in Ukraine. This is a so-called Kaharlik case when uh, there was uh, violence uh, in uh, the uh, police uh, office of the Kaharlik, of the city of Kaharlik. As you remember, a lot of the media wrote and uh, about uh, this woman, they uh, even mentioned their name and uh, her name and her story, her address, uh, her, uh, about her family, uh, and they even wrote about her child. Uh, even at major TV channels, uh, TSN and OnePlus One, there was uh, a reporter which was named How Does the Victim Feel? Uh, there was an outrage uh, on behalf of the journalist community and uh, population. Why were you talking about how the victim of the violence feel like, but why we are not exposing uh, those violent actions uh, uh, from the part of the police? I would like to ask our speakers, uh, where is uh, this uh, thin line between uh, the public interest and the right to privacy? Well, I think that first uh, we need to ask first uh, the victims, so those people who were victims of domestic violence, whether they are ready to uh, tell their story, whether they are ready uh, their names so their personal data to be published in the media. I think it is uh, we need to be very careful when we are talking about uh, small settlements or villages or small towns where everyone knows everyone and uh, when disclosing such personal information might harm the victim even more. Thanks so much, Sasha. We were also discussing the fact that we need to use uh, Terminology, uh, specific terminology, we shall not use such terms as a victim. We should uh, tell that this, uh, this is a woman who survived the violence. So maybe our foreign colleagues uh, have comments on this particular case when a woman was raped in a uh, police, police office in uh, Kaharlik. How would you react? I would ask uh, probably uh, Mila Moralic to comment on that. My question was the following. Uh, there was a case in Ukraine when policemen uh, raped a woman. Of course, we need to tell about that, but where is the line, the limit between uh, the right of the people to know about this crime and uh, the victims, the need to protect the victim? Uh, how similar cases are solved uh, in your country? Always the greatest uh, ethical dilemma and always that thin line that you need to approach uh, very, very, uh, very, very carefully. Because if you publish a news saying uh, a woman was raped in a police station, you, did, you didn't do anything. You, you, you didn't give, you didn't give enough information. You didn't make, you didn't make an impact. 
Uh, of course, on the other side, you have to be very careful with uh, disclose, disclosing any personal any personal information. So I think the more the more you um, uh, the more information you get, the more uh, you make the story. Um, uh, 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 the more information around the story that you can get, that you can put it into into one uh, one whole, uh, is the better. And what I always emphasize in these cases. It is not uh, uh, how you uh, talk about a certain case. It's how you uh, how you deal with these issues, even when nothing nothing is going on. Uh, uh, how you use the information, how you use the statistics, and uh, how you make uh, good and important stories and show uh, uh, where the uh, 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 where the thin lines are uh, in the police and in the judiciary system. That need to be dealt with. It doesn't need only to be uh, when something happens. Uh, it has to be also uh, when nothing is going on, when there is no similar case. Uh, these are the topics that we need to talk uh, about on, I would say, weekly basis in, in, the, in the main media. Thank you, Mila. The same question for Marina Ridic. How do we combine our journalistic duty and protect a woman who suffers from violence? Mute. Could you hear me right now? Talk. I press the mute uh, button. Hopefully, uh, uh, you can hear me. So. Uh, first of all, I believe that uh, we should have uh, that idea that as a journalist, we should uh, stand for uh, women who survive. And uh, your comment on gender-based uh, language is such an important issue. We cannot maybe here discuss because we, are, we don't uh, share the same languages. But still, uh, there is a, a lot of differences uh, when you report in gender-sensitive way. And when you just copy paste from uh, mainstream media and don't protect uh, uh, women or a woman who, who was subjected by the violence. Um, this case from Ukraine remind me on one case from 2017 from Banyaluka, is the second biggest city in my country. Uh, and everything happened uh, in the morning in uh, one block, uh, mur murder and suicide. Uh, let's say nothing special, but still, a uh, man who, uh, who killed his ex-wife uh, was with police background and as a media, repo uh, media reporters couldn't find any additional detail about that case. And what was problematic that uh, media started reporting on uh, the case of family tragedy uh, immediately without many uh, information and especially without relevant information from relevant okay, sources. Sorry. No, no, no. Um, judging by media reports, uh, that couple was divorced and men couldn't cope with, with divorce. So uh, following an argument uh, to which uh, her neighbors allegedly uh, testified, uh, several gunshots were heard, and after he murdered the woman, uh, he uh, shot himself and died on the way to hospital. So what is problematic here? First of all, definition of the topic uh, and interpretation by media. Uh, it was, let's say, a typical sensational story, like we have a gunshot in the morning and uh, two people because of love, they are, they are uh, dead right now. Uh, issue of privacy, immediately, all online portals, uh, uh, portals reported their names, uh, their address, their backgrounds, but uh, uh, everything was based on, on uh, neighbors' testimonies. And that's also problematic because we could read about uh, their whole life uh, from mouth of neighbors and we couldn't find who is uh, in charge of that story or who speaks and how because in media they protected uh, neighbors uh, names and, and backgrounds. And it's really hard to find here gender-based uh, violence uh, point of view. And as a reporter, I was thinking, okay, what we should do now? Because uh, all portals uh, published everything. And uh, we as a, Auxira Balkans is a part of international Auxira Media Network. Uh, we have also strong protocols and editorial guidelines. And uh, we should track that story, but we cannot stand out and wait for some official information. So there is a huge dilemma. 
what we should do because uh, uh, public, our readers and viewers, they have already uh, know uh, what happened and uh, who died. But still, we we were uh, we would like to wait until officials said uh, what really happened. And official was completely blind on our uh, requests, and they were somehow protect uh, a member of his team, even though he was uh, uh, murdered. Thank you, Marina. So, if I understand right, Thank you, Marina. So if I understand right, that in your channel you also have a protocol that Mila has mentioned that says on how you are to report about gender-based violence. When was it created and uh, do all employees comply with it? And is it always because Al Jazeera is a part of the bigger holding or in small editorial offices? of Bosnia, they also have such protocols in place. Yes, we are part of a global media network. And of course, we try to uh, track guidelines from our headquarters, uh, from uh, Doha, from Qatar and DC, uh, Washington DC. Uh, but uh, sometimes it's really hard to put all uh, guidelines and different terminology into Balkans uh, environment because we have our specific, uh, let's say, rules and way of uh, reporting, but it's really clear what is true and what is not true. When we talk about protocol, I have to uh, admit that we don't have a gender-based protocol. Uh, it's not a strict rules for uh, such stories and issues that we have already discussed, but there is uh, a lot of guidelines and uh, ideas how to uh, uh, stay on the positive side, how to protect your source, how to check your sources. We need at least two sides of stories every single day. So it's not just that we try to follow some uh, news or, or some information from local uh, platforms, uh, because they are really, uh, from time to time, they are really quick. They try to uh, uh, attract more uh, readers and they use uh, a woman who uh, were subjected to violence just a way to attract their, their viewers and uh, sens sensationalism is the best way to sell your story. So Al Jazeera style is completely different. We try to uh, manage our work more uh, uh, reporting in depth, more researching about topic and put that into a broader context, context into uh, some kind of exploring that phenomena it's not uh, just about one case. One case is always a trigger or a way where we try to find more about many several cases or uh, try to uh, connect different attitudes, uh, conservative uh, opinions or uh, traditional behavior in our society and to emphasize and uh, put on the stage uh, how we uh, deal with uh, gender violence and how maybe uh, we try to, uh, from time to time, forget that, uh, as I said, one in two women in Bosnia are suffering from violence uh, in their lifetime. Thanks so much, Marina. As we have a, a commission on journalism ethics, so this is a self-regulation body which promptly reacts to this Kaharlik case. Uh, they published a report uh, on this. They condemned uh, the situation, uh, the covering of the story in the media and they provided their recommendations on how to stick to and how to stick uh, to the standards of journalism. Do you have any self-regulation authorities in Bosnia and Croatia uh, that might to make decisions on whether uh, the articles published by the media might be wrong. Maybe Marina, we can start with you. So uh, we try to follow different guidelines from officials from uh, six different countries in the Balkans region. And uh, from time to time, it's hard to even get uh, proper advice from officials because um, they are more focusing on uh, 
they work with NGOs, with safe house, with uh, some kind of platform, platforms for protecting uh, women. And uh, from my experience, I could say uh, they see very often media as a, as an enemy, as somebody who will publish a story without consequences and without, as Mila mentioned, some kind of relationship with, with uh, survivors, with uh, maybe her family. But uh, from my experience, that's really not true. Uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we have a divided political system. So uh, even a different, uh, different institutions are also divided between a federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, it's one part, and Republic of Srpska, it's another part. So both of them, um, both entities actually, have uh, offices who take care on state level, on entity level, and of course on canton level uh, on gender-based uh, issues, reporting and etc. Marino, uh, I have just but I'm not sure that. that... Uh, uh, Marina, can 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 I please ask you to clarify this question? Can I please uh, repeat the question? We are talking about uh, self-regulation bodies inside the media community that might uh, evaluate the work of uh, other journalists, like a media council in Europe. Do you have something like that? No, no. Tak, media council. we don't have a media council, at least in Bosnia and Herzegovina on the state level. There is a different uh, association and, and a uh, way of uh, uh, interconnection of, of media on different levels, but on the state level, we don't have that, unfortunately. Thank you so much for sharing your experience. So the same question to Mila, do you have any self-regulating bodies in your country and how efficient are they? Of, uh, of profession. So we have a, a professional a journalist association that uh, everyone can uh, turn to if they feel that their uh, their rights have been uh, uh, done, done wrong by a member of the media. And also we as members, we need to, uh, to follow their protocols and their codes and their ethics uh, when it comes to, uh, to reporting about sensitive subjects. On the other hand, we have uh, something called the um, like a council for electronic media. It's different for print and different for uh, electronics. And we can have, uh, our uh, publishers can have huge uh, fines uh, if, we, uh, uh, if we don't do something uh, by the book. But I think that um, most uh, importantly, uh, uh, within, within our own companies, uh, certain protocols that, uh, uh, that are being guided, and I would say, daily, especially on television, uh, daily uh, contact with our uh, lawyers and uh, with our uh, people who are uh, uh, dealing with this subject is whether we can do something or we uh, cannot, cannot do something or cannot publish something. It's against the rules. It's, it's not by the book. We're not going to publish it. So not only on my uh, the television that I work for, uh, but also other Croatian commercial televisions, especially when it comes to their investigative uh, uh, broadcasts, uh, which are very popular in Croatia. Um, it's lawsuits almost every day, and it's daily communication with the, with the lawyers uh, uh, about what to do. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, and Sasha, I would also like to ask you, that there is this project which is called Women's History, and uh, within this project, you write about different women. Can you please tell us more about this project? Yes, of course. This project uh, started six months ago. It started in July and it will last until the end of this year. This project is devoted to women of different professions, of different sectors, which are not considered uh, feminine, so-called feminine, for example, uh, these are people, uh, these are women uh, who work in the mines, uh, this is uh, pilots, or these are women welders, and so on. So these are professions which are usually considered uh, male. 
uh, there is uh, Ukrainian Olhaschuk, who is considered the strongest woman on the planet and who can lift uh, weights like 300 kilograms. So these are women who work in spheres which are considered not feminine. These might be such uh, professions as welder or these are uh, largely male-dominated sectors. Uh, we are exposing discrimination, gender-based stereotypes about attitude of their families and friends to their uh, occupations. Uh, what f challenges do you face when you prepare report, uh, reporting on these women? Well, probably the most difficult is that some women are actually don't they don't understand that they have problems. They say that they have never uh, faced any discrimination personally, that everything is okay, but at the same time they tell about this discrimination. For example, if we are talking about an interview with a female pilot, a woman pilot, she said that she doesn't feel any discrimination, everything is okay, everything is normal, in her opinion. He says so that uh, he, she has a good team, but when we take a look at the statistics in this company, among 300 pilots, so there are only three women pilots, and two all of them are on maternity leave. So we do see that there is uh, a kind of inequality. And when you talk to these women, so they say that there is no discrimination, no stereotypes, uh, I was active and I managed to achieve success. Do you provide uh, expert opinions for the balance of opinions? Or probably you explain yourself that there is discrimination and we need to talk about that. Or you just uh, publish it as an interview. Uh, yes, we publish those uh, stories and an interview. That is why we don't see, we don't have any expert opinions or probably uh, I can add my comments or statistics or any data which attest to the fact that there is some inequality in this sphere. And when speaking about standards and ethics of highlighting crimes against women, perhaps uh, some journalists uh, are watching our discussion now and would like to also start writing, highlighting crimes against women. What are the three tips you could give these journalists, Sash? Well, first of all, it's the advice that uh, touches work on any topics, uh, vulnerable topics, including gender, topic, it's to always respect the interests of another person, not to forget about confidentiality and anonymity. When the person is asking not to show his or her face, not to specify their name, then you are to do that. And I think you do not also turn these topics into scandals or something sensational do not chase after uh, you know big news and not uh, what not not to do something that the yellow press does so you have to it should be just your material but not the sensational material Yes, because it's about the trust of the audience. Marina, what would you advise to the beginners who only start highlighting crimes against women? What would your three tips would have been for them? Even though you are experienced journalists or you are a student and you would like to explore more about this topic, I need, I probably uh, would like to uh, find more training on this topic uh, and somehow find a way to improve my knowledge and my editor, uh, editor's knowledge about uh, gender sensitive reporting. Uh, also, we need to uh, collect uh, more contacts of relevant institutions and of persons who could maybe uh, be the best way to explore uh, some issues uh, in th this regard. Uh, it's important to build relationship between NGOs, between uh, relevant institutions and between journalists and be more open in, ta in uh, 
in order to uh, sharing proper information and to follow some guidelines. Um, always it's good to uh, use some specific case to open broader discussion, to investigate it more, and of course to uh, cover violence against women as a, a social problem, not just case by case. Um, and of course, uh, it's very important to not publish uh, disturbing content and use uh, uh, names, uh, protect their privacy, uh, and do not present all details because sometimes it's really hard to escape from uh, uh, top stories. And we shared a lot of them during just one hour, but still it's really important to follow up uh, any single case and try to help uh, not just that victim, but all over the world uh, to, to girls and women to understand what is violence actually and how each of them could be heard, could be visible and could uh, raise uh, their voice to uh, manage uh, this issue in our societies. Thank you, Marino and Mila, please. Mila, now the floor is yours. Mila, can you hear us? Your three tips. I would say that the biggest problem in reporting about these issues is finding someone to talk. If the victim is the one who's talking, um, be sure that you uh, be honest and you be fair and you be frank and don't cheat. And if you're going to blur her face, you're going to blur her face. If she doesn't want to uh, uh, come out with her name, there is not, don't publish. Uh, uh, other important informations which, which can reveal her identity. Just be, uh, uh, be, be fair, be fair to the victim. If the victim doesn't want to talk, then you have a problem. You need to find somebody else who is talking in her, uh, uh, on her behalf. Uh, um, uh, uh, I would say that there is enough of NGOs and enough of uh, experts that deal with, uh, with uh, uh, violence these days. You can always find a similar case and then uh, uh, get a, a spokesperson of the NGO or a, a person who is really experienced in that, in that to talk about a similar case if you cannot tackle the case that, that actually happened because you have to protect identities and you have to protect, uh, protect the victim. So there's always a way around it. You just have to stay focused. And uh, this is more like a, a, a cry out to newsrooms around the world today. Um, these type of reporting are not something that should be uh, that should be left without supervision, without experienced editors. We had a horrible case in Croatia just a couple of days before, uh, a couple of days ago, uh, where we had a, uh, a case where a man raped a 14-year-old child and only got six months of, of jail time. And uh, there was a situation in one of our main uh, outlets and there was a headline saying only six months for having sex with a child. So let that sink in for a bit, having sex with a child. What kind of a formulation is that? And when we when we saw it and when we, we when we talked about it and when we called the editors and when there was a discussion about it within the journalist community, it turned out that it was written by an uh, unexperienced journalist who didn't think that it should say rape, but thought of a of a way of saying uh, sex with a child. The editor wasn't there, the, the, they didn't pay attention. This wasn't, of course, out in the printed media, it was only online, but it was a, a respectful media. So it happens, for, it, it happens to them too. Uh, journalists today and editors today are dealing with a lot. Uh, uh, we didn't talk about it, but it's, 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 it's out there around us, the, the, the situation with the pandemic and uh, the fact that there is not enough resources, but this is something that we should not save money on. These, this, this type of reporting and these issues are something that the information always needs to go through the protocol and, and be validated by an editor or even two editors before it comes out. Thank you very much. We have a question from our viewers via translation. Thank you so much. We have questions from our audience. Uh, media are uh, often putting stereotypic attitude to women. 
and is the Ukrainian society is uh, ready to change this? And what is the social change? It's a philosophical question, which is part of the media space as well. I would say that not only stereotype that a, a, a woman is a woman's space is the marital family space but uh, our vision of women as experts when women are mostly um, invited to, to comment the topic of arts culture society or uh, cuisine and men are talking about the army politics finances perhaps uh, mila or marina would like to comment on this what is the uh, social norm in Bosnia and Croatia. That uh, more than 80% of women uh, work in media outlets in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but just 12% of them are on uh, executive uh, editors or even uh, manager position. And that's really interesting because it seems that uh, media uh, 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 media run some women because you can see our faces, you can hear our voices uh, from time to time. Uh, even you have a lot of uh, women on uh, editorial position. Uh, but still, when we talk about executive places and uh, head of uh, some department, it's really hard to find uh, a woman on on that spot. Uh, secondly, um, as it stated by research, I have already mentioned from 2017, uh, in many then, I probably believe like five uh, stories uh, among uh, of uh, a woman as a subject of the story. And just in one, a uh, woman uh, has a voice as a, a survivor or as a well, presenter of some institution or officials and it's really important to uh, share a, a lot of stories where women uh, have a power when they have a voices when they could actually uh, be visible in different way than just in, in victims or as a mom as a somebody who take care of as you mentioned some uh, let's say light uh, areas or light fields because Probably in Ukraine and well as well in Croatia and Bosnia, we have enough uh, women in public life. But somehow, probably because of political background, uh, we have elections uh, this November, uh, local elections in Bosnia. So uh, many parties, uh, due to laws and quotas, they will put uh, women on second, on fifth place, or further on. But uh, you can't find a woman who is uh, the who is the boss of some party and especially who uh, get that opportunity to uh, run some list to be on the first uh, place on the list so probably a uh, uh, different uh, women's association um, female uh, organization should uh, work hard to promote uh, girls and, and women in our conservative society as a powerful voices with capacity to do more then just be presented as a victim or as we mentioned victim trolls from that light perspective. Дякую Марино, в Україні теж, як і в Боснії, пройдуть місцеві вибори. We will have local elections. We will have local elections on October, that is why we expect that there will be more articles about gender-based aspects, but we hope that uh, there will be more journalists uh, uh, who will cover the situation of women in politics correctly during the local elections. Mila? Uh, Mila, we are waiting for your commentary. Uh, can you comment? Well, I would say that in that, uh, in that respect, uh, Croatia uh, looked a bit better uh, 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 a couple of years or a couple of months ago, uh, we used to have a woman prime minister, we used to have a woman president in that, uh, in that specific case. Uh, now, at this moment, we don't have a woman that is in charge of a, of a big political party. We just had the national elections. Uh, there was no woman uh, first on the list, no woman uh, leading 
uh, leaving in this way, and this was very sad. Uh, also, we have a regulation that says uh, that 40%, uh, at least 40% of the uh, of the places on the list uh, when you enter to the parliament, what the uh, political parties uh, uh, are giving out for people to vote, it has to be women. But on the other hand, if you don't uh, uh, if you don't go by this rule, there is no penalty. So it's just a recommendation. It's not. It's not obligatory, so you're kind of you have this public shame, and you have reporting on how there is very few uh, women on the list, but still it happens uh, every day. I would say that uh, in the media sense, it is not that bad. I have a lot of female uh, female colleagues that are running the media outlets and that are in charge, that are editors in chief, or editors, uh, executive producers. Um, are uh, coping with that, but it's always the little things, you know. It's it's uh, uh, something that maybe we're not even aware of. It's it's that interview where you or me are going to get the question of uh, uh, when I see that question, it's always there. It's how you're how you're uh, combining uh, your uh, uh, professional life with the fact that you're a mother. Uh, these kind of questions are never being uh, being given to. Uh, to my male colleagues, it's just those those little things that that count for and that are always there, and that I don't know. We need to we need to uh, 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 talk about it more and and just state the fact that we are we are the same in a professional way, and that we can do things as as good as the next male person next to us. Thank you, Milo. Thank you so much, Mila. Sasha, what is your opinion? Uh, is it the media that creates stereotypes or that just uh, uh, spreads the stereotypes in the society? Yes, I, I would like to uh, comment on that phrase that uh, m men are never asked to have to combine their role as a professional and as, for example, father of uh, young children. Usually women are the ones who, ask, who are asked this question. And most people think that this question is quite normal uh, because this question uh, shows that uh, women are multitasking, strong, active active people, but it actually underlines so that the role to care for children is uh, on the shoulders of a woman, not of a man. That is why uh, women have to combine professional and private life. Well, we have uh, five minutes, so I would like Mila and Marina, who joined us later today, to comment uh, this phrase. Uh, I said that ge gender-focused journalism seems to be a separate type of journalism or is it more like a basic standard for for journalism in general marina can you com please comment on that it's absolutely uh basic uh, uh journalism and uh i always share that quote with my friends that our only party is a feminine party somehow as a as a woman we should protect ourselves and think in this, let's say, mom manner that if we have a daughters or whatever, we have a friends, we have a sisters, somehow we have to protect that picture of a woman in public sphere, in media specifically, when we have this opportunity to somehow create a media perspective and, and media picture of uh, from professional side and of course from private side. Uh, it's really interesting to, to see that we don't have a specific guidelines in my newsroom uh, in, in this regard. And it's really maybe important to uh, open the discussion uh, in my newsroom, first of all, to see, uh, do we understand this issue? Is this important? How we could be, how we could be more involved and how we could do more? And then maybe try to uh, cope with different partners and with different, uh, first of all, colleagues from, from media, but also from uh, NGOs to uh, find the proper niche to advocate and to uh, increase number of good stories for uh, ladies and for girls in uh, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina in my case, but also to all over the world. Uh, Mila mentioned uh, coronavirus and this pandemic, and it was really interesting to read a lot of articles uh, how female leaders cope with pandemic. And it was really encouraging in, in terms of uh, how uh, 
ladies with that presumption that we are better in uh, multitasking that Jaku, they Jaku even Marino. Uh, run better their offices their governments and they protect their citizens better than their male colleagues so we need such kind of uh, empowerment to uh, do more uh, and uh, show a more powerful picture of uh, women in media than just as, a, as we mentioned, as a victims, as survivors, or... Thank you, Marina, and we have a Thank you so much, Marina. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time, so I need to give the floor to Mila. Mila, can you please comment your final words on this topic? Sensitive uh, reporting is definitely something that is a uh, ground base for any kind of reporting. It's not a, a specific branch uh, because, it, uh, as I mentioned before, if we're reporting about violence, it has to be there. If we're reporting about politics, it has to be there because these are the things women on lists, uh, uh, women leaders, this is something that we need to uh, take into account. And even if we're reporting lifestyle and uh, uh, show business, uh, uh, this is something that uh, we need to take to, uh, into account because we have to clarify this picture of, of uh, what a woman is in a pose uh, 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 to a man when we talk about uh, 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 their role in the society. Thanks so much, dear speakers, Alexandra Horchinska, Marina Ridic, and Mila Baralic. Let me remind you that we discussed uh, gender-focused journalism, standards and guidelines of ethical reporting on violence against women, and uh, this event was supported by UN Women. Журналісти Нікарагуа зіграли ключову роль у висвітленні квітневого повстання Україні у 2018 році. Незалежні ЗМІ надавали надзвичайно якісні матеріали, що складалися з прямих включень, детальних репортажів, які підсилювали голоси агентів впливу на кшталт молодіжних рухів, що з'являлись у цей період, а також проводили уточнення та перевірку онлайн-контенту, що надсилали громадяни. Ця суміш виявилась потужною зброєю у боротьбі з офіційною пропагандою, яка применшувала жорсткість держави та намагалась представити повстання як незаконну спробу м'якого державного перевороту за підтримки іноземних сил. Пізніше, коли завдяки друкованим радіо, телевізійним засобам масової інформації стало зрозуміло, що повстання було направду ненасильницьким громадянським спротивом, критична маса мешканців країни долучилася до боротьби проти режиму Ортеги. Коли «Ель Фаро» з'явилось у Сальвадорі у 1998 році, воно стало першим цифровим засобом масової інформації у Латинській Америці. Це сталося через шість років після підписання мирної угоди. Громадянська війна у нашій країні тривала 12 років – з 1980 до 1992. Вона завершилась підписанням мирної угоди між державою, якою на той час керували праві, та партизанами, що врешті-решт сформували політичну партію. Майже через 30 років після завершення війни одною з основних тем для засобів масової інформації залишаються військові злочини.
Hello, 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 hello. А, це не ти пробуєш? Hello, 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 hello. Ще не чуєш мене? Як не чуєш? Та я взагалі. Кто вкладывает в вашу голову то, что уже завтра вы будете обсуждать с соседями и родственниками? В чьих целях это делают? Среди больших телеканалов «Интер» и «Украина» и плюс информационные телеканалы 112 и «Ньюзван». Это те, которые наиболее активно пиарили выгодных им политик. Телевидение – самый влиятельный вид медиа в Украине. Бизнесмены и олигархи создают или покупают каналы не для бизнеса. Ничего, если я в такой ситуации скажу вступительное слово на английском. Я вот, то есть, ну, не, я, я постараюсь балансировать. Не, да, да, да. Ну, я думаю, быстро в любом случае не будем. Вот, постараемся как-то. But just help lend, provide more knowledge to everybody about what what the threat really is and what these groups are doing. So you're expecting not just social dialogue on the topics that you cover. You're expecting direct action from politicians and through your coverage mm. to... I, I would say that I would like to see direct action from politicians in response to some of the work that, that I do and that other journalists who cover the far right do. Uh, I don't think we're naive in terms of expecting that just because we report on a particular far right group or a particular event that all of a sudden things are, going, things are immediately going to happen. But what, what, I, what I realize and I think what a lot of us realize is that we, especially in a, in a climate like in Ukraine, where people, which I think we'll get into, do not like to talk about the issue with the far right for a number of reasons, uh, it is incumbent on journalists like myself, even well, outsiders obviously like myself, somebody who isn't from this country, to maybe try to f force, force a dialogue to start when a lot of people would prefer that we not have that dialogue right now. So. Uh, thank you. Uh, Екатерина, с удовольствием бы предложил вам присоединиться к обсуждению. Вы, ваши темы... Uh, Екатерина, the guest also offered for you to talk. Uh, what is your position Uh, good day. Uh, 
the topic is difficult and uh, multidimensional. I don't know if we managed to discuss it for this short period of time, but I would say that today, unfortunately, journalists who raise the topic of uh, uh, far-right problem and such phenomena, they need to be explained why uh, neo-Nazis is uh, dangerous. Me, as a journalist, I wouldn't expect that I would be in the world where I would have to explain such things. At least I uh, dealt with it, I faced with it when we published a story about some fake and uh, connections of uh, certain leading uh, far-right uh, representatives opinions and uh, you know I uh, I heard questions about it so why do you call them neo-nazi and who are they including uh, I heard questions like you are raising such topics because you are a journalist and you have some political some ideology you know maybe you are like left or left liberal journalists. Uh, both me and my team from Zaborona, they tried to label us with the ideologists, but in fact, it has nothing to do with ideology or ideological or political journalism. It's a matter of the foundations and human rights and violation of human rights. Yes, I think that today the most important thing is to discuss in the society these questions where we need to find a space or a platform to discuss this difficult topic. Well, so far, at least in social networks, we do not have such platform, and it's a big question. So I understand that uh, a big problem lies also in the fact that the society does not react uh, as hard as you expect them when you raise these topics. I would like to give floor to Carlos to participate in this uh, dialogue, in this conversation, and uh, share your experience when such topics were raised in your country uh, and when there was interventions um, and to the work of the media in your motherland. So how did it happen? How did media manage to overcome this, uh, you know, opposition from maybe political elite and from the society? Okay. Thank you for the invitation. First of all, uh, uh, it's out that in, in media terms, having an, an ideology, I mean, a set of ideas and beliefs is not the same of actively being advocating for a party, right? In that sense, I think that uh, when we have struggled with big polarization issues regarding the issues that we cover, corruption in El Salvador, uh, war crimes, uh, impunity, the lack of transparency from public officials, even they are from the right-wing party, the left-wing party, or even a party that claims not to have an ideology, I think it's very important for, for us to be transparent as media in established dialogue. I think that the work of us, we have learned that the work of us as a media outlet doesn't end when we publish a, a big story or a big exclusive. It ends when we open uh, different dialogue spaces, even online or offline, in order to explain people where we're coming from, explain how we did the investigation, answer the question, answer the criticism, establishing like a respectful dialogue, understanding that 
it's natural to be disagreeing with someone, it's desirable as well, and to vindicate the nuances uh, to, to understand different complex phenomena. I, in our case in El Salvador, we have concluded that there's no such thing as objectivity. We believe more in transparency and, and being honest with, with our audience in terms of where are we coming from, how we have shaped the, the way we see the world. And in, in those cases, we think it works uh, to open honest dialogue with people, basically. So, Anna, tell us, please, how do you think these different functions are represented in the Ukrainian media, uh, like the descriptive function, intervention, and do we have the harmonized uh, balance between these functions? Yes, we do. Ukrainian journalism is rather strong journalism. As for the far right movements it's not uh, the problem of only ukraine but of the whole world it's just that they said that the ukrainian social experts say that ukraine has its specifics where the state can bring order then the far right moods enter and the problem is that the state can't control this aggression and to somehow direct it into the peaceful form that's all so of course the obligation of the journalists to talk or to bring up these difficult topics because who else if not us and uh, protecting uh, the population against uh, displaying aggression and to solve all the issues in peaceful way that's the aim of journalism also because we're like a social institute we are the communicator between different institutes and we communicate information to the population because the function of the journalist is not to say how to think right, but to say, to tell people what they are to pay attention to and to make them speculate on this or that. I understand that not everyone among us would like to see the problems that we have created, actually, some aggressive, you know, uh, flows. but solution of these problems can depends upon our honest look at it. If we talk about everything and will not be silent. This is our social function if we say that each journalist, if, if journalist asked what is the social function of journalism is to speak about problems and to speak about what must be solved. So we do not criticize, we just uh, show the way. The questions which need to be solved, that's it. It seems to me that a key problem which we face every day as media, as journalists, uh, this is a lack of uh, of clicks, of advertising. It's difficult to survive as a media financially in general. And it seems to me that a lot of uh, media inclined to write about uh, very important topics and sensationalist topics. That is why I understand such problems that Zaborona faced, uh, because they need to write about less uh, popular topics. And now we can proceed to discuss second topic. Regarding the concept of uh, partisanship of media, political allegiance, ideologi ideological allegiance, because obviously uh, even if a media generally, as an entity, isn't adhering to a certain political group, journalists are still people, and jour each journalist individually is subject to his or her own views and ideological uh, opinions, which could end up with a strong sense of self-censorship when a person just decides to omit a certain topic because he or she may feel that it is not either patriotic or not politically correct to highlight this topic right now. There could be a big variety of reasons for why a person could decide to self-censor. Uh, so my question is, can a media be patriotic? Can a media be politically aligned? Can a media be uh, partisan? We are all looking strongly 
we are all looking into the example of the United States, where there we see this strong uh, partisan division between media. It's all over the professional community. Everyone is discussing how we have Fox News here, we have Washington Post, we have Vox, all, comp all different and all taking a very strong political st stance, especially in light of the upcoming election. But how do you think the situation is right now in Ukraine, in light of the conflict, in light of the current political climate? Where, where should we go next? If everyone asks this question whether we shall be partisans, no, everyone will respond no. But the reality is that editorial, editorial offices are dependent on advertising and on uh, the influence of their owners, which are most probably somehow related to politics. And it all, it all has negative impact. Uh, on uh, an independence of uh, the uh, editorial office. We shall be unbiased, of course, but if you take a look at the regional press, regional media, uh, the dependence on the owners is only part of the problem. So the s second problem is that we might ourselves be dependent. If we are talking about Eastern Ukraine, Sometimes journalists are partisans for one political movement or political party. So this is the situation that we can see in central Ukraine or western Ukraine. We feel this pressure and we uh, exert this pressure on ourselves. So that is why it's quite difficult to be above this and uh, to be objective and, and biased when covering stories related to politics. Subject, uh, from your external point of view, so to speak, after this time that you spent in Ukraine, interacting with the local journalist community, interacting with the people here, and seeing the reaction that your coverage of the far-right uh, operations here are getting, how do you feel on, the, on, on, on this topic in uh, especially if we're talking about Ukraine and maybe in comparison to the situation in your home country? Well, for me, I think that sometimes we have to define or, or, or really narrow down what we're talking about when we talk about media that's partisan. Mm -hmm. Now, I think you gave the, the best or worst example of that, like Fox News in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's inevitable that as journalists and as media outlets are going to have their biases. We all have our biases. We all, as objective as we try to be, we all have our, our views. But uh, what has always struck me in the Ukrainian context, especially in the context of, of the still ongoing war, is that there is much more uh, of a, a self-described patriotic uh, push behind a lot of coverage and not so much politicized coverage in other cases, especially leading up to the elections last year, but also partisan coverage. Par coverage, th th there's a media environment here that is in some ways foreign to me, where some outlets, some journalists, some, some newspapers, whatever, are clearly supportive of one candidate or one party over another to the point where they think that that said candidate them not winning means means the end of the country so it what struck me particularly last year when i was here covering both the presidential and parliamentary elections for a number of international outlets was how heated the rhetoric was in in terms of partisanship mm -hmm. not just from journalists but from social media as well there was really this sense that from from a certain set of a very online uh, very online set in ukraine that uh, unless petro poroshenko wins the country is just going to be immediately taken mm -hmm. over by russia that you know those those sorts of argu arguments and things that i think we all heard last year i think what um what has been striking for me in terms of the far-right coverage that I do is 
when I write, because I, I, I've written some about the far right in Canada, my own country, mm -hmm. but I tend to focus on the far right across Central and Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. So in, in addition to Ukraine, I write about uh, the far right, for example, in the last year or a few months, I've written about the far right in, in Serbia, in Croatia, in Bulgaria, in, in Slovakia, for example, places like that. And of course, all over those countries, including my own, have their own issues with, with far right, with violent far rights or far right groups that are potentially quite dangerous. Uh, what has always struck me, of course, in a, in a negative way covering that in Ukraine, is that because of that self, this sort of patriotic push behind coverage here, or that when, when journalists, including international, there's this sense from some in the media community here that, or, and, and the broader community as well, that when we as foreign journalists particularly write about this country, we have to write about it in the best possible way because of course there is a war going on. You as foreign journalists, they, the, the argument might, it might go something like, you as foreign journalists should not be making too much light of the issue of, of the far right because Kremlin propaganda will pick up on it. Uh, that's Thank not, you. I mean, part of that pressure is understandable, of course, because there is a war. Mm -hmm. But I haven't experienced that kind of pressure in any other country that I've covered. Mm -hmm. It is only in Ukraine where I write things about the far right or mm -hmm. investigate the far right. And a lot, of, a lot of the feedback is, don't talk about it. Why are you writing about this? Why aren't you writing about the far right in X, Y, Z countries? Okay. And then I turn and I say, well, I am writing about it in those countries too. <laughs> so the sense that I've got here is that, that self-described patriotism is, yeah, that's re really been an issue for me to kind of wrap my mind around. Thank you. Uh, I would also like to invite uh, Enrique to pitch in on this, to uh, share his experience from, from his home country and how, uh, how does this, does bias or political uh, motivations or uh, partisanship of media stand in, st did it stand in the way of political dialogue and conflict resolution if we're talking about his country yeah thank you uh, thank you for the invitation uh, to start with yes in a, in a slightly different way I mean right now uh, Nicaragua is in a position where we are dealing with a very brutal dictatorship and what polarization has done is that it has made it impossible to really create a wide enough social and political movement beyond, uh, let's say, an initial wave of massive protests in 2018. Beyond that, polarization has uh, made it very difficult for all the sectors of society that are opposed to uh, Daniel Ortega's regime to come together around a political and social agenda that can lead somehow to a democratic transition. And, and that has uh, perpetuated a kind of deadlock. Uh, so yeah, we are dealing with something similar, although the context is slightly different. But I would like to take a, uh, to take a step back and to look at some more of the structural issues that are behind this. Um, from our perspective, a quality, healthy, high impact journalism ecosystem requires empowered audiences, just in the same way that a high energy democracy requires empowered citizens uh, much in the same way that, let's say, the transition to the knowledge economy has not been what is expected because people, talent, has not been formed, let's say, educational systems, etc., are not structured toward things like critical thinking, towards dissent, towards dialogue. So I think that it's important for us to consider some of these underlying structural issues because otherwise uh, the potential of journalism to really be this a catalyst for more citizen participation, for higher quality public debate, will go unfulfilled unless we understand sort of the entire systems dynamics around these issues. So I think that from our perspective at Confidencial, we are increasingly concerned, as Carlos mentioned before, with what happens after we perform the journalistic work. So we do the investigation, we find the stories, we tell the stories, you know, with ethical standards, with professional journalistic standards. But the real question is, what can we do? What should we be doing in order for that information or the analysis that we provide to really become a catalyst for people to make up their own minds, for people to participate in dialogue in good faith? And that doesn't mean 
uh, you know, to not have strong positions or to shy away from debate, but to really know the difference between polarization and sort of empty conflict uh, that is often the result of manipulation of political basis by political elites or by propaganda mechanisms and sometimes by media outlets that may have the best intentions, uh, but that are not sort of fully aware of this role that, that we can play. So in, in the case of Confidencial, for us, the real question is, how can we, beyond bringing information and analysis to our audience, how can we really uh, create civic space for high quality dialogue, for dissent, and for the construction of some of these core competencies that as a society we need and that are clearly not a priority in educational systems or not a priority in political systems uh, and certainly not in, in the economy either. So how can we build this uh, ability and, and instill in people the importance of uh, critical thinking, of dissent, of dialogue, of debate, of making up your own mind, uh, looking at several angles and making up your own mind, and then also learning uh, to tolerate other people's perspectives so long as these perspectives are not harmful to yourself or to others. I think that I don't have many answers to that question, but at Confidencial, we're increasingly encouraged by the fact that we all recognize from the commercial area, from the strategic area, the newsroom, the editorial team, the social media team, we all increasingly understand that this is perhaps the most important question for us to answer. How are we going to really empower our audiences to make up their own mind and to be able to be sort of full-fledged uh, citizens and full-fledged individuals that can participate in dialogue in dissent uh, without falling into polarization and meaningless uh, conflict? Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to address a follow-up question to Carlos uh, because Obviously, it's a big problem for us. It's a, it, it's a huge ordeal. Uh, the things that Michael just described about people taking sides and uh, feeling strong emotions about his work on the far right. Uh, there is also a, a, a strong a sense of, for people who need to feel belonging to a certain side when it comes to conflicts such as the one that has been happening inside Ukraine. So. My question is addressed for Carlos. How can a journalist, how can a media uh, take part, uh, in, uh, take, take a side or not take a side during such conflicts when the urge to do that is very strong, either for safety reasons or for own political views and, uh, and opinions? OK, thank you. I want to talk about one example, uh, one project that we are currently developing in El Faro, which is called the Conversation Lab. It will be launched next year, uh, and it, it's a platform uh, that will be introduced within our own news site, uh, elfaro.net, where the readers uh, will be able to establish high quality conversations with specialists, thematic specialists in different areas, economics, politics, uh, civil rights, etc. And the aim of this, of this platform is to uh, open a safe space uh, to tackle uh, polarization that happens in social media, because we have concluded that uh, social media, at least in, in our country, tends uh, the conversation there tends to be very polarized because it tends to value opinions in terms of popularity, such as if you have very, a lot of retweets, a lot of likes, and things like that. So we aim to open a, a, a platform that will try to put in the same place people who have strong belief that may be opposite, but that are willing to talk to the other position uh, with respect. For example, one polemic uh, topic in El Salvador is, the, is abortion. Uh, in El Salvador is one of the most toughest uh, laws that penalize abortion in every case. Uh, and there have been some movements in the last years that have uh, advocated to penalize it in some cases, right? Uh, so what we aim is, for example, in this case, uh, to put people that is, have strong beliefs against abortion and people that have strong beliefs uh, uh, advocating for women's rights, including, for example, when they get pregnant because they were raped, uh, and put them to, come to, to dialogue, to have a conversation where 
where they can be honest and and disagree with civil we call it like a not a civilized disagreement uh, within that with this kind of dialogue uh, there might uh, be better uh, conversation in social and better in more change in terms of political and social dialogue thank you uh, we have a question right now from the audience uh, Katya, наверное, adresu этот вопрос к вам. Нам задали следующий вопрос. В этой... It's for you. In the studio, they mentioned about the narratives of Russian propaganda. Do you think that journalists are to speak about political narratives? Sorry for have kept you waiting. I should say, I don't know if I will be able to answer your question, but it seems to me, and in our team in Zaborona, at Zaborona, we have a, a kind of a rule or when we are selecting or choosing our approaches to what we are talking about or what we are reporting about, uh, there's a very simple thing. We do not take any position because we always on the side of uh, most vulnerable people. So Zaborona as media was formed on the basis of our team and our audience are people vulnerable, are very vulnerable people in our polarized, politicized environment, especially in the post, uh, uh, in the conditions of war. And we are vulnerable in many ways. Each of us has uh, their own vulnerability. which makes a human being or a person weaker in front of big politics or in front of the state. And that's why many are trying to label us, to give us a political label because we uh, understand or we are talking about the uh, left dialects, for example. So it's the independent journalism. It exists in order to speak about interests of the most vulnerable groups. And it seems to me that here there is no, you know, you're, you're not choosing one party. Or you can't choose if, if, if any party, you know, if it's the opposition party or those who are in the representatives of the authorities. So we are applying the, the approach where we can protect the interests of all those whose rights can be violated at any moment. Thank you. I think that there's no doubt that journalists in their work understand very well that their material, their reports, especially if we speak about the journalistic investigations, can have an influence on the political agenda or on the international, domestic, or can be, you know, in the same direction that, uh, or in the direction of some propaganda, you know, for example, Russian propaganda. Anna, what do you think? To which extent should it influence the work of the journalist? And are there ways for media to, uh, to have the 
correct balance. It's hard to find the balance, but there is only one advice. You have to comply with some rules and you do not play political games. Of course, to do this, you have to be well educated. You have to have excellent mentors, editors who are going to be mentoring you and a good media community that is going to support and not criticize or point out at your mistakes instead of supporting you. Uh, I heard that colleagues mentioned that it's rather difficult to combine what you talk, want to write about and what your audience is ready to perceive. Katerina said a very interesting thing that in their outlet, we are, they are writing about people, and when you write about someone's fate, someone's destiny, that politics takes a secondary position. And if we speak about, uh, you know, some political topics, it's not about the work of the office of the president or institutional, but when we speak about some, you know, routine politics, like everyday politics, then it's important to bring up some human stories and what they lead to, and then the conclusions will be obvious as well. You know, it's it will be hard to be far too more involved in the game, but I think the bigger problem is in the journalists who are trying to impose the readers their political preferences or they think that their political preferences are the right one, the correct ones, and that's why they are to be communicated and someone else's point of view is incorrect. So we are to understand that we shouldn't point out to people what they are to think, but we are to show what they should speculate on, which situation needs their attention, who did what, or uh, who, where to look for some support or answers. And then we can minimize the influence of politics because we can't hide from it. All of us are human beings. We're all people and we all have our likes and dislikes. And it's really difficult to, you know, be apart from the situation. But if we remember that we are not to give instructions, but to show the direction, I think it will be a lot simpler, as it seems to me. Thank you. So we have moved to another block that I wanted to discuss about the influence, uh, about the changes that brought the social networks on the possibility of the political dialogue between the audience of different uh, media outlets in, in the wider context. I like this example very much. It impressed me so much when I studied what is TikTok as a platform. And uh, I have faced, I, I mean, I saw the video since the algorithm, the geographical algorithm in TikTok work differently than in Instagram or in Facebook. I started receiving lots of videos from Donetsk and Luhansk and I saw in comments uh, underneath, you know, some uh, some just entertaining videos where the teenagers sing or dance and I saw a strong dialogue in the comments uh, among the representatives of their age group from all over Ukraine. And it's an important impulse for me because we're all used to seeing uh, in our news feed, uh, you know, how uh, like anger around certain news or outrage culture a very strong negative charge and also we saw the how the bubbles are created and to people and when it seems like everybody thinks the same way as them and i would be very curious to hear the panelists to which extent or what are the possibilities for media to enhance a positive role they can have to strengthen the uh, dialogue urge and to involve uh, not only politically loyal o audience or that uh, shares their values but also to go wider so that to promote this way a dialogue and communication and to interact and I would like to invite I would like to give floor to Carlos to give your comments concerning this topic. Sorry, I was mute. Thank you. I, I, I think that um, social media has made magnificent things in terms of 
making information more accessible for people, and we have to value that. Nonetheless, we have to also be aware that in the last years, a lot of a lot of problems have have generated in terms of uh, misinformation, fake news spreading, and things like that. I think that there's a responsibility in social media companies like Facebook or Twitter to to add regulations that, for example, the one that recently was added in terms of uh, adding a seal in the in some Twitter accounts that state that they are state property media, uh, just to let people clear that this is not a independent uh, outlet, but it's a, probably a propaganda or a state uh, property uh, news company, right? For our case, I think that we have to value the, the the microphone that social media and amplification that that gives us the opportunity to reach more people uh, but we have to be aware of these problems I think the platform that I just mentioned is a uh, in my in my previous comment I think it's just a way to to tackle the things that social media may not be generating but we have I mean, there's nothing, there's no such thing as an aim to stop using social media because of these problems like misinformation. I think it's responsibility of, of us as, as journalists, as media staff professionals to, to keep fighting and to keep generating spaces and dialogue, open dialogue with people uh, in order to combat misinformation. I think misinformation and the spread of fake news will not end up automatically in itself if we don't do something. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to forward the microphone to you. Regarding the same question, you have a general feeling that your, your, your work is getting a lot of negative traction on social media, yeah. a lot of negative vibes. So how, how do you think? Is there a way for media to negate that? Or is it just something that needs to be pushed aside and work still needs to be done? And is there a potential for dialogue if we're talking about people with polar views over social media? Mm -hmm. Well, for, I think that I, my view on social media, particularly websites like Facebook, Twitter, and uh, Telegram, which I know is you know quite commonly used here, is uh, that I'm not particularly confident at this point that social media has the ability to bridge some of these divides that we've been seeing for several years. I mean, obviously, we've been seeing them in the United States for for you know since since before the 2016 election of Donald Trump, uh, we see them now in 2020. Uh, people, whether they're voters, whether they're journalists like myself, we all kind of on social media we all inhabit our own little bubbles. It's not easy for for the for example, it's not easy for me or the thing the things that I do, the things that I write about. I don't. There's a there are always sections of social media that I will always expect them to react negatively or not react at all mm -hmm. to to something that I write. Uh, I don't, um, you know, I don't write what I do to please people or please particular people. Uh, but I think when over the over the say mostly the past two years when I've been writing most intensely about the the Ukrainian far right, of course. Uh, even with some of that you know negative feedback that, that that I get to put it politely is what i what I have done is is taken believe it or not taken some of it into consideration and and think are there are there things that I'm sometimes missing with my coverage am I not uh, giving enough credence to to another another side or another another view on the debate. And so that has informed, whether people want to believe this or not, it has informed the way that I've written a, a lot of things more recently. Uh, now, again, like I said, I don't write to, to, please, to please critics. I think that's, for, for any journalist, uh, writing to, writing to, to be liked, uh, you're probably in the wrong profession then. Uh, but for me, I think it's not incumbent so much on journalists to be the ones facilitating the dialogue. I think sometimes that's beyond our, our scope and what we can do. But I think it's incumbent on us to, for, for some of these difficult discussions, it's incumbent on, upon us to 
to try to start happening, to try to almost provoke these discussions into happening. So, like people here, many people here don't like talking about the far right, but when all of a sudden there's several large articles about it, or there's coverage in international media, then then there has to people have to talk about it. Mm -hmm. That's partly been the motivation with some of the things that I've written about the far right and distress, not just in this country, because I feel in a lot of countries it's an under addressed issue. Uh, I feel the way to do that sometimes is to start writing about it, to provoke, to ask some of the questions that I know some people don't want. Not, not only are they not interested in the answers, they're not interested in the question being asked. Now, is, is social media, the use of social media, the place to try and have some, some of these dialogues? Well, no, and I think that's part of the bind we all find ourselves in across a lot of different countries is we know that there are d dialogues and discussions that need to be had that need to be facilitated across different partisan or other divides, we just don't entirely know how to do it. And I, I'd like to sit here and pretend that I've got some cure-all answer for us, but unfortunately I don't. So my role, what I'll continue to do, and I think what other journalists do as well, is to keep asking questions that are sometimes difficult, that people sometimes don't like, don't like hearing, and keep provoking, but at the same time, taking some of that feedback into consideration, even if sometimes it's, it's, it's feedback that not, you're not, one might not be particularly interested in hearing. Um, it's something to take into consideration as I keep obviously digging into these, these types of questions. Okay, thank you. And now I give the word to Anna. I would like to hear your opinion on this window of, of uh, opportunities for Ukrainian journalists and for Ukrainian society in general uh, to enter into dialogue on the topic of non-governmental controlled territories. Uh, well, we had an interesting experience at the onset of the pandemic. We used social networks, not as a, as a method of dialogue with our readers, but as a method of research, together with the Institute of uh, Sociology, Sociology of Ukraine. Uh, we researched on the level of distress during the pandemic. The Institute uh, prepared uh, their sample, set the parameters of this research, and our task was to conduct this research. This research was also held on the occupied territories of Donetsk and Luhansk regions. So our answer to the question which level of distress uh, Ukrainians have uh, is also related to those people who live on the other side of the checkpoints. Uh, for us, all this information was very valuable because when we think uh, that we need to resolve a conflict, we forget about those people. We forget that we need to ask them. Usually people say that it's very difficult to ask those people that uh, whom we cannot reach physically or by phone. But when you target advertising on Facebook to those regions, it is very easy to communicate with people who live there. And for example, as a method of so sociological research, uh, through Facebook, it, it was easy to do. We collected uh, the necessary number of questionnaires for this research, for this sample. And uh, uh, we actually have conducted this research successfully. And then later, the Institute of Sociology uh, presented this research. So if you want to do something, you will manage to find the points of communication with the audience. Uh, there were a lot of negative comments, a lot of negative feedback to our research. Uh, though our research was not about uh, the war, it was about uh, the pandemic, the coronavirus, but we used uh, a cover illustration which reminded people of uh, uh, LGBT flag and that is why there were a lot of hate uh, comments because of that. But it didn't prevent us from conducting this research. 
it actually happened and we managed to get those answers from uh, people living in Donetsk and Luhansk regions. Unfortunately, uh, we failed to cover the Crimea because from 2014, uh, Facebook blocks advertising which is targeted at Crimea. But uh, we understood that we can target advertising uh, on Kherson region and then we can uh, increase the radius of uh, this advertising to hear the opinions of people who live in the Crimea. Of media not just doing reporting exactly, that's like more of an in-depth research intervention and uh, it's a very interesting case in terms of how, actually you, how you actually use social media for that. Uh, Enrique, I would like to ask you about uh, your experience, like the experience of your media in Nicaragua do, during the dramatic events uh, of the last few years that took place, the protests and how they un 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 unraveled and uh, worse, have social media dramatically changed the opportunity for a dialogue, for a conflict resolution and uh, what's your, uh, your media's take on this? Well, I think that in a, in a similar vein to Carlos, uh, I mean, the, the primary or the first thing that we would have to think and talk about when, when considering the impact of social media on our work is the fact that due to uh, state censorship, which has, for example, taken us off the air on television, platforms such as YouTube have become the only way for us to distribute our content. So we, we know very well, let's say, this, the positive side of this, uh, this coin. As for the negative side of this um, component, I think that we are definitely seeing a high degree of polarization in Nicaragua through uh, social media. And I think that's something that's really important, to, at least from our perspective, is to think of the, these technology platforms not as the most important part of the discussion. In the end, they're just tools. They're important tools. They're tools that make a big difference. Uh, but a lot of the underlying issues, such as disinformation, such as polarization, have, have long predated the existence of these platforms. I mean, these platforms have changed the scope, the pace, the degree to which propaganda can spread or to which polarization or hate speech can spread. But uh, these were all phenomena that existed before. And I think that, yes, it's important to address the the ways in which these technology platforms have changed the pace and the scope and the degree of things. But if we focus exclusively on that and we don't go to the roots, we don't ask ourselves, well, why did this exist even before uh, social media? Uh, why are people so prone to anger or so prone to uh, not criticizing or questioning something that they ideolo ideologically believe in? I think that those are some of the deeper questions that go beyond the technology that need to be asked. Having said that, uh, there are a host of issues that uh, need to be addressed regarding these technology companies. I think it's important for uh, the media and quality journalism as a sector to have common mechanisms to address these technology platforms uh, together. Things like, uh, well, what they've done to advertising revenue streams, for example, which squeeze uh, our work or how the algorithm uh, or the different algorithms uh, promote certain kind of sens uh, sensationalist content over other kinds of content. These are all issues that need to be addressed, but I think that they would be best addressed together. I think that if, uh, if independent media and journalists from different regions around the world get together to think about sort of what are some of the asks, what are some of the demands, and what are some of the strategies to put pressure on the technology companies, I think that's paramount. But all, ultimately, the truth is, uh, users themselves also need to be empowered about these things. I mean, in the end, if you think about it, uh, if you think about the loss of privacy, if you, if you think about how the data that we create as users on these platforms is ultimately what these platforms are monetizing, uh, and, and you think about where that puts us as users of these platforms in such a big disadvantage, and how little has been done uh, against that, I think that ultimately, in the same way that media outlets need to organize around these issues, probably uh, users need to organize around these issues, different governments need to organize around these issues. Ultimately, the, the technology platforms cannot continue to kind of, you know, break things and ask questions later, which was one of the big mantras coming out of Silicon Valley early on, right? Is break things, break things, who cares about the consequences? 
Uh, I think that that's always going to be the case. Technology will probably always be at the cutting edge. It will always be, uh, there will always be unregulated spaces. There will always be a next technological frontier that goes beyond existing regulatory frameworks. Uh, but I think that we need to have, we need to be organized and we need to be prepared for that. And again, it's not the first time that these kinds of things happen. Uh, if you analyze it historically, although again, differences in scope and degree in pace, but you know, the printing press or the radio or television, you know, how did those different technologies also, uh, how are they far ahead of regulation? How did they change politics? How did they change social dynamics? And how can we learn uh, for the lag in adaptation from journalism, from users to be shorter and shorter each time? I think that that's, uh, those are kind of the things that we have in mind in Confidencial. So on the one hand, we understand that we would not be distributing our content today if it weren't for platforms like YouTube, given government censorship. But we're equally concerned by the fact that, for example, in a country that doesn't have such high internet penetration like Nicaragua, we're equally concerned of how do we get to people who don't have access to the internet. And maybe for us, uh, that's why, although the, the sort of combating the downside of social media and technology is really important and it is high on our agenda, it's also not the end all be all of our discussion or what keeps us up at night. I think that the fact that we come maybe from a a market where the, the technology is, has penetrated slightly less than in other parts of the world, I think that that uh, helps us keep focused also on some of the more underlying structural issues behind it. Okay, thank you. Uh, we also got a question from the audience. It is about turn, turning back to the far right. Uh, so there is a question, how, how do the participants feel about the problematic of the far right uh, in Ukraine? Do you feel that it is being downplayed, that it is not being talked about for whatever reasons, and that there is a certain like spiral of silence in place? Uh, Michael, maybe we start with you. Right. I, I think that there continues to be very much a tendency for many people in Ukraine, but also many supporters of Ukraine abroad, to very much downplay the issue of the far right in this country. I think it stems from, I, I, because I, I believe I, several years ago, maybe 2016, 2017, I think I was actually in some ways one of these people, one of these journalists who didn't look into the far right as much here, who I, I, I think in my own way, I also didn't think it was that. Я, я не вважав, що це була така вже ж велика проблема, і, можливо, також її не приділяв достатньої уваги. Але однією з проблем також було, що дуже багато людей в Україні та за кордоном діють так або мислять так, що ситуація з ультраправими в Україні така ж, як була, наприклад, у 2015-2016 роках. Тоді це була проблема, але вона... Але вона... Не, не мала такого масштабу, як зараз. І, наприклад, у 2002, навіть два роки тому необхідно більше було уваги звернути. Я, наприклад, дуже жалкую, що я прискіпливіше не поглянув на цю проблему, тому що завжди є така, знаєте, тенденція применшати е, значимість якоїсь проблеми. Не було ні дослідження, наприклад, в цій країні, і в 2018-2019 роках, я думаю, багато людей з міжнародної спільноти, вони почали розпізнавати цю проблему ультраправих в цій країні. We're in 2020, we're nearing the end of 2020, and I'm still constantly hearing claims that, well, claims that I think are completely wrong and baseless, that the issue with the far right here is identical or largely the same as it is in a place like Germany or another European country. And I, sadly, it's not. And I think there has to be a recognition that two things can be true at the same time. One, yes, there is Kremlin pro-Russian propaganda that paints the far right as some evil at every turn that's going to pop out and, and take over the country, which is absurd. But what can also be true at the same time is that there is a real issue with the far right. I think there needs to be more acknowledgement that an issue like the far right, it can both be a target 
it can both be something played up and propagandized by one side, but at the same time, it can also be a, a actual proper true issue on the other. So, in short, the issue, the, there is still very much this tendency to downplay and sometimes even deny that there's a far right problem in this country. And it's something that, with my reporting and research and writing about it, it's something that I've tried to combat by getting getting information and research and articles out there. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, we got feedback from our audience on the subject. Uh, very thoughtful comments saying that conflicts and differences are inevitable. However, violence is not. Unfortunately, a lot of our media are republishing violent calls to action from the far right and consider that as a patriotic action. At the same time, this kind of behavior motivates violence. It is understandable that you can simply ignore such calls to action from the far right, but we have social media where basically everything is possible. Yeah, I think, I, I feel that's the case as well in Ukraine, where there are sometimes quite openly violent and other communications from the far right that are given more mainstream attention than they should. I think one of the paramount issues concerning the far right in this country is that there is a tendency to let them too close into the mainstream or treat them as more mainstream actors than, than they should be. And that, that goes from republishing or get, take, taking seriously their statements about violence, excusing their violent actions, and, and not holding them accountable for, for their violent actions, which of course there certainly have been over the past few years and recently. That impunity and lack of accountability is, I mean, that was identified in research several years ago, and that, uh, that is still the case here in Ukraine. And I, 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 again, I wish I had some sort of magic magic cure for it, but mm -hmm. I think, uh, again, like with part of the, part of what the work that I do, I feel that getting getting information and analysis out there and talking about it, and, and essentially, what I've seen a lot of my work, what motivates a lot of my work, I think, is forcing people to have that conversation, whether they like it or not. And that's something I'm going to keep doing. And I think that there are more and more people, both within Ukraine and abroad, but also in other countries concerning their own issues with the far right, to start having some of those complicated discussions that also, also not, don't just deal with the far right, but deal with issues about historical memory, um, issues about communism, Nazism, the Holocaust. There's, every country has its, its demons that it has to deal with, and that includes my own as well. Uh, all of us in our respective countries, far right related or not, mm -hmm. uh, we need to always ask ourselves difficult questions, even when the response to us asking those difficult questions is to tell us to stop asking them. Thank you. Uh, I have one more question from the audience, Anna, and it's not uh, directly connected with our topic about the conflict resolution and your opinion about it. So, what is the uh, development of the printed media do you see in the modern society? But uh, minding that we are to attract all the society if we are wishing for the dialogue, that this is a very leg legitimate question within this context. Development of the printed media. Well, if someone thinks that printed media will disappear one day, then I'm not one of them. Uh, I mean, you know, it's, it's people used to say that theater will disappear, that cinema will disappear. Now it's very popular to say that uh, th cinemas will disappear because there are streaming platforms. But when you sp communicate uh, or speak with people who work in the movie industry, in the film industry, they will tell you this will never happen, no matter how many streaming platforms there are. The same refers to the printed media outlets. But the question is, the Ukrainian problem is, we are losing the subscribers for these printed media outlets and we do not have the points of sales. If we take a look at the situation in Kyiv, there are, there are no point of sales to sell this newspaper or magazine because they are getting less and less. 
the number of points of sales reduced. But if we want some delivery via Ukrposta, Ukrpost, or via some, uh, you know, uh, some mediators, uh, it can either get lost or just would, wouldn't be delivered at all. So we have a problem with the delivery to the audience. But if we speak about the context, then it doesn't matter if it's a printed media or online media outlet. The information is the same and we have the same tasks. And there are even such common editorial offices when one editorial office does both printed media outlet and works for online media outlet. So as a journalist, I do not see any problems here if it's on paper or if it's on the Internet. But the problem is the printed media, they do not have the sphere of dissemination. So that's why they lose the readers and so they lose funds and they shut down. Uh, from being over, so I would like to ask all our participants to uh, take part in this final round. Uh, I'm going to address our guests from abroad and I'm going to address people here in the studio and Katya. Uh, so if you can like in a few words please say what some uh, some thesis or two about what you think a media should do to strengthen their role as a platform for conflict and problem resolution and i would like to ask uh, enrique to start of course with a based on his experience and his uh, own uh, background from from nicaragua Yes, so I think that there, there are a couple of things. The first thing that comes to mind really uh, within Confidencial, we've been working to really conceive ourselves so that everybody within the organization, reporters, the commercial team, management, we all are learning to see ourselves as social or institutional or structural entrepreneurs even. We conceive our journalistic role as the co-creation of a vision of society. And that's a co-creation that takes place between our newsroom, between everybody within our team, but also with our audiences. So I think that this change in perception that we're having about ourselves and about our potential as social, structural, institutional entrepreneurs within society is, is paramount. And then externally, that translates into, for us, it has translated into learning how to give ourselves margin for error, how to create spaces within which we can experiment, where we can innovate, where we can fail and fail fast and then try again and hopefully fail better next time, but fail at giving that extra mile of not just creating quality content, but really going far enough to empower citizens so that they can have more critical mind, so that they can make up their own mind and so that they can become uh, really the, the most important power holders in society. We think that uh, that's ha that has been our approach at Confidencial and we don't have all the answers. We, we wouldn't say we've succeeded yet, but uh, we certainly have found a way to constantly experiment and we have found a way to give ourselves that, uh, that margin for error, but we have a very clear vision of where we're going. So that's, that for us, that's the key. Okay, thank you. Michael, can you give a please please give a brief comment as to which obstacles do you think the media community in Ukraine needs to overcome to strengthen its role as a platform for conflict resolution and problem resolution? I think, especially related to to issues like the far right and nationalism, I think the most important thing for Ukrainian media, Ukrainian journalists, to start doing more of is to start talking about and start asking some of those questions that many of them, for some understandable reason sometimes, have been quite hesitant to ask. I, I, I think it would really be beneficial for Ukrainian, Ukrainian media to not be as concerned or worried about asking the, the quote-unquote the right questions or asking the patriotic questions or asking questions that will get a certain sector of society or, or including the, the far right that might Get, get them get them angry at them uh, I, again it's it's to some extent it's easy for me to say something like that I'm like I'm, I'm not from this country I can write about things in this country and I can write about potentially dangerous things in this country but then I can get up and leave so if there's 
for Ukrainian media to be able to do that, to maybe start asking some of those more difficult questions, start exploring some of those difficult questions, and not being worried about the backlash that comes, it's something U Ukrainian media can't do it alone. It needs solidarity from colleagues across Europe, even even those of us across Canada. You know, we can be solid. We can offer some solidarity sometimes as well. It's but in all seriousness. None of us are in this alone in, in every country that we're in trying to cover some of these difficult issues. We're always going to get backlash of different kinds and journalists, media from, from all the different countries that are here, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Canada and Ukraine, for example, we, we need to have solidarity and, and develop that and share and learn from each other and, and I think that only through that, working, working together across borders, can we really start to ask those questions that we know deep down that we need to start asking more of? Okay, uh, Carlos, how about you? I would love to hear a brief comment from you before we, before we finish. Yes, thank you, it's a very brief comment. Um, I think we, as media outlets, have to assume and, and understand that we serve diverse communities. We, we, just, we do not just serve the people who think editorially and shares the same belief that me, that that editorial we as a media out have. For example, in El Salvador, we have been last three months, we have been attacked by the government uh, in terms of social media causing a, a, a malicious audit by the Ministry of Finances and things like that. But we have to that when we keep doing investigations that reveal that as well. Uh, is possibly doing, is doing some things or, or wrong doing, we have to, to understand that we are giving this information to people that support the president as well. Uh, uh, and in those cases, we have to be aware and open to hear them, their, their, their backgrounds and understand why they support or why they think that our content is not good. And then is when we think we will be doing a better job in terms of connecting more people and, and combating polarization. Thank you. Uh, so we are at the last minute of our conversation. I would like to thank everyone who participated here in the studio or over Zoom. Uh, we had a wonderful discussion and basically I think uh, Michael summed it up pretty well uh, that our biggest point is about talking, talking, bringing up uneasy topics, making the, the, the stronger the voices, the more chances is of them being heard and less people being underrepresented in the media, in the agenda, and uh, the, the more productive is the result for the society. Thank you, everyone.